Okay, good morning, everyone. We are just about to get started. We're just kind of tightening up a couple of things here, so bear with us. Looks like we've got a, a great attendance happening here. We've got a, a, right about 100 people coming and people are still popping on, so we'll give it just another few seconds here. Okay, we're gonna get started. Well, welcome everyone to the fourth quarter uh, community meeting here, uh, GIS related. So um, I can't tell you how much uh, we appreciate everybody uh, taking time to be with us. Uh, we've got a great event scheduled for today. So, um, you know, be, be, be ready for it. And uh, we, we're gonna make it pretty easy on you. So I'll kind of explain how this is gonna work. But uh, before we get started, I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Richard Wade and I'm the Deputy Executive Administrator here at the Texas Water Development Board. Uh, I head up the Tenris Division. Um, I know most of you, but a lot of you I don't know. Uh, but I appreciate you being on and I hope everybody's doing, uh, doing well under these circumstances. So it's hard to believe that we're actually heading into our eighth month of COVID. And I think I even mentioned on the last time that, you know, how much is this is uh, really impacting individuals uh, most people that I've talked to are actually still working out of their homes or remotely in some in some manner, though I do know some of y'all are back into the office uh, practicing the social distancing and wearing the masks and so forth. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, this has kind of become the new normal for now. Uh, but uh, uh, these meetings, I guess we're getting kind of good at, even though I feel like when we're setting up this one, uh, we had our <laughs> we have our issues. So this will be kind of entertaining, I think. Um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of us have adjusted um, in many ways to, to working from home. I know that personally I have adjusted uh, on something I didn't really think that I would be able to do. I, I'm not a work from home kind of person. I, I tend to like to leave my home life and my work life uh, two separate things. So working from home was something that I did resist quite a bit. I might have mentioned this last time we talked. Um, but I think I've noticed that uh, efficiencies have improved uh, for me to some degree. And I'm kind of wondering if others have experienced the same similar thing. Um, you know, just going into work, you're looking at about, about a 45 minute commute for me. I'm in Southwest Austin, uh, driving in uh, through downtown and, and, and getting into downtown with all the traffic going on. It's about a 45 minute commute. And then about a 45 minute commute back. So you're looking at, you know, an hour and a half that you have back to yourself. Um, also too, uh, I do a lot of meetings, which I know a lot of you do. Um, and you have to commute to those meetings too. So you have to leave 30 minutes early, get in your car, drive over to a different location, park, sign in, do all that stuff. And then you meet and then you come back. So I was kind of trying to do the math on this. And, uh, you know, I've gained back about three hours of a normal work day just not commuting, just being able to pop on to meetings and so forth. And so there's a reason at the end of the day, you feel pretty, uh, pretty tired, you know, and you feel like, well, I've just been sitting here, but you feel like I'm, you know, you're doing a lot more. So it's interesting enough to know if other people are feeling the same, but realistically, I know from a tenorous perspective and from a lot of you that I've talked to, uh, people feel that they're actually more efficient. So if there's anything good coming out of this, it's it's we're learning to 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 kind of work differently and and possibly being as efficient as we can. So I did kind of read an article uh, just recently that says even after COVID that things will really never go back to normal, and uh, you know I, I tend to believe that. Um, they basically years of digitizing data and establishing processes and and working with protocols to work remotely um, have been done in just a few weeks. Uh, where normally if somebody were trying to figure this out, it would have taken them you know, years to kind of figure out how, we're, how this is to be done. And we got forced into it. And so a lot of these protocols are, are being figured out and are pretty well getting mastered by this time. So um, as it plays out, we're getting better, we're, we're, we're developing better techniques, uh, refining our processes and that we uh, will continue probably even well after this is over. So uh, kind of an interesting scenario with schools are doing the same thing. They're learning to, uh, they're learning to teach school remotely and so forth. 
Uh, I know my kids are saying from when spring break occurred and they had to kind of go back into remote learning, nobody knew what they were doing. It was kind of a, an awful thing. But now that they're going back to school, uh, teachers have had a chance to kind of think through this a little bit. And, and now things are working fairly well. I wouldn't say they're as good and I'm not, I'm not promoting that, you know, you don't go back to school, but I think you do the best you can with what you have. And so we're, we're learning a lot. And also, too, uh, a, a recent uh, conversation or a recent article that I read shows that scientists are actually learning a lot about how the Earth is responding to all of this, specifically when it comes to pollution and, and so forth. And on the next slide, Joe, if you don't mind switching over, on the next slide, you'll see, um, you know, an example. And I know people have seen this before, right? Um, but examples of before and after um, uh, of what things look like. Um, this is in China. And to see just in the in the short time, and this is really only a one month difference here. The bottom picture is taken in January. The top picture is taken in late February of this year when China was being affected and they were closing down. Um, the pollution has totally, um, you know, subsided. And what scientists are learning is how the Earth is is bouncing back to that, and what and what level does it take? Uh, so there's a lot that they are learning in this, and you can see even by the chart. Um, near Wuhan, uh, just how much of it, you know, from a ge geographic standpoint, how much has changed. Um, and so, you know, you wouldn't be able to do this kind of studying if this hadn't happened. So I, I kind of tend to be an optimist on this stuff. This, uh, you know, um, Corona is not a good thing. It's, it, it's absolutely not. But when you have an opportunity to, to take a look at it uh, differently in, in certain aspects of it, it allows you to do something you probably would have never been able to do before. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of where we are. And people by nature, uh, you know, we're social, we're social creatures. We like to, to um, talk. So I think the downside of it, all of it is, even though you were able to chat and do everything that we normally do through video, um, there's a, still a personal aspect that we do miss. Um, the interactions with people on video calls, you kind of tend to miss the ability to to sit and brainstorm and pick up on other people's vibes and 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 really kind of go with that. Uh, so I think we do miss that part of it. And the hope is is that you know when this is all done, we can kind of marry the two together. You, we can be more efficient in our meetings. We can be more efficient as we move forward with 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 how we communicate. But at the same time, we can still get together and have these conversations that where we need that personal uh, interaction. So. Um, real excited about how, uh, you know, to see how things play out over time when all this is done. So, you know, quite interesting. So all in all, I'm really, really pleased that you've joined us today. We have a we have a great uh, we have a great turnout. Um, for from my side of things, we, we look like we have about 185 people who have registered. I don't know that we're going to get necessarily that many people, uh, but we're well over 100 now. And um, it's hard to believe that a, last week would have been our 33rd forum. We would have had our 33rd uh, GIS annual forum that we always have, Texas GIS forum. And it's hard to believe we didn't have that. That would be one of the only years we actually missed. And so we're trying to do a little something different with this meeting, which is kind of expanded, um, you know, expanding ourselves on on what this can do. So how this is really going to work, just so you know, um, Joey, go uh, pop to the next slide. Um, how this is going to work is that uh, we are, are going to have uh, people coming on and, um, and they're gonna be on a specific time slot. So we're gonna kind of move forward with these time slots. We're not gonna go in early. If people end early, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna go early. We're just going to sit until that time slot comes in so you can come on. And I wanna um, introduce uh, one of our, our board members who has been extremely supportive on allowing us to do all of this stuff. Um, with our forum, with, with these types of meetings, uh, it's always been known how critical it is. And I, and I say this all the time, but we couldn't be doing this if we didn't have the support of our of our board members or of our executive team and so forth, who are really uh, uh, an important integral part of uh, us making this happen. And so um, uh, I was talking to Brooke Pop, our director or one of our board members here at the Water Board, and she wanted to come on and just do a little welcoming um, for you. So 
Brooke, if you're on, and I'm if on. you're not, we're going to try to get you on. Can you all hear me? There you go. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Richard, thank you so much for having me. Um, I love the optimism and the positive comments this morning. I feel like I wake up every morning around five to start my day because that's kind of my new reality of trying to get up early before the kids get up to work. And all I see is um, negative news and just bad news. And it just, it kind of wears at your spirit. So I love opening up this session with some good things that this very odd era has taught us. Um, I agree with you. I think I'm a thousand times more efficient. Um, I really have had to recalibrate my schedule because I have kids that were virtual for a long time and I'm not in the office as much as I want, but that hasn't necessarily been a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So those additional hours that I'm saving as well on the commute have really helped me. And I will tell you, we have really taken advantage of this crisis um, to really innovate and provide so many more technological solutions to each and every employee and my children. Oh my gosh. I mean, this next generation coming up, I mean, they know what they're doing around technology. Henry will come in. I mean, I don't have my great TWDB IT in person right now, um, but I bug them constantly because I am the attorney on the board and I am not savvy with this stuff. But if I can't get a hold of Randy, my young son Henry will come and help me figure stuff out, which is crazy, but so cool. Um, but, you know, it's just been a very odd time and we're all doing the best we can and that's all we can ask of each other. Mm -hmm. And I think extending each other a lot of grace and just showing kindness is very important right now. Um, but enough about that. I really just wanted to thank y'all for all attending and really show my gratitude to Richard and Tenoris. You know, Richard is our geographic information officer, which is incredibly important to the state. He is really helping us with SB7 and SB8 implementation with our LIDAR and our BLEs, and we couldn't do it without him. And it's incredibly important that these bills are implemented with the right data. So they are gonna save lives and property, and he's really um, taking the lead on that. Um, I'm just always in awe of the GIS community. I am a pencil pushing attorney. So I think that what y'all do is the coolest thing in the world um, and so important. And maybe one day if I could go back and have a second career, maybe I would be a tech person, but that ship has probably sailed for me. So I love seeing it out um, and all the, the innovative strategies you, you all are working on to give us the best data for the state. Um, so I hope y'all have a wonderful meeting. Um, I'm going to be online kind of geeking out with y'all um, and hopefully some of this will stick and my son won't have to help me with all my technology every day, but um, thank y'all for attending and have a wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you, Brooke, so much. We appreciate you being here and thank you for those words. Um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I look, I look at Brooke's picture and then mine, I, my face is all blown out and I'm in a, I'm in a, been relegated to a back bedroom and I have this really nice office downstairs, but since we're all working from home, I've been pushed to the bedroom while the kids have my office. So I don't quite know how that works, but you're right about technology. Um, you know, it's always changing. So if you ever decide to change your career, we can, we can show you how to do a lot of this. It's, Thank it's, you, <laughs> I will you. say you have seen a few of my other offices, my office in my car, my office in my kids' trampoline. I think <laughs> I've, I think I've done one in um, the guest closet before. So this is odd that I am actually set up nicely. So, <laughs> but only for y'all. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. See you later. Well, so, so yeah, so this is, you know, this is, uh, this is really good. We'll go to the next slide real quick, Joey. And I just wanted to kind of lay this out. Um, as I was kind of mentioning here, so, so this is the way uh, this is breaking out and we're going to be very, very strict on our timing here. Uh, so that what we really expect you guys to do is not sit around for the, for the full, whatever, however many hours this is about six, seven hours, um, is that, the agenda is there out there on the website and here it is being being displayed. But I think it's important to know that uh, if there are things you wanna see, you can jump on at that time and watch them. And if there are things that 
uh, uh, maybe aren't uh, something that you're as interested in, you can pop off and go do whatever it is you need to do. But just know that these times are going to be pretty solid um, and that if we finish early, we'll wait around for that time to come around so you can get back on. And we're not going to start anything early or whatever. So I'm asking also the presenters to be aware of that time uh, because we will have to kind of close it up at uh, on time. Um, it's just so we can keep things, you know, running as smoothly as possible. So, so that's how that's going to work. Uh, next slide, Joey. So since we since we last ha uh, met, you know, a lot of things have been happening. Um, remote work continues. You know, that hasn't changed. It was something we had just talked about. Um, but but it, it does allow us to, you know, it, it, we're getting good at this stuff. I've been able to communicate with a lot of uh, our stakeholders um, on, on many things by just simply popping up a chat window and going where normally you have to set up all kinds of meetings and so forth. So, you know, that's okay. Um, that's just how it is for now, and it seems to be working quite well. We've been working hard on the GI, GIO legislative report, which is really designed to help uh, our state leadership understand what our needs are and, and how we're progressing on our GIS capabilities. Um, GIS, as everybody knows, is taking front and center stage now for the last, you know, six, seven years um, on, on its um, critical needs and its importance uh, moving forward. So I think uh, um, our, our leadership really wants to understand, make sure that we have everything we need to, to move forward. So I have been going around the state and talking to many of y'all about what our needs are and uh, and I still have many more meetings to set up so um, if you're a GIS agency here at this in the state um, and you haven't heard from me you probably will um, one way or the other so we still got a lot that we are that we are working on and uh, our things are progressing there uh, our historical photo scanning I'm not going to go much into this because this is going to be talked about later in the event um, but we're very, very excited that we're making real um, progress on that. We have made an award to a vendor and to get all our historical photos scanned and put online. So I'm not going to say any more about that because I don't want to mess up the other presentations, as well as statewide LIDAR. Um, very excited to, to um, say that we currently have LIDAR for the entire state of Texas. And Joey's going to speak more on that uh, during his part of the presentation to give you the details. Uh, but if you would have told me five, six years ago we would have state LIDAR now, I I, there was no way I would, I would have ever believed you. And this is that support we've been getting uh, from our own agency who has funded much of it and then through other agencies who have, who have helped us, you know, where we pass the hat and say, can you help us uh, buy up areas and, and, and do other things? Joey's done an amazing job there. And then our federal partners who have really come through on this a uh, huge deal and um, it's something we couldn't be more proud of. Uh, we're also gonna talk a little bit more about, um, you know, our education and training program um, has, has suffered a little bit because of this and, and things are working differently and there's a lot of online learning and so forth. And so, you know, one thing we really wanna start to reach out to uh, the public is to figure out how we can really, really help uh, uh, promote training. You know, what kinds of things do you guys need uh, that maybe we can offer up in the way of education and training um, to keep costs low and and to, you know, to bring you on because we want to continue to push the technology and be able to work within a, a unified environment um, that Texas has established. And so, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to forget it we want to revamp it. We're going to relook at it. We possibly will do a survey and communicate directly to individuals to say, what, what could you use? What are we missing here? But what can we do? Um, so, so be looking for that in the next few months where we'll, we'll reach out about our training and education program. The forum is also included in that. So we want to learn more about that. And then um, lastly, I think, uh, you know, we've been really working hard as, uh, as an agency on our flood initiatives. One of them is that we have been work. We actually joined with USGS on their um, flood decision support toolbox um, that they have created. And let me tell you, those developers at USGS have done an amazing job. I mean, when we saw what they did with that, and knowing what we were going to have to do with flood, it, it didn't make any sense to try to reinvent something. They spent so much time, effort, money, and their programmers are so solid um, that it just made sense to see if we could join them. 
and um, and and it, and it worked out. They were excited to have us, and we were excited to have them. And uh, we've been several months into this process, and they have such amazing work. Uh, so I I think it's um, it's something that is you know really really uh, amazing that you're going to see here in the next several meetings where we'll be able to do demonstrations on what we've learned. It's really going to be be, be pulling in all this lidar data. It's going to be pulling in. Uh, all our building information and everything we've been creating is now going to be seen and be used in a in a more proactive way. So be you know stay tuned for that because you're going to see some really amazing things and some great work that many many people are doing. So uh, excited to show you that uh, when the time comes. And so I'm going to go on to the next slide here. And the reason I'm going to go on to the end of the day is because what I really want to, um, I know some of y'all are going to be on and some of y'all are going to be off, uh, so some of y'all may not actually see this. Um, so I'm going to let you know what's happening here. Swidges is having a virtual trivial night, uh, trivia night uh, tonight at 4.30, kind of right after this event. Uh, so, so we're going to have some information, some details about that, be, but be looking for that for anybody who wants to kind of virtually hang out. Uh, this is the, the time to do it. So uh, thank you, Swidges, for putting that on. Uh, next slide, Joey. Um, and our next scheduled meeting is uh, going to be January 26th, which will be a, a standard GIS community meeting, very similar to this. It won't be as long, uh, but it'll be like you've always seen before. And this looks like this is just going to be kind of the norm for a while, even though when we do have these in, um, when we do have these uh, uh, or, or able to meet, I think we will have a remote component to it to it at all because we have people from all over Texas on this call right now where normally we would have about 60 people. You know, we're looking at about 125 on right now. So, so um, you know, it, it, clearly this is this is the way to go. So put that on your calendar. January 26, Tuesday will be our next quarterly meeting and uh, we'll see you at that one. Joey, go one more, please. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, promote out there is we have ATX GIS Day happening November 16th through the 18th, uh, 2020. Go to this website, you guys. Uh, it, they are doing. There's a lot of people putting this on. This is really, really cool. And uh, Tenris is, is going to be uh, speaking at this as well. But uh, some some great. There's a great agenda items on here. So during uh, GIS Day go take a look at ATX GIS Day, see what they have to offer and join them um, for this because this is going to be really, really cool. Their website is amazing. Uh, they've got a great uh, uh, agenda going on and a lot of people behind it sponsoring and doing so forth. So great stuff. Put that on your calendar as well and, and try to make that if you can. Uh, next slide, Joey. Uh, so this, uh, Jenna uh, told us about this, um, and so during uh, GIS Day, there's a kind of a speed mentoring um, uh, that's going to be going on there, and I think they're looking for uh, uh, people to help and or to be a mentor and mentee on this. Um, so if you're interested, go to the website, take a look at that, and communicate uh, with the folks over there and see if you want to be a mentor, mentee. Um, um, communicate with them and they'll get you on and show you and tell you what that's all about. It's going to be, I think it's going to be really, really cool. Um, the, 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 in the chat, you'll see that there are uh, links to these, to these locations. So um, take a look at that and go there and, uh, and, and sign up. I think it would be great. I think you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, next slide, Joey. Um, so this I want to kind of bring up to people because I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but um, you know, uh, Tenris we have a uh, we have kind of our Texas Geographic Information Office page or GIO page, um, and this is where we'll put a lot of things out there for people, you know, to see what's happening, um, you know, what's happening in the in the community and and what people are doing. And so we haven't really promoted it as much as we probably should, but I think what I really want to do is do that now. If you have things that are, are happening at the state level or would, in the GIS community, or you want to announce something, whatever, communicate with us, let us know, because it's something we can put on here. 
uh, and, and try to advertise it for you. So we're going to start using this page a lot more than we have in the past. Uh, but we really want this to be a part of, um, you know, your your communication outward. Uh, this one, this will be our kind of our outreach page. We want people to see what's going on. So if you've got anything that you want to promote, let me know. Let Felicia know or anybody on staff, and uh, we'll get it. Uh, we'll work with you to get it written up, and we'll put it on here, and we will advertise it. We'll tweet it out. Do whatever we need to do to help. Um, support and promote your activities as well. So this isn't just a Tenris thing. This is something we really want others to take advantage of. Um, so we're excited about that. Let us know how we can help and we definitely want to do that. Um, and the last slide, Joey. So that, that's really kind of it for the day. This is how this is going to work. And um, and hopefully everybody's going to have a great time. Tell us what you think. We had some great responses from the last time we had communicated and talked about people want to see more of this. They would like to see more uh, remote stuff. People can't travel the way others can and can't drive in from Austin from the outlining areas because it's just not efficient for them to do so. Again, as we talk about efficiency in remote meetings, this is this is the way that we're going to be doing these. So. Um, keep your comments coming. We're going to be answering questions as you uh, as you put them out here uh, on your you know you can actually ans answer or you know uh, ask questions here. We're going to be monitoring that and answering the best we can. Um, the presenters as you guys are speaking, uh, and, and if there's some time to to uh, do questions, we'll read them out and see if you can answer them. Otherwise, what we're going to li like to do is send these questions back to the presenter if we if they're running a little bit late and they can answer them directly through this uh you know through this go to meetings um style of things so anyway we're going to do the best we can and let us know how it's working for you and we'll just go from there so felicia am i missing anything is there anything we need to bring up oh goodness i had to unmute myself <laughs> good morning everyone uh, no, I think you covered it all. It was uh, a lot of uh, words for 30 minutes. So thank you for words. giving that. Uh, I'm trying to answer the questions as, as fast as possible. And I think Joey is helping as well. So welcome everybody. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll give you a great show today. Did we have any questions that came up? We still got two minutes before we kick off the actual thing. Anything come up that we need uh, to answer or is everything good right now? I think everything is good right now. I'm answering as we uh, speak and I am uh, posting the link to the uh, actual agenda for today. Okay. Thanks Taylor for asking that question. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so the full agenda link has just been is posted. So take a look at that with all the details. So we're right about 10 o'clock. So we are, wow, that was pretty good. Um, staying on track. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing started then um, if there's no other questions. Uh, I will like to bring up uh, Jason Kleinart, who is part of the Tenris staff. He's going to talk about uh, Nightmare on Geocoder Street. This is actually really, really exciting, and I'm so happy uh, uh, Jason's going to be talking about this. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have a Data Hub survey from Logan Smithson, one of our one of our new staff here at Tenris. And then uh, rounding out the hour, we're going to have an open source uh, scientific Python quick tour from Brendan Collins, the co-founder of MakePath. So. Jason, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello. Um, let's see. I don't know if we can see my screen or not. Um, you can see yeah, we can see. Okay, sorry. I don't really know how to work this thing. Uh, I don't usually do go to webinars. <laughs> you're you're right, on. Good morning, here. everyone. Here you go. Okay, I'm just going to jump into it. Um, so I'm Jason Kleinert, and I was asked to talk today about something that we worked on this spring um, at Tenors. I work at Tenors. Um, let me see. I can't see my own slides, so let's see if I can do that. Okay, so let's just jump into it. So we that's not working all right we have a product at tenors that we refer to as the data hub which is to be found at data.tenors.org 
and that's our new data website. We launched the site last spring in 2019. Um, the website allows us to download and order data directly from Tenris, things like our LiDAR collections, um, different kinds of imagery. We do have some base mapping type stuff, but some of that's not there like it used to be. And that's where I wanted to highlight a couple things that we have going on in there before we get started. Um, you'll see here, we we do provide links to outside entity GIS data sites. So for example, if you're looking for a road network, we have a card in there for TxDOT and it links out to their open data portal. Same thing with Tex Parks Wildlife Department. They have a really nice data site as well. So some of those kinds of things, if you were looking for the authoritative data source, we try to link you out to those um, if we're not holding that data any, long, any longer. Um, other big thing we're going to talk about today later on is that we're interested in user feedback. So we have gotten some feedback at this point. It's been out for about a year and a half, but um, we're really pushing harder to get some more feedback. So my colleague Logan will be talking after I finish um, about ways that you can you can help us to enhance the data hub. Um, and you'll see this last point I made is that something that a lot of people may not know is that we're actually just pushing out enhance constantly. And a lot of that is based on some feedback we've had and just trying to kind of keep building this thing up. It was, you know, quite a lot of development took place and I still see a lot of room for, um, you know, adding new features and functionality and just sort of making things better and better. Um, to that point, so this spring, um, we, you know, had a little time. So something we decided to work on that we knew we needed was a way to look stuff up in the maps that seems to be popular with geo people um so yeah the point of my talk was supposed to be about geocoder so let's talk geocoder um in the data hub we have some maps i don't know if people have seen that but they're there people may not realize that we can search for place names in the maps now um, that was the new feature that we're going to talk about we wanted to add this geocoding ability so that we could look up a place name. For example, if I want to find Travis County, I can just type that in and it comes back. That's really common functionality that people are familiar with, but it's actually not necessarily always so simple. Um, and also being that we're like mostly GIS people, we probably think of a geocoder mostly as, you know, I want to look up, send a bunch of lat longs and I want the addresses back. That's really what's called reverse geocoding, and we can do that as well. But um, the functionality we were looking for was what's a forward geocode. So I want to put in an address, and I want it to take me to that location on the map. Um, and I'm going to run through these slides, but then we're going to get into some actual looking at the, the app and stuff that I'm talking about. So don't worry about that right now. Um, OK, so in designing this geocoding service that we wanted to set up to help be these maps, we know we needed a look up, right? Like we're, we want a search box, somebody can type in what they're looking for. We're focused on Texas. I want this data to be, you know, as up to date as possible. And hopefully I don't want to be the one who has to update it because I'm just a guy that types in a basement. I don't really know, you know, I'm not the expert on every part of Texas and the world and all that kind of good stuff. So preferably somebody who is could help feed me that data. Um, one important thing for us in our data site is a lot of our customers come in and we're looking for like county level data or, you know, not necessarily statewide or maybe it's a city, but county is kind of an interesting one because a lot of geocoding services, you can't necessarily search for a county as an entity because counties are not really standard worldwide. So a lot of the like worldwide map services don't really have a county. Um, so that was important for us though. So I was looking for a way to do that. Um, the big one is autocomplete search support. So like for people who don't know what that is, autocomplete, imagine going like amazon.com or Google search box, you start typing and then it starts showing you suggestions based on your keystrokes. So that is pretty expensive when it comes to a geocoding service. Um, I can talk more about why that is, but that was kind of a big one because I wanted that functionality because I know that that really helps and that's what people are used to when they're working around on the web. Um, and that plays back into this first one where I'm saying we wanted to also keep this as cheap as possible because I don't know It's I work in government. It's my money. I'm a taxpayer and I like to save it as much as I can I don't really believe in that philosophy of spend it down but anyway the um, 
we're trying to keep it cheap. It still does have a cost, you know, serve rank servers, all that kind of junk. We'll talk about it. But anyway, oh, last good one is we do like free and open source software as much as we can use it. Just I believe in the community and the community helps us out, and that's where we want this guy. I will say a little background is I did spend about, I don't know, three weeks or more trying out a bunch of geocoding services just to kind of see what's out there. A lot of the ones we're all familiar with, you know, Esri being Mapbox has a nice one. There's some other open source ones called like um, Geocage, I believe it's called. Um, so anyway, just kind of did the gamut. And then I started playing around with building my own. So I don't know. I thought that might be cool, but then I ran into this issue of like, well, how do I keep this thing up to date? Um, kind of led me back around to an old friend, OpenStreetMap. Now, a lot of people, I'm sure here, are familiar with what this is, but I thought it'd be worth mentioning to those who may not really, really realize what it is. Um, it's a worldwide community-driven map. It's basically like the Wikipedia of maps. So I know that I hear a lot of people talk about it from the standpoint of, hey, that's pretty cool, but it's not really, the data is maybe not that good. Well. I don't believe that's true. The data is pretty amazing. And at this point too, it's project's been around for a long time. And so we have a lot of people who have been contributing to the project, hundreds of thousands of mappers worldwide. And so like the data is pretty good. It is pretty accurate. And the coolest thing about it is if it's not, then you can fix it. And there's another way you can actually contribute if you don't want to fix it is you can actually leave comments. So that's probably something people don't realize. You can go in and you can say, hey, I found a feature that I don't think is correct. This is what I think is wrong with it. And then a mapper who does have the time can pick that comment up and then look into that themselves and verify if that's correct or not. And a lot of it is based on ground truth and things of that nature. So it's pretty cool. Um, I put a little link over here on the side to help you guys out if you're interested in attributing. Uh, let's see. So OpenStreetMap. So cool, we like this data. How do I use that in a geocoding service? Well, it turns out OpenStreetMap has a geocoding service. It's another community project by them. And I touched on that at the beginning and that is called Nominatim. Nominatim is a completely separate application from the OpenStreetMap mapping application, but it uses OpenStreetMap data to um, run a search. It basically indexes it and it has geo indexes as well with geometries from OpenStreetMap so that we can do a lookup. So if you were to go to the OpenStreetMap homepage, which is just the map you're confronted with in a search box, you can look things up and behind the scenes, Nominat team is running, running that lookup. Um, cool thing about it, it's open source project maintained by a bunch of different developers. Um, it is available as a software if you want to run it yourself, which is pretty cool. So this kind of got me interested. I started looking at that. Um, and here I have over on the sidebar, I thought it was kind of interesting. It's it's a Latin word that means um, by name, which is what we're doing. We're looking things up by name. Um, and I'll get into the architecture slightly. This can get kind of deep, so I won't go all the way in. But <laughs> maybe, I don't know. We can go pretty far below the waves. Let's see where the uh, Leviathan sleeps. Um, all right, so a little bit about how we built this thing. So th this is very inside of a nutshell, but <laughs> I have some links that I'll show you at the end if you care about getting deeper. You can go and grab the Nominati um, source code, and it's basically a PHP app running a Postgres database that takes in data from OpenStreetMap, indexes it, does some other spatial stuff. When it's ready, you can start sending queries. Um, there's documentation for the API, which is another reason I really liked it. It makes it standard. We're able to, um, you know, look, like have that stuff documented easily. And then also other users who are interested in hitting that API can see that standard documentation and understand how to do the, the lookups. Currently, our lookup is only going forward, like I mentioned at the beginning. We do have the ability to do the reverse lookup, but we'll have to build that out a little bit more. So I don't know, maybe one day in the future, We'll put something out there where we could actually start doing reverse geocoding from, you know, like lists of lat longs or something. I think that would be kind of a cool um, service to offer to the community um, for Texas. That's actually good, brings me to a good point. Um, we'll start with this flow here. So 
we take in data from OpenStreetMap over in this side. Now, OpenStreetMap data is pretty big. So like if you were to get a file, which is a PDF format, which is a, a proprietary open, it's not proprietary, but it's their open street map format file that gets ingested by their data interoperability tool called Osmium. Um, it's big, it's like 95 gigabytes for the whole planet. And that's cool to have the whole planet. I would love to run one of these with the whole planet, but it's a giant database that gets back into costing a lot of money. So once the use case is there, I can see scaling it up, but we stuck with Texas to start because our data is Texas specific. So that's kind of where we're living now. Um, basically how it works though, is we have this interesting German site over here called Geofabric. So Geofabric is a uh, GIS consulting firm out of Germany, and they specialize in OpenStreetMap data. Something that they do on the side, besides all their actual consulting work, is post offloads of OpenStreetMap data for the entire world sliced up into different um, regional subsets. So if anyone's ever here to try to access OpenStreetMap data, it is a few steps. You know, there's maybe some processing that you need to be aware of to be able to get down to that stuff, and especially if you're looking for just a piece of it. So it's really handy, and actually through the OpenStreetMap documentation, Geofabric is one of the sites they recommend going to. They're pretty much in the community known as the place to go if you want these regional offloads. And what they do is, it's cool, is they, they take basically the planet file that comes out every day. And so daily they take the planet file and then they chop it all up throughout the world. You can start, I'll show you guys this too when we get to the demo. Um, you can drill down and you can get down all the way to say Texas, for example, or what's really common is if you're, if you're you know, doing some development work and playing around with this data, a lot of people use Monaco because Monaco is, you know, a, a niche, small, very small nation. So that data set is basically one of the smallest ones there is. And so processing times are a lot slower. Um, to load up Texas into the database that we're running here, it takes about an hour and a half um, to initialize the database. So give you kind of an idea. I believe to do the entire planet would take, it's something like five days on a pretty beefy server. It's just getting all those spatial indexes initially run and everything takes, takes some time. Um, so what we got going here is what's known as a container, Linux container. That's this little gray box. I didn't really have a good graphic to show you, but the idea is kind of a shipping container on ships here. Um, and the biggest open source platform that everybody in the world is using right now for Linux containers is called Docker. Some may have heard about the word Docker, or maybe you're familiar with what it is, but basically Docker is just a implementation of a Linux container, which has been around since basically the beginning of Unix. So um, what it allows us to do though is pretty cool. We can encapsulate an entire application, including the operating system needed to run it inside of a contained unit that I can move around onto any machine I want to run it on. And so what I did here, and this is actually not really the standard implementation of Nomi Natim, but this works better for the way that we run stuff and also it's portable, which is cool, is that we're running the Postgres database and the web server inside of this one of these containers. Um, so, and then that container actually lives on a server, which if y'all want to, I don't know, think about it in the fun way, we're, we're using the um, Amazon Web Services cloud platform to host our service. And really it's like, I don't even know how many levels down you have to go before you get to a real like bare metal machine. It's like, you know, my web server running inside of a container, running inside of a container, inside of a container, and container, and container. It's containers all the way down basically. Um, but that's an aside, <laughs> that might be fun. So anyway, um, this is the core of our service that we're running. And we're pulling in these daily up, we're, we're, that's something I didn't mention, is that Nomi Not Team also has a pretty nice um, update mechanism that's built that runs a PHP that you can enable, basically, that we point it at some source files over here. And so we take an initial load of the entire state, initialize the database down here, and then once we're up and running, which we are now, we're ingesting daily updates every, so every day we pull it down a file, OpenStreetMap publishes these diff files, 
and the file says what's changed in the last 24 hours so you don't have to pull a whole data set every day and so you can get the diff diff checks the database finds out what's different then goes back to the source and only pulls in those changes so we're fresh and up to date every day which is pretty cool what that means for you guys is if you're in our website or something and you're using this you try to look something up and you're like hey that seems weird i think that you know that city limit strange or i don't know i didn't find the, the little city i'm looking for it's not in the data um you can go at it if you add it to OpenStreetMap, it'll be in our map tomorrow so that was something that really appealed to me um i like having you guys have the ability to kind of feed some of what you're seeing back on itself and i also feel pretty strongly that you know we should be contributing to this community if we can as mappers especially because most of our data is all open and free anyway. So, and we're describing the state, of, the state and the country and, you know, the world. Pretty cool. So anyway, let's follow along any, all the way up into the consumption over here by FINRIS, our user. Um, so basically that's how this guy works. And then we have our data web server over here, which is the actual data site that you may have come to through your web client of choice your favorite maybe maybe that's opera i don't know um it's not mine i use chrome but <laughs> i'm not sure about fenris he's an interesting dude he may not use chrome maybe more of like a ie elite kind of guy um also just so you know that data hub doesn't run in ie so just stop using internet explorer altogether um so anyway you make you make requests through your client when you're searching in the box Roads to Data Hub. Data Hub makes the APR request to our Nomi Nothing web server. Web server checks Postgres, brings back what you want. Boom, there it is. You know, pretty cool. I said I'd touch on the autocomplete part. That's where this becomes real key is that while well, Finneris types, maybe he starts typing, I don't know, I want to look up Austin. A U S. Every time he hits a key, we has another API call. So one of the limitations of a lot of these geoplaning services, be they pay or especially the free versions. So um, uh, Nomi Not Team, there is a hosted version that you can go use. And so you can hit their API, their hosting costs you nothing, except for you can only make one API call per second. So if you can imagine a, one user keystroking, you'd have like how many API, API calls are we gonna run up per day, like per second, way too many. Um, so they just rate limit that stuff. And I wanted the functionality of the autocomplete dropdown, so that's why we're doing this whole jazz ball thing. Um, so anyway, pretty cool. Type, type, type. Shows you a list. You can pick what you want. Happy user. Here's a little, I don't know, fun time slide I thought I'd throw in. If anybody's interested in the deeper stuff, containers versus virtual machines. So a Linux container is very similar to a virtual machine, which a lot of people are probably familiar with those, like VirtualBox or something. Cool thing about the container is that everything is contained in one like standalone unit where you have you have a machine running its host operating system. So you have one operating system, and then each container dips in and uses resources from the kernel to run its own. You could run separate operating systems. Each one of these could be a Windows, a Linux, a, you know, Red Hat Linux, Fedora, I don't know, whatever you want. And over here, virtual machine, just more resource heavy. Like we have the hypervisor. The hypervisor is really akin to this Docker engine over here that's making this orchestration happen. But in this guy, each one of these units, we have to run a completely separate operating system. So takes up a lot more resources, it's heavier, it's harder to ship around. I can't just let you build that one quickly and run it on your machine. Um, so kind of just a little bit of a primer on that. That gets a little more complicated, obviously. The last thing I want to say about it that's pretty cool, you might ask is, hey, Jason, can I run Docker on Windows? Yes, you can. So you can actually take our container if you wanted to build the one that, that we put together from our GitHub and you could build it locally on one of your machines and you could run this service for Texas out of a Docker container on, I think it's called like Docker for Windows or something like that. But obviously it works for Windows, Mac or Linux. Works best on Linux, but um, you, so the reason why that's neat and I have a link at the end to our GitHub repo is that if y'all wanted to do this in your own shop, you can, and you can kind of look at what we did and 
get some ideas and you could set up your own geocoder where you could actually run reverse geocodes on it and you can even run it on a local server like a box in your office you don't have to spend money to have it spinning all the time up in the clouds um so i'm gonna move on got a little more time so i think it's time for a demo see if i can figure out how to put it here all right let's bounce through this really quick so here's our old friend OpenStreetMap. This is just the home page. If we go to the search box here, you know, that's notice notice here they don't actually do TechPed because it costs costs a lot. Like I said, we're kind of familiar to this this look. So let's just pick this guy, you know. Hey, we found Austin. Cool. So it does all that usual stuff. I'm, I have links to this at the end of the slide if you want to see that. Um, I think it's worth a trip. I think it's really cool. Um, so here's the Nomina team homepage, which is pretty neat. It's got, you know, your, let's see, useful links, power users. That's probably where I went because, you know, we want to install this thing and read all about it. Um, you can see some usage information, which is kind of cool. Here's the documentation for Nomina team. Pretty, pretty rich, pretty cool. Shows you all the ABI call stuff you want to know. How do you install this thing? How do you update it? How do you deploy it? Um, it's kind of, intense you know you might want to not just you might want to know a little bit about computers before you get involved in this i would say but um it's it's doable anybody can do it um let's see anything else cool yeah this is just their usage policy i thought i'd show this because we can see there are some requirements this is for the the free version that they're hosting you know they don't want a lot of people hitting the server just because it costs money to run servers they don't want to run a vp server so that's why they're limiting the rate um Here's the GeoFabric site, pretty cool. They um, just download that geofabric.de and we can click down, we can go North America, let's see, subregion, United States of America, and then we have all our states here. So pretty neat. You can go in and pick your state and actually up here, the Texas latest osm.pbf is that file that our database can read, but they actually have um, just an export of the shapefile format that's a zip file of all the different features that you can find in OpenStreetMap exported as shapefile. So if you wanted to grab a bunch of stuff for Texas, you can get it from here um, in that shapefile format. And so inside of our site, I'm sorry, you'll have to bear with me this control panel's in my way for the go to webinar software. All right, so this is the data hub, and from the landing page in the toolbar over here, we have an ability to filter by geography. If we go over to this map, you can see we have a search bar now. So we could search for, I don't know, let's see, let's say Presidio. So Presidio, you'll notice we get Presidio County and Presidio, Presidio County, Texas. That's pretty cool. So one thing about OpenStreetMap data is they're ranking, um, regional like like um what you call it like if my mind went blank jurisdictional boundaries basically like county city state they're being ranked by a hierarchy of importance so county is more important than city in the hierarchy so we always get our county at the top which i thought was pretty nice and a lot of that comes from wikipedia which is kind of a cool tie-in so if we go ahead and pick that you know like boom there it is it brings back the geometry of the place and a bounding box. So we can actually use the bounding box to zoom a map and we can show the geometry on the map. Pretty, pretty slick. Um, same thing with the cities. We do the city of Presidio. You know, there we go. Boom, there's the city. Something kind of fun is that an unincorporated city, so for example, Shafter, just down the road from Presidio, unincorporated, so it just is a dot because it doesn't have a boundary. Um, so that's not really an error, that's just that that is unincorporated. So that might be interesting. We also have lines in here, so we could look up a road. Um, there's kind of a fun one too. You can do address searches. So if we do 1700 Congress, nope, it's freaking out there, Congress Avenue. And then it'll take us down to where I work at the Stephen F. Austin building. And you maybe didn't see, but if you go in here, and we do this way, Congress. This first choice is the Stephen F. Austin building, and we get the building footprint. OpenStreetMap's famous for having building footprints. 
All right, so what does this mean to you? Well, if you wanted to look at our data for stuff, you could go, let's say I want to care about Travis County. Let's pick Travis County. Um, let's see how much time I got left. I'm running kind of over. All right, um, we can set a filter on that. And then let's say we want some of this sweet cap area and McLennan imagery that came out for 2020. Let's go to that collection and there we go. So Travis County is now you know, saved from our geo search and then we can see the tiles of imagery that intersect with that county boundary. So kind of useful, I, I think. So now we can see which tiles we want for that geography. All right, let's go back. One more, one more little dip in. Clear all this stuff. And if we go, eh, let's go to Belmarine. And now let's go back here. Yeah, same kind of deal in here. We get a search and we can now search for, you know, let's say Austin, Texas, you know, the city. And same kind of thing. So inside the downloads too, you can just start searching for stuff and you can find what you want. And over here, y'all probably been noticing you get that nice type of head like I was talking about before. Sorry, I'm using the weird different computer today. Um, so anyway, that takes us back over here where I think that's happening there. Um, like I said, here are those resource links to what we looked at today. I didn't put in here, I feel kind of remiss, I should bring it up, is that um, I did steal all of this imagery from, from the internet. Um, so I guess give credit where credit's due. This seems to be from Rosemary's Baby. Um, I think this thing down here, this, this is like a scary stories tell the dark or something. I forget that artist's name, but it's pretty nice. Some of the other stuff you all saw was some, uh, you know, like a turn of the century Norwegian artist named Theodore Kittleson, made popular on the album covers of Van Burzum. Um, also, Dark Throne, okay, got to mention Dark Throne. Oh, and Nightmare on Elm Street 3, the Dream Warriors. I'd like to thank them as well. Um, but pretty much that's all we got um, for me. Now, I'm going to set up what's coming next is my colleague Logan Smithson is going to talk about um, some ways that we want to get um, users involved with helping us enhance Data Hub and to add more cool features like this, like I was talking about today. So I guess I can look really quick to see if there's any schedules or sorry questions, but I don't know how much time. But I'll try to answer the questions as I come off, um, pass it over to Logan. So at this point, I would give it to Logan. I don't know, Joey, is that? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today. My name is Logan. I'm a web administrator here with Tenris. I'm actually fairly new to the team. I just joined about two months ago, so I'm excited to be a part of my first GIS conference. You know, I never dreamed that one day I would be hosting over 100 people from the state GIS conference live from my bedroom, but here we are, and I'm glad that you all could join me. So I'm here today, as Jason mentioned, to talk about a new survey that our team has just implemented for Data Hub. And I'd like to invite all of you in the audience to come take the survey. So first, why are we doing this? Well, we want to continue to improve Data Hub and make it a better product. And the best way we can do this is to get feedback from you all to learn more about how you're using Data Hub, if there are any common problems that many of you are having, and what features and functions could we implement to create a better user experience? This survey will allow us to gather both quantitative and qualitative data that our team can analyze to inform future design and development decisions, which will allow us to prioritize features based on what would really be the most helpful to our users. So if you've ever used Data Hub or if you might in the future, we highly encourage you to come take our survey. This is the best way for you to make your voice heard so we can continue to improve Data Hub. In creating this survey, we wanted to be respectful of your time, so we designed it to be short and to the point. It should take about five minutes or less to complete. In fact, they'll probably spend longer talking about it here today than it will take most people to complete the whole survey. 
we have an open-ended question that allows you to go into as much detail as you'd like. So if you feel strong about anything in particular, feel free to be as descriptive as you want. The more information we have, the more useful it is to us. That being said, if you're short on time, you can give a short response here or skip that question entirely. We really value any feedback that you're able to give. So please, we hope you'll take it either way. And I'll actually share my screen here um, so I can show how you can get to the survey and uh, what type of questions you can expect. And for those of you that may be playing quarantine conference call bingo at home, here is where you may earn some points. Um, as I'm going to ask, um, can you see my screen, um, which I'm sure you would have on your board? It looks like it should be showing. So um, I'll go ahead. So here you can navigate to the data hub uh, by going to data.tenris.org. Um, you could also go directly to tenris.org where you could go to uh, data and maps and click the drop down and click on this first um, data hub tab. So once that loads, you will see a, uh, a small box pop up in the bottom right corner where it prompts you to take a survey. Um, you can either decline that or you can say sure. Um, and if you say sure, oh, one more other thing is it'll take a few seconds before that pops up. It's on a time delay. So if you don't see it instantly, that's why. So the first question that you will see is, are you finding what you're looking for? So basically, why did you come to the hub and are you successful in what it is that you're looking for? Um, and if you say no, partially or not sure, still looking, then we ask you to go into more detail. That way we can figure out um, what it was specifically. And if it seems like a lot of people are having those same problems, then that'll let us know that that's something for sure that we should fix. Um, if you just say yes, then there's no open ended response. You can just continue. Next question is, um, asking you to rate data hub on the following items um, from one to five, one being the lowest score possible, uh, five being the best. And as much as we would love to get all fives here, we really value your honesty. So uh, please uh, feel free to be as honest as possible. Uh, our feelings won't be hurt. We ask for uh, searchability. So this is when you're searching um, at the top there for data sets on data hub navigation so this is you navigating between pages navigating to the data sets back to the filtering page and so on um, filtering tools so that is that bar that you see on the right um, the different options to sort a to z oldest um, by availability so downloads order only etc um, and the different categories that you can filter between um, so how much do you like that filtering system? And then the last one being the ability to download data. So I'm just going to mark threes um, and move on. Next up is a few statements. We just ask, do you agree or disagree with the following? Um, and you can go from strongly agree to strongly disagree, or uh, if you don't feel strongly opinionated, just hit neutral. Um, and those are, uh, I believe Data Hub is easy to use. I believe Data Hub has valuable data sets, and I would recommend Data Hub to others. Again, just go in the middle here and um, continue on with the survey. And so here's that open ended question that I talked about. Um, so here is this is your opportunity to give open ended feedback, anything that's on your mind um, about Data Hub, anything you would like to see included, any problems that you have while using Data Hub. Um, you can fill that out here. You can put as much as possible, or you can say nothing at all. Um, again, feel free to skip this question uh, if you feel like it. Next, we, we're just trying to get some demographic information, learn about who is using our data hub. Um, so you can choose your role here, and you could choose, uh, we also ask what software and version number do you intend to use the data with? Um, so you can fill that out and that will just be helpful for us to get an idea of how our data is being used. And finally, the last question, um, we ask if you are willing to participate in a follow-up, uh, we may be doing some follow-up interviews to learn uh, more about your experiences in depth or perhaps um, 
as we continue to iterate and build new versions, we may be looking for some new people to test that with. Um, so if you're willing to participate, we ask that you um, click this toggle option to yes. You can en enter your name, your email address, and job title. Um, and then we may be following up with you in the near future. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable doing that or you just don't have the time, um, it's totally fine. You can say no. Um, and then that's it. That's the final question. You just hit complete down here. And then that information will come to us. Once again, we really value your feedback. Uh, please come take the survey. It's extremely helpful to us. And again, thank you all for your time here today. Um, next up, I believe we have Brendan Collins from MakePath, so I'll pass it over to him. Great, thanks, Logan. Okay, um, are folks seeing a blue presentation slide? Yeah, we see it. Okay, great, great. So um, super excited to be here. Um, thanks to Jason and Logan for those those first presentations kicking off the day. And um, thanks to Richard and Brooke, Felicia, and the Tenris team for, for hosting this event. Um, us at MakePath are, are super excited to be here and talk a little bit about the open source GIS stack for Python. Um, so just diving in here, uh, the topics for this presentation are specifically looking at um, why open source for GIS. And we're going to be diving into a bunch of different Python libraries. This is going to be a little from the fire hose. So we're going to you know, be taking some notes on, on what you uh, think is interesting here, but we'll also be posting um, links to all the projects that we're showing. We're going to be walking through um, about five or six different open source libraries that are pertinent to GIS and GIS professionals. And our hope is that um, these augment your GIS toolkit. And while we're focusing on open source projects, um, we also see the need for a lot of proprietary software platforms. And we'd like to break down a, a little bit of the narrative that there's a contentious relationship between open source projects and proprietary software. Specifically, um, ArcGIS and Esri is a proprietary software company that has made amazing contributions to open source, specifically the open, uh, the open shapefile specification and the open file geodatabase specification, all their contributions to um, uh, open source communities like sponsoring Fosper G. And so while we're gonna be looking at open source tools, I wanna plant that flag in the sand that these tools are meant to augment your GIS toolkits and don't always you know, replace one-to-one -to -one tools that are available within proprietary packages. Um, but specifically of what we're gonna be looking at um, is uh, tools to know about for raster analysis, um, analysis on regular grids, vector analysis with points, lines, and polygons, a little bit about data visualization and some tools you should know about for data viz, and we're also going to address some scaling issues when we take a analysis that's running on one machine and scale it to a larger problem. That may involve a cluster or it might involve a large machine with many uh, CPUs on it. We're going to speak a little bit to scaling with open source tools. So who are we? We're MakePath. Uh, we're a spatial data science firm based in Austin, Texas. We have a strong commitment to open source software. We're contributors to many open source libraries for GEO. Uh, we have some logos here of some of the libraries we're most passionate about. We're core developers on the Bokeh library, which is a data visualization library for Python. Um, we're also the creators of X-Ray Spatial, which is a spatial analysis library focused on raster analysis. And we're gonna be looking at a little bit at X-Ray Spatial. And we're also core developers on the Data Shader library. Data Shader is a general purpose rasterization pipeline for finding structure in large data sets. We're gonna take a, take a little look, but there's some other interesting projects here like GeoPandas and QGIS, and we'll talk a little bit about those as we go. At MakePath, we have a deep expertise in spatial data analytics and visualization. Um, we love beautiful maps, and here's a couple of screenshots from uh, the X-ray spatial library showing some surface analysis. 
Um, we partner with public and private sector clients to help them solve their spatial problems. Um, and we're also a, uh, a preferred service provider for Anaconda, the leading company in pushing the Python ecosystem forward. So getting into it, open source for GIS, what's all the hullabaloo about? Well, let's go through a couple of value propositions that uh, for open source software. First, fairly obvious is money. So open source tools lower your total ownership costs, and this this uh, you know relates to fixed and recurring license fees, and it also empowers your analysts and staff with uh, being part of a larger community while also limiting some budget line items uh, from uh, purchasing purchasing proprietary tools. Open source tools are extensible and maintainable. So you can take open source tools with access to all of the source code and extend them for your specific use case. And you can also share your tools to reduce redundancy across groups and agencies. Um, I think that Richard was mentioning USGS and their work with floods. And that's a nice example of reducing redundancy between different organizations by sharing code and sharing common tools. Open source tools are also transparent. Since you can access all the underlying source code, you can really understand what the tools are doing. And you can also influence an open source project and help to steer it um, onto topics that are most relevant to your mission. This can be done by contributing to a project for a specific, um, you know, a specific tool or feature that your group is interested in and championing that feature within the community. Um, and also in transparency, uh, just a quote from Linus Torvalds, that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And that's one of the major strengths of open source software is that there's a lot of eyes on the code. Having people from different domains using similar tools means that people can bring their own experience to the table and also critique other people's contributions. And that's a powerful part of maintaining um, and using open source software. We also in the in open source have the ability to scale an analysis without any of the pitfalls of licensing individual machines. If we wanna take an analysis that we have running on our local machine, maybe it runs fine on a small subset of data, but we need to scale it to all the LIDAR for the state of Texas, we may want to employ a cluster of machines to do that analysis. When you're using open source tools, you don't have the issue of things like a floating license server or a bottleneck in scaling up the number of machines that you're using for a sp specific analysis. So we, those were a couple of points on why to consider open source software, but why specifically Python? So Python is a, is a programming language. It's a high level programming language and its motto is programming for everyone. It was designed to teach programming to children. That means that no matter what level of software development skills you have, Python is an approachable tool. And over the past decade, Python has really blossomed to be the dominant language for data science, machine learning, web development. And many of us were first introduced to Python because it was embedded inside of ArcGIS. Um, in, I believe in, in some of the early versions of ArcGIS, they, they included Python back to maybe, you know, ArcGIS 8 or, or 9. Um, and that gives us a, a starting place to approach Python. And ArcGIS specifically has some really nice tools to integrate with the other open source projects within the Python community. Um, things like ArcPy have hooks for converting a ArcGIS raster to a NumPy array, for instance. And with, um, with a, a large community that extends outside of just GIS, there are many libraries and um, technologies that we can use from the Python ecosystem, which may not necessarily have been designed for um, geospatial practitioners. And uh, Python is more popular than ever. There was a rough transition from Python 2 to Python 3. This is what we're looking at is an article, a recent article in uh, Wired Magazine talking about Python. And um, developers are still flocking to the language. Uh, its popularity is growing. And that's important because you want to know that there are um, Python experts out there uh, as you're hiring staff and analysts and know that 
you're not working in a um, in a language that only few people know. Python also is somewhat validated by uh, some very large projects which use Python on the back end. YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, these are all Python uh, server projects and show the ability of, of Python to be used both in a small context for analysis, but then also in a, in a web scale uh, system like YouTube. So um, let's start diving into some open source projects that you should be aware of and uh, can augment your GIS toolbox. So moving over to the browser now, you should be seeing Project Jupyter homepage. Project Jupyter um, is, a, I think, a good one to start with because it's a development environment. So when you get started with Python, start by downloading Jupyter and playing around with Python in an interactive web environment. Jupyter is a development environment for the web, which allows you to compose notebooks. And these notebooks ha can have executable code, they can have text, equations, visualizations, and models, and allow us to easily share our insights or analyses with our colleagues. So you can put together a notebook that includes some semantic content about what is going on in this Lorenz system, for instance. But then you can also include executable code so that uh, the, the person that you send this to, or maybe it's you in a couple of months, um, understand how the code relates to the problem that you're solving and have a reproducible environment to run that code. Um, the Jupyter Notebook also um, is, you're able to convert a Jupyter Notebook into many other formats. For instance, you can take a Jupyter Notebook and you can publish it as a blog post. So you can structure, say, a technical blog post as a Jupyter Notebook and then export it to HTML, and that's really nice. At MakePath, we usually um, have companion notebooks for most of our blog posts. This is one of our blog posts here that we recently did, looking at, at identifying seniors at risk from pharmacy deserts. And we used a, a, a couple of different open source tools in, in doing this analysis, but we're specifically looking at areas of the lower 48 United States, which have particularly high percentages of senior citizens in their area, and also are very far away from pharmacies. So this is a real world problem that we used open source tools to help um, understand. We defined a study area, um, we created a, a, a distance grid, a great circle, circle distance grid to the nearest pharmacy, and, uh, and matched that up with the percentage of um, citizens over the age of 65 to identify counties which have particularly high um, percentages of senior citizens, but are also tend to be very far away from pharmacies. And while this blog post is a nice descriptive piece on the analysis, we don't stop there. We provide the full analysis as a Jupyter Notebook in the X-ray Spatial GitHub repository. And this shows how we combine the tools together to load data, define a study area, and complete our analysis. So these same layers that we included in our blog post are available in a notebook where you can reproduce that analysis and verify, hey, did MakePath do this correctly? Maybe there was something, something wrong here. We can take this analysis and we can verify um, that, uh, that things look good. So this is an example of a Jupyter notebook and we're combining semantic content or description and text with executable code and visualizations and outputs. It's a very powerful combination, especially when you send this to a colleague and they're able to reproduce your analysis um, easily. So this analysis relied, um, relied on X-Ray Spatial, which is a library, a raster analysis library that was developed by MakePath. It includes many of the raster analysis tools that you know and love, things like surface analysis tools for, um, uh, for hill shading and slope and curvature. It also includes tools for zonal statistics and proximity analysis, view shed analysis, and focal statistics. These are all contained within X-ray spatial. And all of the code for X-ray spatial here, we're looking at a view shed example. So we have a, an observer point, and we have a mock uh, hill here in the middle, and we're gonna see which pixels are in direct line of sight from the observer. 
And so here we're using a viewshed analysis from X-ray spatial. So X-ray spatial is a, is a high level raster analysis library that includes um, tools that GIS practitioners know, um, named in inappropriate ways for GIS practitioners. And so as we go, go back up to the top, we can um, go to the X-ray spatial GitHub repo and we can scroll down and we can see some of the, the tool areas that are available within X-ray spatial. So this is cleanly falling within raster analysis. So when you think X-ray, when you think X-ray spatial, think raster. And I mentioned X-ray. So X-ray spatial is based on another library that's called X-ray. X-ray and the X-ray data array is make paths go to raster format. Um, X-ray, the library is based on the NetCDF specification. And so if you work with a lot of climate data or store data in HDF5 or NetCDF, then X-ray is going to feel very natural as you, uh, as the in-memory data model for X-ray mirrors that of NetCDF. Um, another library that we, uh, that we saw within the pharmacy desert example was data shader. So data shader is a, is again, falls on the raster side, but is specifically our rasterization engine. So what data shader does is it allows you to um, construct a pipeline of functions that take um, either points, lines, polygons, meshes, or other rasters and rasterizes them to a common, um, to a common grid. So if you're familiar, for instance, with the concept of snap raster, where you take two rasters and you can you know, make their resolutions the same. Um, this is the type of, of operation that Data Shader does for you. And here we're looking at a plot of the lower 48 United States, where we're plotting one point per person in the country. And uh, what we get out is a population density map. And we can uh, actually resolve some of these secondary cities, which in, in other rasterization engines might be obscured by the, uh, the distribution of high populations in New York and Houston and LA. But using Data Shader, we can control the color mapping so that we don't um, lose that structure as we generate images. Um, the next one down is an example of a categorical map created using Data Shader. We're looking at race and ethnicity in the New York City area. And um, this is again one point per person. So we have about 16 million points in this plot using Data Shader, which renders usually about in under a second using Python. Um, while we have around 300 million points in this population density map. And Data Shader is not specifically geo. It's it's um, a general purpose rasterization pipeline. So you can also um, create uh, beautiful images out of non-spatial data. Here we're looking at strange attractors or the probability that a particle is going to be in a certain location given a, a certain strange attractor function. So this is Data Shader. This is open source. And you can install this um, using uh, common Python third-party packaging libraries like PIP or Conda. So moving from the, the raster side to the vector side, GeoPandas is a great library, Python-based library, for doing um, vector-based analysis. So things that we're concerned about on the, on the vector side would be um, geometric manipulations, um, map projections, anything dealing with points, lines, and polygons, GeoPandas is a great option to look at. I'm, I'm specifically, you know, really use these set operations all the time. So this would be um, in doing an overlay analysis, we're doing a union or a difference. And also um, a common vector analysis tool would be uh, aggregation with a dissolve. So between having all your overlay tools, you can do spatial joins, you can do dissolves. This covers a good uh, number of the vector-based analysis operations you'd want to be doing uh, for GIS. So this is GeoPandas. So, so far we've looked at X-ray, spatial, X-ray, data, sh data shader, excuse me, all on the raster front and um, geopandas on the vector front. 
And GeoPandas supports uh, plotting. So within a notebook, you can call a dot plot function and it will actually uh, render a image of the vectors that you're working with. So these are um, analysis tools, but let's just take a minute to talk a little bit about scaling. So when you scale from one machine to many machines, you need to have a, um, a strategy to do that. And our strategy at MakePath is to use a project called Dask. Dask implements many common data structures that uh, folks within the Python community are familiar with, things like NumPy arrays and Pandas data frames, which are the Pandas data frame is equivalent to a Excel worksheet. Um, but it implements these data structures in a way that allows them to scale across multiple machines. So when we think about scaling, we're going to think about vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling means that we are taking the same algorithm and we're running it many times across either multiple cores or threads or machines, while vertical scaling means taking that algorithm and making that algorithm faster. So those are the two dimensions of scaling that we like to think about, and Dask is a great library for horizontal scale, for taking your, the same algorithm and running it across many cores or many machines. Numba is the library that we use for um, vertical scaling or making our algorithms faster. Numba takes Python code and compiles it down to LLVM bytecode, which is the language of the C interpreter, and allows, um, allows you to, to write Python, but get the performance of C. So as we're writing things like convolution filters on rasters or building, um, building R trees, we use Numba to take our code and make it faster. And uh, as just kind of wrapping up here, um, I also wanted to highlight the importance of design and open source within, um, within web development and GIS. Here we're looking at the SafeGraph foot traffic comparison uh, dashboard, which allows us to pin different businesses head to head and understand their percentage of foot traffic for a given census block group. Um, this is a, you know, a relevant application for um, uh, reopening the, the American economy um, post COVID. And here we're looking at Starbucks versus Dunkin Donuts. This is using Leaflet as uh, an open source GIS library for web mapping. Um, which is written in JavaScript. And we can see a little bit of Leaflet's documentation here. And a big shout out to, um, to the team at SafeGraph, which, which developed this and partnered with MakePath to, to implement. Um, there's tons of tools within the open source GIS ecosystem. And at MakePath, we've created a infographic which shows the history of many of these tools. So head on over to makepath.com and check out our open source GIS infographic to learn about some additional libraries for your toolkit. Well, that um, wraps up the time with a clean two minutes for questions. Um, you're always welcome to reach out to us um, either by email or um, on um, GitHub and happy to take um, some questions uh, over, over the day about any of these libraries or any other topics that, that you're interested in. So thank you guys and thank you to um, Penris and. Richard and, and the whole community for um, for making this event possible. Brendan, thank you so much. And, and thank you to uh, Jason and Logan as well. Um, very fascinating um, presentations. And there is one quick question. We have one minute uh, that is from Joanna Valente. Um, do you know which of these tools that you identified work with R? Yeah, so the um, uh, R spatial, we didn't mention R spatial, but that's a great library that's akin to GeoPandas for vectors. I don't have a good go-to for the raster side of R, but R, I would really recommend checking out R spatial. Really great community and great tools. Okay, great. Well, listen, thank you to, to, to all our presenters for this uh, track. We uh, very, very much appreciate a lot of work going into all of this stuff and uh, and uh, uh, Brendan, I don't know if you're going to be able to stay on um, throughout the remainder of these conversations, but uh, if you are, um, you know, check some of the questions out as well. And if you can't, what I'll try to do is forward them to you so that you can answer maybe offline at a later time. But uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Felicia, I'm going to turn it over to you for your session number two. Great. I'm ready.
Um, hi, everyone. So happy to see so many familiar names in the window. We're hovering at around 100, 120 uh, attendees. So um, even though we have uh, almost 200 registered. So, you know, as um, Richard said in the beginning of this, please jump on and off as you see fit and, um, uh, you know, check out whatever you uh, like to see. Um, in our next showcase, uh, in our showcase too, this next hour, you're gonna see uh, presentations from Scott Friedman of GLO. Um, there are some gentlemen also, uh, Lorenzo and uh, Larry and Matt will be talking to you about some of the activities that are going on at the Railroad Commission, um, which is really kind of exciting because with all of this um, talk about evidence-based policymaking, um, I think that there's a lot of attention um, on GIS as one of those um, tools that can that can give you the evidence. And um, I think that's all great for our careers. Um, it creates lots of job opportunities for the future. Um, and then at the end of the hour, we're gonna hear from Benny Patel, who's gonna talk about some tools that they're creating uh, to help with flood mitigation. So Scott, if you are ready, I will let you take it away. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Scott Friedman. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, I am the, uh, I guess I could turn my camera on to say hello. Howdy. Um, I'm, a, I'm a real adult today, y'all. I uh, had to come into the office anyway for uh, some other, reason, other reasons, so I uh, thought I'd put a jacket on for you um be a real adult um uh, i wanted to follow up first with uh what uh richard was talking about uh saving a lot of time um and being more productive um i will flip over to my screen so um Y'all heard of this uh, coronavirus thing? Um, we uh, we like uh, like everyone else, you know. Beginning in in mid March, state uh, governmental agencies in Texas began facing new challenges. Um, I can get my screen here. There we go. Uh, with GIS staff suddenly working remotely, and we weren't we weren't no different at the general land office um, due to the pandemic, the geospatial technology services team, and, and I should, as an aside, we, um, we used to be called the GIS team, as uh, a, lot of, a lot of operations are. Um, we renamed, rebranded several months ago, um, and now we're um, geospatial technology services at the general land office. Um, so we suddenly had to, like everyone else, began conducting all our regular business operations from home. Um, the agency's IT department, of which the geospatial team is a part, immediately began developing a plan for continuing and even enhancing our normal business functions. Uh, I also, also should say, I'm happy to take questions as I, as I go here. Um, so if there are questions on specific things uh, that TINRA staff want to read out from the chat, that's fine. That's great or we can do it at the end, whatever you want to do. Um, so we, we had to work remotely to continue uh, fulfilling the diverse mission of the land office while keeping all employees and their families safe. So the GLO business continuity plan we've been following has actually enhanced our ability to ad uh, adapt to the changing virus situation while continuing to support our users and customers. Um, because of the ongoing and even increased need for field operations, our team has even has enabled uh, staff to conduct field assessments, collaborate and edit the data, and share the results with end users via web applications. And I'll, I'll talk about, I'll present some of those in a bit. Um, we've enabled new staff members, GIS interns, uh, and, and contractors to engage remotely with GLO resources to fulfill critical agency projects. So that's why we thought that maybe the the topic of business continuity 
uh, with regard to geospatial technologies at the land office would would kind of serve as a great overarching theme to summarize what our team's been able to accomplish over the last several months while working remotely um, for the agency, for our mission, and in providing uh, service to the public. The first thing I, I wanted to mention, and it's um, not a GIS tool, but uh, obviously, but um, I don't think we could have been as productive as we've been without it. Um, uh, and that's Microsoft Teams. So previously we conducted meetings in person by conference call um, or sometimes with video through through product, something like life size. But we never really did a lot of video meetings. Um, we had Skype for business, but only really ever used that for text chats. Um, however, beginning in March, as we prepared to disperse, um, we quick, quickly deployed, uh, deployed teams for the IT department, and then more recently, it's been rolled out for the rest of the agency. Um, it's a much better collaboration tool with many optional built-in apps. It completely integrates with SharePoint that we're, we've also moved to, um, as well as other Microsoft products, and it's really increased our productivity um, when having to collaborate remotely. Um, we are conducting meetings every day. In fact, our team, the geospatial team, has a, a daily check-in meeting. Um, we all hop on Teams and, and do that. Uh, we've also been able to use that really well with our customers, so highly recommend it. Um, the second thing I'll mention is our GIS internship program. And um, we have, we've had a very successful year-round uh, in uh, GIS internship program for, for many, many years. Um, and we were unsure about how that would go um, working remotely. Uh, we've always had interns come into the office to work. Um, we recruit interns, uh, student interns from many central Texas colleges and universities, UT, ACC, Texas State, Texas A&M, uh, both the, the the main campus as well as the the coastal campuses Galveston and Corpus Christi. Um, our previous our our just previous batch of interns started started off working in the office last fall and and in the spring, um, and then we had to make the transition uh, or they had to make the transition work from home and we we've been able to to utilize um, our our network our ArcGIS online. Uh, resources um, and and other things to to enable them to do that. So that that was a that was a win. Um, and then our current batch of interns, uh, who started uh, the beginning of this fiscal year, so September September one, um, they've only worked remotely, um, and that's that's continued being a success for us. Um, the next thing, obviously. Uh, I'll hit on is um, obviously Texas has had um, a pretty active uh, hurricane season. So uh, the Texas coast has been affected by four storms so far this this season: Hurricane Hannah in July, Laura in August, and uh, Tropical Storm Beta in September and Delta in October. So combined, these storms have created significant flooding and erosion problems on the on the upper coast. Um, plus damaged structures and coastal projects and, and have caused debris to be scattered all along the public beach. So our team has built multiple tools to track the data collected by, by staff in the field. Uh, coastal Field Operations has been performing post-storm beach inspections and damage assessments, collecting data with mobile devices and the RTS collector app uh, related to damaged structures, abandoned and sunken vessels, damage to coastal, coastal leases and debris on the public beach. Um, so these data layers are then populating the, the mapping tools developed by our team in real time via the Esri Cloud and our ArcGIS Online account. Um, okay, this one's not coming. Okay, there it goes. So this, these are... Um, handy photo viewers that that our team has built uh, related to each each storm and so staff can quickly pull up the points that they've collected and view the the photos uh, associated with those 
with those points, showing debris or damaged structures, what have you. Um, and then the data is also pushed to our, our internal storm viewer, state operations response mapper, which has all of the assets managed by our agency, um, equipment, personnel, field offices, along with the, the data that, that field, field staff are collecting in the field. Um, currently, we have this uh, area of approx uh, approximate area of debris removal we've just put together and added to the viewer um, to show uh, our field operations which debris points they need to instruct contractors to, to clear, um, indicating that they're on the public beach as opposed to private property. You can see the, the kind of data collected there. Um, okay. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to, and I'm gonna kind of move kind of fast because I know we're limited on time. Um, we are continuing to, this started pre-pandemic and we're continuing to work on this. This is the current, if you go to commissionerbushmaps.com, you'll see this current version of the energy map of Texas. Um, this was published in 2015. Uh, it's somewhat dated now. And so we're working on a revised version for 2020, showing all of the, including all of the changes that uh, have occurred since 2015 for the last five years. Um, as I said, this is a project that began late last year. Um, and uh, so it consists of a, of a static map that, that you can zoom in on. And also this will be available. This one is currently uh, available for purchase through our map store. So if you go to the GLO website and then history, you can find the map store there and you can purchase reproductions, prints of, of historical maps, as well as new maps that we've produced, uh, including this one from 2015. And then the, the, one from, the, the new one from 2020 will be available soon. And this hasn't been released yet, the 2020 version. It's, it's currently under review and we hope to get that out soon. But we've updated the oil and gas wells by permit date, railroad commission interstate pipelines, wind farm locations. Um, we've added new information on carbon capture and CO2 pipelines, um, electrical uh, utilities and power plants, wind and solar farms. Um, you can, here you can see, it's a lot you can delve there's a lot of information contained in the story map, um, and you can you can go to all of these historic events, uh, click there, it zooms in on the map, and you'll be able to read about uh, that event that took place at that date. Um, a lot of his new historical uh, dates and information have been added here. As I said, we've got wind and solar information. Um, submerged state lands, very large crude carriers, lots of information here. You can spend hours on this, on this map. Um, the next thing I'll touch on uh, quickly is um, something we're doing for our oil spill prevention and response program, uh, the, the Tarval uh, data collection effort. Um, this is used by field staff to collect Tarval locations along the beach using the collector app. Um, so we're working with oil spill staff. We've developed a workflow, compiled the data schema, and created a web app for field inspectors to collect location and attribute information on tarball locations. Um, we've collabor collaborated with staff in Austin, as well as from the, the five oil spill regional offices along the coast, again, using Teams um, to work through the methodology and tweak the data and web application for their purposes. So very handy way to, again, like the coastal data, like the, the, the coastal field ops data, debris and, and such, um, very useful way to uh, collect and provide um, damage, this type of damage data, in, in this case, uh, tar balls related to, to spills, um, to staff in the office, to management, to make decisions, you know, make better decisions. Um, uh, 
I'll, I'll go on to, I meant to have a uh, tech set up. Let me grab that real quick. So another, another project that we're working on is, um, is a, an addition to the, the TechSED project, or Texas, uh, uh, Texas Sediment Resources Geodatabase and Mapping Viewer. Um, we've had up for several years, um, which shows um, core and jet probe samples, uh, sediment cores all up and down the coast. So we're working on a pilot project for TechSed 3D, uh, 3D mapping project. Um, and so interns are, are uh, assisting with, with that uh, mapping project. It's, it's the goal is to interpret from each sediment coring sample, log the thickness of beach quality sand, um, as well as gravel and fine materials, the Z value together with its X and Y coordinates to generate the surface and contours as a guide for sand resource extraction um, for projects all along the coast. Uh, the pilot project is, is focusing just on one small area right now, and then we'll be expanding that out for the, for the rest of the coast. See, we're getting short on time, so I'll move on um, to another important project. Uh, oh, there was text said. Oh, and that's our remote editing app. Um, that we're, we're, we've enabled interns to use to help uh, work on mapping miscellaneous easements, uh, surface leases, uh, and state rail property um, polygons. The state rail property uh, project is, is uh, using Esri's operations dashboard technology to track productivity on the GLO state rail property program. Um, maps are created from this data set and used in reports on various properties and then submitted to the governor. Um, and as I said, interns are correcting polygons using the statewide Tenris land parcels data set as a base map, as well as the Texas Parks and Wildlife state map and uh, WMA boundaries uh, data set when needed to align the state rural properties with those boundaries. So thank you to Tenris and uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Then um, another important uh, project that we're continuing is the Texas Colonial Waterbird Rookeries Mapping. Um, this is needed for the oil spill toolkit, for coastal leasing operations, and for updating our data-driven resource management codes information. Um, in partnership with other agencies, creating, we're creating a new updated layer of waterfowl nesting sites on the coast based on a combination of historical rookeries data, waterbird census data by the Texas Colonial Waterbird Society, uh, and, and the most current aerial imagery and LIDAR data. So it's important to know where the nesting waterfowl are to, to help protect those, those habitats. Uh, so based on our previous effort of rookery mapping and the Texas Col Colonial Waterbird Society's annual census database, we've compiled and, ma and mapped more than 600 rookeries throughout the coastal region of Texas in support of natural resource management on public lands, oil spill prevention and response operations, and wildlife habitat protection and restoration. And then another thing I'd like to mention as far as collaborating, um, we worked with the TABC to provide a little map. It's, it's a, simple, a simple map, but um, it's effective and it, it, uh, it highlights what they wanted to show. They, so we built this in ArcGIS Online in our account and then um, enabled them to edit the data and, and then they embedded it on their web page showing, showing the counties in Texas where bars can reopen. So that's just an example of a, a, of a uh, collaborative effort um, between agencies. So if you have a map of bars that you uh, that are in, able to open and that you'd like us to produce for you, uh, let us know. Um, okay, probably not a map of that, but anything you'd like to collaborate on, let us know. 
Um, I'm kind of running up against the clock, so I'll stop there. I've got a lot of other um, projects I could mention, but um, as you can see, we, we've, like Richard said, we, I think we've been as productive or more productive um, with everyone working from home. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we hope to keep that up. The, the last thing I'll mention is um, the, uh, uh, an effort that we're, we're gonna be hiring Esri to do for us, which is an enterprise GIS architecture review. Um, that involves um, them, them performing a, an architecture health check uh, on our entire enterprise GIS setup and then um, providing us with the uh, solution architecture planning. So uh, we, we think we do a pretty good job with our enterprise GIS, but there's always lots of room for improvement and we want the experts to, to uh, come in and tell us, um, look at our servers, our licenses, anything else that we can improve on. Um, that's, what we, that's why we're doing that. And I'll wrap up there. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to Richard and Felicia and everybody at Tenris. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Uh, that is some excellent cartography uh, and visualization. So congratulations to you guys for getting all that done. So um, I thank you. And I'm now going to turn it over to Lorenzo. Take it away, Lorenzo. Oh, uh, I know, uh, Scott, there is a question for you about the internship program, and I will forward that on to you. Lorenzo, go ahead and turn on your uh, microphone. Thanks, Alicia and Scott. Uh, that was a, a great last slide. Very important information there that you conveyed to all of us out here. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Garza, and Matt Brown and Larry Elliott will be joining me uh, today. Uh, uh, they work for me in my ARC GIS mapping department, and we're going to discuss a little bit about what is currently going on at the commission, what our future plans are, and how one can access some of our information. So I'll go ahead and jump into it because I know we, we, we're under a time constraint here. So to kind of give you a, a current uh, status, we're currently using ArcMap 10.6. And I know a lot of folks are using Pro now, but for the commission, this was a, a very great leap in technology for the commission. Uh, we had been using an enterprise system that was over 15 years old based on ARC 3.2. Uh, and so it was no longer being supported. And knowing that ARC 10.6 was, uh, was soon to go away, uh, it was still deemed necessary to move into this as opposed to ARC Pro just because of our data situation. It was gonna be easier to get it into this format then making the leap to ARC Pro from here would be a lot easier. So that's where we are now and we're very happy. Uh, these are all uh, desktop software packages that are loaded up onto our folks' uh, PC. So this gives us a lot more flexibility uh, and, and, do, and be able to do what we're, what we're required to do regulatory wise. Uh, folks are really using our public GIS viewer. We get thousands of hits a month on this viewer. Uh, the last major upgrade we made to this was in March of 2020, and that was to include some new tools that Matt may have a chance to go over here when he speaks. Uh, we offer a lot of data on our viewer, and most of that data is updated nightly. So that's a very positive for our regulatory uh, folks uh, who are using this information as well as to the public, because they get to see real time what's going on in their area. Uh, a lot of the layers that you see invisible on our viewer are created and maintained by individual units within the commission. Uh, so again, as they go in there and refine those layers, update and maintain those layers, and post that to our mother SDE file, then that stuff gets migrated to that viewer in an overnight process. And uh, Matt's gonna go over and, and show you some more of the different layers that are available uh, to folks uh, when they're using this particular viewer. 
in the future, you know, again, as I mentioned, we're, we're hoping to, to move to ArcGIS Pro. Uh, the commission is currently going in and updating our data, the databases. Uh, we're changing uh, our database software, uh, going to uh, more advanced software, so it's going to make that transition a little easier. Uh, we're, uh, we're undertaking uh, a capital project right now, which is uh, very important for the commission in that we're creating a data warehouse. And so this data warehouse would be able to house all the data that the commission currently has, and that's going to include our geospatial data. So uh, Matt's going to go over how we can get some of these data sets. Well, with this data warehouse, folks can go and pick and choose the data that they want to utilize for themselves and not have to rely just on these data sets. So that's very important because it's going to give our, our users uh, more flexibility, internal and external, folks who use our information to do research, to make plans, to make investment decisions. So this is going to be uh, very exciting times here at the commission as we uh, undertake the that long path of uh, exiting the mainframe environment to get into a more uh, robust and flexible uh, data infrastructure. Uh, and what I also wanted to provide here are for folks who are using our public viewer and, and have a question as to those different layers and how we uh, get them in there, uh, where the information is pulled from, uh, there is a link here that you can use to pull up our data source table. So this will explain exactly where that information is coming from and how we incorporate it into that public viewer. And there at the bottom of that uh, slide, you'll see the, the link on our website that you can find that information. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Matt next here and he's gonna take, take it from here. Thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo gave a good background, and we we maintain in our uh, in our department we maintain uh, the GIS Public Viewer, and what we do is we spend uh, an enormous amount of time continuing a process that started years ago, um, where we've we've brought over a lot of the maps and the well information including surveys and we've been we've been processing an enormous amount of data over the years and as far as our public GIS viewer it's it's very easy to get to if you if you type in uh, in your search engine uh, the Railroad Commission uh, first thing that'll that'll come up is is uh, a typical typical view of of how to how to go into the Railroad Commission website with some some frequently visited links and the public GIS viewer will show up there. Uh, also, if you if you go into the main page, uh, there is some frequently visited links on that page, and the public GIS viewer will will be accessible there as well. So when you click on the public GIS viewer uh, link, this is the first uh, page that you'll get to. And down at the bottom, you can see where it says launch public GIS viewer. So you would click on that and this page will pop up. And, and then here you've got a lot of choices. Uh, on the left-hand side is a visibility uh, menu, and you can turn some some different uh, layers on and off, um, and that gives you a chance to to customize your view. Um, and you know, if you wanted to turn on surveys, you could you could turn that on, turn off all the wells. This is uh, zoomed out, so uh, but this is what it looks like, you know, on the zoom out view. As far as data sets, uh, if you go into the main page and click on About Us, it'll uh, it'll give this drop-down menu, and and then there is a resource center at the bottom. And if you click on that, it pops up this window here. And in the lower right-hand corner is is a section called Research, and you can pull up pull up all the data sets that we offer. So 
at this point, you would, if you wanted to pull down one of these and, and download it, um, in particular, I show, I'm showing the uh, section that has the surveys. So you would basically click on the, in this, in this case, the ArcView shapefile for say, let's say surveys. And then that would bring up this window here, which shows a folder with basically, but basically all the counties <clears throat> in this case, and then you would you would download download your individual uh, zip file, and then and then take it from there to upload it to your your uh, viewing software. I'm going to hand it over to Larry. Larry's going to talk about maintenance. Are you okay? Yep, we hear you. Okay, good. Um, I'm Larry Elliott, um, <clears throat> associated with the Well Mapping GIS program there at the Commission. Um, to follow up a little bit on our layer of maintenance, uh, what we are bread and butter, so to speak, as far as maintaining the, uh, the survey layer, the grid layer. Uh, sometimes I'm calling it a parcel layer. Uh, we just call it uh, simply our survey layer. Um, it, uh, our section consists of uh, two groups of people. We've got the, the base, main, base map maintenance folk, which is what I'm a part of. And also, we also have another group. Uh, there are API research group in that um, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of about one and three, four, one and three quarter million spots out there that are representing wells fall across the state. And um, those wells, those spots are identified through what is known as an API number. Some of you may know what those are. It's an American Petroleum Institute. Uh, that is a number that's officially assigned by the commission as sort of a unique identifier so that we can navigate to locate and, and uh, identify these particular well spots. Now, not every well spot out there has an API number, and that's what our API research group is in the process of doing and have been for quite some time and probably will for the foreseeable future, long term, that is. Um, that it's a special niche line of work to go through our old records that we have, uh, microfilm, microfish records to uh, go back and assign lease and API numbers for our old well spots that are sorely in need of being updated. Um, but back to the uh, back to the base maintenance section that I'm part of, um, we uh, the system updates every night with any edits that we perform. Uh, we need to go in and, and uh, perform some edits, reconstruct, uh, add, modify, and uh, add attribute information to a pretty given survey. Then that's that's what our job is. Um, normally. We receive notices of, hey, there's a problem with your survey layer. Usually it comes in to us uh, from our drilling permits department. Uh, normally what happens is an operator will file a permit to drill, which will have an associated plan. And during the uh, approval process, that plan is reviewed uh, placement. Uh, relative to the survey lines and coordinate information is compared to what our system is showing. And uh, the uh, placement for, compares to the commission placement matches up, then everything's good to go. And they'll be uh, stamped approved and moved on down the line. Uh, there are problems. Now, something survey construction is all for the coordinates points is now matching up, then um, that situation is forwarded to our little group and we'll take a look at it and um, go through a, um, a process where we um, resolve it. Can you move to the next slide, Matt? Please, sir. There you go. Um, so we've got a little process that we have to go through. This is pretty, um, you know, to have as accurate of a um, OTLS or the original Texas Land Survey System representation as we can develop. Uh, we go through a pretty, fine comb detail review process to see what needs to be done, if anything at all needs to be done. 
uh, we'll review, um, well, first off, we'll go back and look at it. It's quite possible that edits will perform in this given area some, you know, some time in the past. I've been doing this for quite some time now. And um, we don't want to go in and perform edits to an area that's already been edited quite some time ago. So we have a little warehouse, <coughs> pardon me, that uh, maintains all the previous edits along with the uh, supporting documentation and, and why a certain area is uh, structured the way it currently is. So we'll take that information and we'll also contact, reach out, and look for other sources of information, uh, survey or plans that are provided to us through all of our well spots. Uh, we'll also utilize the GLO records, uh, archives and records section that they have, looking at the original field notes uh, that they have online, their, um, their working sketches, their role sketches that they have. We pull that data down, and the GLO done a really good job with putting some of their maps up and where you can go in and take a look at some of those work, working and role sketches. From time to time, we have to go visit with the county, take a look at the, um, the appraisal district. Usually, most or some counties have a, uh, a good parcel data layer setting out there that we can go in and visit with the, the uh, staff at the county to get an idea of uh, you know construction and uh, what their take on it is, and, and discuss any discrepancies that we might have. Um, and another source and just surveyors themselves from across the state. Um, <clears throat> know quite a few of them. And if uh, we have sort of a little network system, if they have a problem or if we have a problem, uh, we, we uh, converse with one another to figure out what's, you know, what's going on with the picture survey or subdivision that's, uh, you know, whatever part of Texas we're in. Then uh, once all that information is pulled in and uh, we go through an analysis process to determine, well, this is, um, uh, there are several different representations of how a survey grid structure may look. Um, yeah, pardon me. Uh, we can look at the, uh, the uh, accepted or recognized survey line placement. There's going to be the, um, the technical or legally referred to version that, um, that we have to compare between the two. Uh, we're not the judge and jury by any means, but we have to go through and compare and see what is going to be our final process or our final construction for a given survey or subdivision in an area. Um, with the um, with an area the size of Texas, we've got mistakes and edits that need to be made out there. I'll be the first one to stand up and say that. And that's what our little group does, is we go through and, and uh, enhance and reconstruct areas that need based on uh, these little problem areas as they're presented to us. Um, once we go through and review these problems, we'll review the notes and make our comparison, then it may be we need to go through um, perform the edits, reconstruct a survey based on uh, uh, some new information that we've ever known about. The surveyors discovered uh, monuments out there that we here before we've never known about. So we'll <clears throat> reconstruct based on that. Um, we've got well spots. Aerial photography has come in real handy in helping us locate what I call well scars out there where surfaces uh, indicate the uh, location of a well spot that uh, we can use to help us uh, further refine our survey construction. And then once all that's done, if we need to move ahead and do a modifying area, we'll do that. And once we've completed the edits and posted, then it goes through, uh, we go through a QC as one of my fundamental rules is that once somebody performs an edit, that uh, it is reviewed by another person on our staff. Uh, make sure I like to see the more eyes is have a chance to look an area over, uh, the more thoroughly it can be reviewed and much more comfortable in coming out with or the, the end result of the survey construction or subdivision in that given area. Uh, once that's done, then it goes through uh, the second QC step is it's posted to uh, <clears throat> what we call our QC layer. 
which is goes up into the the load before it goes into our SCE. And once it goes through the various QC steps, and then then we load to this. <clears throat> pardon me, we load through to the SCE, which is what the GIS viewer is tied into. Uh, whatever updates occur today that we make with the survey subdivision and well locations, um, once they're posted to the SCE, then the SCE will will turn over that night, and those edits will show up on the viewer the next day. Um, once the edits are done, we're finished, then um, you know, to make sure that we document those edits and support what we did and why we did it, uh, we have a ever-growing archive of uh, problem or resolution reports, if you will. Yes, ma'am, I see you on there. I'm revving up. <laughs> um, and it, then uh, we, we uh, archive that and house it in, in, in a separate standalone uh, filing system so that uh, when the situation develops in the future, you know, whether it's through us or the next generation of GIS folks at the commission need to come back and look at an area to see, you know, why we did what we did. So um, <clears throat> Uh, that pretty well wraps up whatever I've got to say. So if there are any questions or comments, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we're willing to discuss or uh, go over you know, other avenues that we pursue, data sources that we use and come up with. Uh, we'll be happy to discuss any items with anybody. So with that, we'll conclude and turn it back over. Thanks, Larry, and thank you, Lorenzo and Matt. I uh, really appreciate uh, This is really exciting to see the Railroad Commission uh, and their modernization project, and uh, you guys are doing a lot of work over there. There are a couple of questions in the question box, and um, as panelists, you'll be able to see them. So if uh, you or Lorenzo or Matt could uh, respond to those uh, and then just send it out to everyone, that'll be great. So thank Sounds you again. Good. Sounds appreciate good. It. Okay, thank you. So Benny, thank you. So Benny, you are up next and um, I will let you take it away. Right, can you see my screen? Should be shared. Hello? Yeah, yes, we, we see it. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh -huh. Just a second. Get my huge. All right. Um, good morning, everybody. And once again, thank you. Uh, thank you to the audience for letting us uh, listening to us. And thanks a million to Tenris, uh, Felicia, Richard, the whole Tenris staff, and always making it a pleasure to work with you guys. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk a little about uh, synthetic aperture radar and how we can use it for flood damage assessments. Um, we're going to focus in on Hurricane Harvey as a case study simply because Harvey was the single largest uh, uh, disaster we've had through hurricanes in the state of Texas, uh, the most costly one. And because of that, there's a, just a ton of data out there. And so whatever we do, if we're developing models and stuff, it's great to have uh, data out there that we can use. So I'm going to... Uh, cover kind of a little bit about what um, SAR is and how it works, uh, talk about how we've used data and stream gauge data, um, integrated it with some of the SAR processing and then other data sets to really assess what might be happening um, when there's an event. Uh, Tessellations, real quick, we're a GI services company based in Houston, but have done projects around the world. Um, we are Pretty much an Esri shop, uh, the full stack of Esri products from end to end, Silver partners with them. We're also partnered with SafeSoft and Planet. Um, and the other thing we do do a lot of, which might be of value to the Railroad Commission, is um, we've got a bunch of free videos on our website if you want to go check it out. And these free videos are actually very specifically targeted to short two to five minute videos for ArcGIS Pro, which sounded like that was a pain point. Um, we are an ISO 9001 certified company. Okay, having said that, let's go ahead and hop into SAR. Really, what is um, what is SAR? It's it's a radar. Um, it's a radio detection ranging uh, system. Essentially, uh, it, you know, launch it on satellites, 
get data back. And in this case, the SAR is actually um, the radar sensor. It's an active sensor, which means it emits its own energy, throws it out, collects the data uh, from, from that whatever comes back as opposed to our standard optical systems, which generally are passive systems. They don't emit any energy of their own. They're just passively listening and looking at reflectances coming back from objects. Hence, the difference between the two allows the SAR to collect data at night. Because it's emitting its own energy, it can continue collecting data at night, whereas reflectance, optical images, night is dark, objects aren't reflecting anything, you're gonna see nice black, gray images, right? Um, so, uh, pros about the SAR is you can collect day or night. Um, the other pro about a SAR image is it penetrates clouds. Uh, the wavelength it uses is a much longer wavelength than the optical visible spectrum and the electromagnetic spectrum. And this longer wavelength lets you penetrate clouds and smoke, uh, which optical images, of course, can't. Um, the cons are, there's a couple cons. One is, you know, it's hard to interpret. It's it's kind of a, it gives you an image. Here's a low res one and here's a high res one example. And this is an optical image of the same area. Um, it gives you kind of a panchromatic image, but it's not quite uh, a panchromatic image. So there's some, some learning curves associated with processing SAR imagery. Um, and the other con is, is limited availability. We have lots of, uh, optical sensors out there, we can pretty much get anything anywhere, anytime we want. Um, SAR is not quite there yet. Um, here's another example of some of the challenges or advantages. You know, here's an image from an optical cloud covered area. Uh, SAR will actually penetrate and give you this panchromatic looking image. Um, it is a side looking sensor and so there's some, some geometric issues with processing that data. Um, the exciting thing is this little guy here. Um, I'm hoping, hang on, you should be able to see my cursor now. So this little guy here, what this is, is it's a microsatellite and it's the, you know, it's a tiny little cube. Before we used to put um, satellites up, you know, one rocket, one satellite uh, payload, and then it, it, it releases a satellite. Well, now we've got these microsatellites and what's happening is one rocket, cluster of satellites go up and they release these satellites as a cluster and so you're getting an immediate constellation. Um, these sat microsatellites tend to be a lot lower in orbit which means generally means higher resolution data can be collected and because they can put a cluster out you can actually get much wider coverage because there's many of them sensing at the same time as opposed to one at a time. Um, this this advent of these microsatellites is changing um, at least the SAR space quite significantly. If you look here, we've currently got nine satellites. Um, in about eight years or so, we'll more than double that to 22 satellites and pass that eight year mark. Look at that mushrooming of satellite images. Um, on this lineup that we have right now, they're at the top two are actually microsatellites and they are, um, they're not quite at this revisit time yet. They're currently, you know, putting satellites out on a regular basis. So they're, you know, they claim they'll get here in a year or two, but we'll have to wait and see. But definitely, limited availability of imagery is going to go away. Okay, and now stepping into um, Harvey. Um, all of us know um, Harvey kind of landfalled around Rockport, and then it decided to just kind of hang out and slowly work its way northeast up the coast of Texas. And for a little while, it went back into the Gulf and back onto the land. Um, uh, and having hugged the coast so closely, it picked up a lot of moisture from the Gulf. Um, Houston was in the dirty side of the, uh, the, the hurricane. And there were parts of Houston that got 40 inches of rain um, in four days. That's a lot of rain. And so, of course, flooding was a problem. So we wanted to process SAR imagery and say, hey, can we actually process this stuff and get close to what way we actually saw the waters? Well, in order to do that, we had to identify where and how we're gonna process this imagery. So one of the first things we did was we got, went to USGS, open, you know, open data. Um, they currently have a national um, feed of every single USGS gauge every 15 minutes. So we went backwards in history and grabbed July, August, and September of 2017, and then tried to identify, you know, where is this water coming around the Houston area? 
So here's a quick timestamp of what the water gauges are doing. And what we also did for these water gauge levels is we normalized it to the month of July. So we took all of July's reading, got the mean uh, heights of these water gauges, and then said, okay, for the hurricane event, which ones are popping above, uh, you know, and how high are they compared to normal? So Monday, everything looks kind of decent. Tuesday, something's happening. Rain is definitely reached. We've got a lot of gauges kind of going high very quickly. And I do want you to focus in on this little pocket here. You'll notice that these reds, you know, pop up very quickly early. And as we go through each day, you know, some of the gauges, some of the water is going back down. But this area seems to consistently stay red. Um, there's that area and there's a few others. So we've studied several areas around Houston. Uh, but you notice this little part stays wet all the way to September 1st, right? So that's a lot of rain. And the reason that happened is we've got two reservoirs here. Initially, the gates were closed. So these guys upstream of the reservoir flooded and then they opened the floodgates and, you know, the bayous south downstream of the reservoirs uh, stayed high for a while. The other thing we also wanted to do is, you know, when these stream gauges are going up and down, can we look at radar and can we look at process the radar data to find those pockets of high, high water, you know, where's the high water coming down? And so we we did it for several timestamps in different areas, and we've kind of come up with a process that generates these blue polygons for us. So this blue polygon is essentially the area of interest at a given time. Um, so once we've identified that, we take that polygon. So we're calling this, you know, derive areas of interest of high, high risk based on stream and radar. So based on some real metrics, and take that and process the SAR imagery in those pockets to see what's going on. Um, and ideally, this is this can happen while the event is going on because SAR imagery will continue to collect data while it's raining, even though it's cloudy. So we can process while the event is going on. Uh, we take these these areas of interest into Google Earth Engine, which is essentially just a large computing uh, framework for computing for large data sets. Um, as a part of their environment, they have several imagery um, sources in there, and one of them was the Sentinel-1 SAR imagery. So we basically use Google Earth Engine to take our areas of interest, process it using some of the imagery that's already there, and it is mind-boggling you can process areas within seconds of, of pro, you know, once you've got your model set up to run it, it takes literally under a minute. Um, so it's, it's pretty exciting environment. Um, just to show you some examples of what we're getting back, um, here's just a, an area around Kingwood. Here's another optical image of it after the floods, but recognize that this image was taken after the clouds had cleared. So you're actually seeing after the event picture. So some of the water has already receded. And this is our blue areas are kind of the flooded areas we're getting out of our SAR model um, that shows where we think the water was at a given time. Uh, we also looked at some of the you know, areas, these, these rust color areas were all impacted neighborhoods. And so we looked at some of that um, to pull out what we thought we were seeing. Here's another example when the floodgates opened, some of those bayous downstream of those reservoirs, a lot of those areas were flooding pretty heavily. Okay, so now in theory, we've defined where the water is, right? Once we've got this SAR image processed, well, um, you know, on its own, it's not worth a whole lot. You know, where do we need help and how do we get those resources out there quickly? So this next piece takes this process data and puts it on top of uh, data sources that all of us have access to it from different sources. Uh, so we took building data and we took demographic data and we normalized the demographic data to each structure. So we turned around and said, okay, we know what a given block group's population is you know, what, how many houses here and what, what's the estimated population per structure. And then we extracted out, you know, all the structures that are flooded. And we end up with this, this picture. And this picture essentially says, all the reds and oranges are some of the higher impact areas within this little polygon that we've derived and processed. And this is based on two things. One is how many structures, are potentially wet, 
and how many people are potentially in these areas. Um, so looking up closer, here's, um, you know, I'm going to kind of zoom in to this guy here because it's a nice looking high area. So if you look at the shaded kind of blue behind the block group, and we've also got some other, you know, there's a school within that area. If it was a shelter, you might want to rethink that, or it could become a shelter for this people. Um, there is a, a urgent care close by, so that could be a valuable information. But really, what we then did is, you know, we want to see how many structures in this block group and how many people are impacted. So after all our processing, we're saying, you know, there's about 233 uh, structures that are impacted, of which 145 are completely, uh, probably completely underwater. And this amounts to about 400 people. So, and then the other thing we've also done is we went through and pulled out some of the emergency information that's out there. So when you click on this block group, it gives you all the contact names and numbers of police, fire, EMS, whatever, you know, they're, they're in there. Um, and this is set up such that we can plug and play any data. Um, you know, the data we used was uh, kind of, we used a bunch of a combination of uh, public domain stuff as well as ESRI and Precisely data. But really, the data doesn't matter. It should be whatever, you know, whatever data is available for a given agency. So on our next steps, what we'd like to do is, you know, there's a lot of, um, we've automated the process in different platforms, but we need to integrate. We need to do handshakes between the technologies we're using, um, you know, to pass some of this data into from one technology tech set to another one and bring it back. Uh, we want to utilize, move everything into the cloud and develop a mobile app. So now that you have a mobile app on your hands, what you could do is have someone just draw a polygon. Uh, based on what we found from SAR, we can quickly do a metrics back to them saying, the area you're looking at, you know, there's 50 buildings, 20 are flooded, and probably impacting 200 people, or whatever it is, you know, whatever the number ends up being. Um, once again, the data can be whatever, but we are looking at national data sets here, but every local agency, county and state has their own higher grade data. So we could, we're we designing it such that it's plug and play, it should be no big deal. Uh, we'd also, we're also currently working on you know, depth, uh, determine the flood water depth, and uh, we'll hopefully get there with that real soon. So really, what I'd like to do is, you know, have people tell me, is this something of value? Who needs to see, you know, who would find value in this? And are there any missing components? Would it be kind of neat to have one other thing in there? Um, recognizing that this actually can be done during a flood event. Uh, it's not real time, but it's near real time. So I will kind of open it up. I'm not seeing a whole lot of questions yet, but let me get out of my pointer mode. Hey, Benny, this is uh, Richard Wade. First of all, <clears throat> very fascinating. Um, realistically, SAR is probably one of the least understood data uh, products, at least for me personally. Um, can you describe just a little bit about what you found to be the accuracy? You know, you had you had a couple of slides where you show where the water was and then where it was predicted on SAR. Were you able to do a, a pretty good analysis of how it measured up to reality? Yeah, so what, you know, this is one of the things I'm kind of hoping someone in the audience pipes up. So we've tried to get actual inundation data. Um, I've written to a couple of people at USGS. I'm waiting to hear back from them. Um, NASA's run some models. We've compared our model to their models and they get close. But, you know, that timing is very important. What day and what time was that process, data processed? Um, what we would love is I know people like the flood control districts, right, have actual inundation data, we haven't managed to get our hands on it. We'd love to compare to ground truth. And that's kind of the next step. You know, we've got this model, and actually, the, Richard, the model is actually not predicting. All mm -hmm. it's saying is, process this image right now and tell me where the water is. I'm not predicting where it's gonna be in a minute. I'm predicting it for that timestamp, for that, for that image that when it was captured. Right, so it's it's not predictive, it is actually descriptive, but the descriptive still has, you know, there's a lot of things we do to process that SAR. We'd like to validate that against real data. Mm -hmm. And 
one of the reasons we picked Harvey is we're kind of hoping there's real data out there and can we get our hands on it. Um, so if there's anyone in the audience that can help me get my hands on some of that data, that would be exciting, right? Because then we can validate what we're doing. Yeah, and if there's anybody in the audience that wants to speak up, feel free to go ahead and unmute your mic and, and uh, announce your name and, and any question or any suggestion you may have. I'm assuming we can do that. I said that, but I'm not sure we can even do that. <laughs> I'm perusing the questions right now. So uh, while that's happening, Benny, um, first of all, again, thank you for that. But you know, from from um, the water board's perspective and the fact that we are highly embedded into doing a lot of things relating to flood, I think I would like to have a, a sidebar conversation with you after afterwards sure. to maybe talk a little bit about how uh, SAR can be implemented and some of the things we are trying to do um, a, a, from a flood perspective. So uh, um, yeah, I, I will definitely reach out to you after this. Great, great. Um, that would be great. And you know, if uh, anyone in the audience has thoughts, I would love to hear from yeah, you, so please um, call us. So if, if you have a question, you for us to unmute you, you're going to have to raise your hand uh, if you want to ask a question to Benny. Okay. Well, people Benny, are hungry, I think. I think. You did a you did a good <laughs> job explaining it all. All right. Well, hey, Benny, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, and I want to thank uh, uh, Lorenzo, Matt, Larry, and Scott um, for for their participation in this session. Um, this is really good stuff, and y'all been amazing to stay on time uh, with all of this. So I hope you can join us back. We're going to take an hour and a half uh, break, uh, and I think we're coming back about 1:30, and we're going to do 1:30 sharp. So swing on back when you can. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. I think we're just going to keep this meeting active, right? Is that right, Joey? And uh, we're going to just kind of keep it going and just join back up at 1.30. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. We'll see you back in an hour and a half. Okay. I think we are all right at our starting point at 1.30. I hope everybody had a uh, great lunch. Normally we would provide it to you if we were at the forum, but I hope you had something to eat at your house. Um, anyway, we're gonna try to stay on schedule. We've been doing great so far, and uh, we're just gonna jump right into the next presentation. We're on our session, our third session. And so this time we're going to, I would like to introduce uh, Chris Cherney with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, title of his presentation is My Texas Hunt Harvest Application. So Chris, if you're ready, we're gonna turn it over to you. All righty. Thanks very much, Richard. Of course. Just a second. Okay. Uh, Richard, could you confirm you're seeing this presentation screen? I am. It looks great. Okay. Excellent. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Cerny, and I'm with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, my official title is business analyst, and so that's my first disclaimer of this talk, is to share that I am not a GIS specialist. But I know some. I know some very talented specialists, and really, I'm here to share uh, a project that I've collaborated with with several specialists, uh, including a mobile app developer, uh, specifically to deliver mobile maps to our public hunters for use in the field. And so, um, this has been a really fun project to work on. And I wanted to start with this screen, and before we dive in, just explain that uh, you know it's always fun when you get to work on a project that you're personally invested in. And I actually am a public hunter myself. Long before I worked for Texas Parks and Wildlife, I was able to hit the field and gain access to public lands to go hunting. And so I, I know the the kind of, I guess, intimidation factor that comes with showing up to a spot you've never been to, to go hunting uh, and try to find your way around. And so it was fun to work on a project uh, to deliver a tool to our customers, our public hunters, to, to help them get out in the field and enjoy the activity we're seeing here. Uh, get your kids out, your family, your friends, and have fun in the field. So. With that, we'll dive in. Um, a little bit of context for this project. I wanna just give you a little bit of explanation about our public hunting program. Um, we have more than a million acres of access available for the public to go hunting around the state. And so all those stars that you see on the map are, are different public hunting opportunities around the state. Um, 
currently this season, there's 170 different sites. And so when somebody's going to go public hunting, uh, the first thing they have to do is figure out where they're going to go. And so the, the program has a long history of using GIS to benefit our customers, primarily historically to get folks to learn where it is that they're going to go. Um, and so the primary way that we accomplished that, at least historically, has been with the, a printed map booklet that we mail out. And so anybody who has ever been excited about getting a catalog in the mail, uh, this is that same thing. Your annual map booklet shows up and you open it up and there are more, more than 100 pages now of, of maps. And so all of those stars that we saw on the previous screen have a map printed. Um, and so you get this book in the mail and you start flipping through it and you get excited thinking about all the places that you might want to go hunt. And so the, the maps that we have printed here are, are clearly meant to be locational in nature. Uh, we're looking at specifically a, uh, uh-oh. Yeah, hey Chris, it looks like you might be sharing the wrong screen. Uh-oh, okay. Sorry guys. Well. I'm not doing this right. right. Bear with me. I thought I had this all set, guys. We're there. It is. What are you seeing? That's, well, I yeah. apologize. Yeah, we're seeing the map, the annual map book slide. Okay, good deal. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, here we go. Thanks for the heads up. So, anyways, you get your public map book in the mail, and, and you open it up, and, and here are all these. Uh, uh, you know, printed maps of, of all these different hunting opportunities around the state. And so uh, clearly these maps are designed to help you locate where it is that you can go hunting and what you can do once you're on site there. Uh, but obviously this isn't meant to take into the field with you, especially at a site like Granger Lake here that's more than 10,000 acres in size. This isn't meant to help you actually navigate it once you're in the field. Um, and so our, our staff has worked over the years. Oh, is it not advancing now? to provide additional tools to customers. Um, so uh, Nancy Hager, the GIS specialist who's responsible for creating and delivering all of these maps has worked to create an interactive web map uh, that should be shown on your screen, hopefully if I've got this working right. Uh, and so customers who have decided they wanna to go to a particular spot can then get online here with this interactive web map viewer uh, and start researching their area a little more. Um, so again, trying to get customers comfortable with where it is that they're going to go uh, so that when they get to the field, they're confident that they know where they're supposed to be and importantly, where they're not supposed to be. So, you know, the green boundary representing the hunt area boundary, these red dashes representing areas that you can't hunt. Um, this is a really phenomenal tool, but it's one that does require a web connection. It's also not something that lends itself to being able to be used for navigation in the field. Even if you do have web connectivity in the field, you're not going to see your location dot on here. Uh, but still a very good tool that, that's helped customers get comfortable with where it is they're trying to go hunting. So the, the project that we wanted to undertake is to just use these existing products that we had. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, Nancy does a phenomenal amount of work every year to deliver these maps for our hunters. We just wanted to package them up in, in a way that they could be used out in the field by our public hunters. Um, so keep this symbology in particular in mind with that, that concept in mind that we're just trying to repackage everything. And, and the last little bit about background is, so we've described, you know, finding where it is that you're going to go hunt uh, and then figuring out a little bit about the area you're going. The impetus for this project actually was spurred by a desire to modernize what you do once you're actually on site. So we ask all of our public hunters to uh, register once they're on, on premise. And so that tells us who's using the site. So how much utilization are we getting? And then what's the success rate? So a lot of those sites that we saw on the map, some are owned by the state, some are wildlife management areas that we operate and intensively manage, but many are actually owned by private landowners and we make a lease agreement and we pay them money uh, to provide access to that site. So they sign a lease agreement that they'll receive a certain amount of dollars in exchange, the land is opened up for public access. And so we certainly wanna be able to gauge um, how successful the customers are being on those properties and whether those properties, properties are being used at all. And so this on-site registration process is historically how we've, we've taken care of that or, or checked on that, that progress for these sites. And so this has been a paper-based manual process. Often when, for most of these sites, when you show up, there's an information station near the entrance gate and you'll find a board there with a, a box on it. And you fill out one of these paper forms, you drop it in the box. And then our staff are responsible 
for gathering up these forms and mailing them back to Austin headquarters where we have a data entry specialist who still manually punches these, these forms into a database for analysis. And so it's, it's a very manual and time consuming process. And so our public hunting program uh, a couple of years ago requested a project to modernize this process. And, and that was the impetus for this mobile map package process or, or project as well. So we have an existing app, a mobile app called My Texas Hunt Harvest that, as the name implies, has historically been used for uh, allowing hunters to check game harvest. So specifically for mandatory reporting of eastern turkey and white-tailed deer in several counties now. But we recognize that we could use this existing app uh, and add in additional functionality to allow hunters to perform on-site registration. And with that came an opportunity to provide additional service to our customers related to delivering those maps that we've already looked at that Nancy produces in a mobile platform, something that they could get on their phone and take with them into the field uh, so that regardless of whether they had cell or data service or not, they would have a tool with them to help them locate where they are on site and be confident that they're where they're supposed to be and that if they get a little turned around, which trust me, as somebody who has done that on several different spots, it's pretty easy to do, uh, that they can find their way back to the truck or off the property safely. Um, and so it was that desire to modernize the registration process that really gave us the ability to work on delivering these mobile maps as well. And so the map packages themselves are very straightforward. So EOSR stands for Electronic On-Site Registration, and we're using Esri's mobile map package or MMPK format. The, the map itself, the mobile map, consists of just four basic layers. The hunt area boundary, using that same symbology we saw from that interactive web map. A couple of the basic hunt area points about where are parking information, I'm sorry, parking locations and information station locations. Then a raster tile package, which is imagery of that hunt area, actually buffered out a quarter mile beyond the hunt area boundary um, using uh, imagery from Tenris uh, set to either a zoom level 15 or 16. Uh, depending on the size of the area, trying to be conscious about the size of the, the package that we're trying to ask a customer to download. And then underlying all that is a vector tile package, essentially of the county, the surrounding county, the roadmap, if you will. Um, and a really neat tile package that's responsive as you zoom in or out, we'll see here in just a second, to provide you know, more or less detail based on the, the zoom level that you're at, uh, so that we're not just taking over your phone too much, um, too much of your real estate. And so the way, so, so these map, mobile map packages are, are built, you know, uh, locally on your desktop GIS. And then what we do with them once the map packages have been produced is they're actually loaded to TPWD's ArcGIS online account. And so each of these map packages is given a unique URL. And so for this season, we have about 170 of these URLs. Um, those URLs are then stored in a table that's used in, in referenced by that application. And so the, the user interface of the mobile app then provides a link to, to review all the maps that are available and then click to download one. We show the users the size of the maps um, so that they're aware of what they're about to try to be asked to, to store on their phone. Our map packages range from as small as nine megabytes for some of the smaller hunt areas up to the largest being 250 meg. Uh, but that's really an outlier. I think the next closest in size as far as size goes is well under 200 meg. And our average is about 25 megs per mobile map package. So folks download that map package onto their phone. It's stored within the app. They just have to open up their, their My Texas Hunt Harvest app and go to the on-site registration portion, and they'll have the ability to access their maps, which will play a short screen share that I took just over this weekend. So you open your app, click on on-site registration, you view your maps. We just clicked on Granger Public Hunt Area, and we click to open the map. And so now we're looking at this. I, I took this screen share while I was out at Granger Public Hunting Area this past weekend. So that's my blue dot there, showing location services are working, showing the responsiveness of that vector tile package underneath. And as we zoom in here, you'll see I'm clearly near a no hunting area. So I do want to let folks know, no need to call the game warden. I was not hunting. I, I took my family out to the park there, to Wilson Fox Park. So we were just walking the shoreline. Uh, the one thing I should have done was turn my data off. You'll see on the screen capture that I have data on, but the beauty of this, this mobile map package is that it does not rely on data service. It, regardless of whether I had cell service or not, uh, my location services would have still shown exactly where I was since I had already downloaded the map and had it on my phone. Um, so a very simple product, but very, very handy in the field. Um, I've used this actually on a dove hunt already this season uh, for a spot I had never been to. It worked extremely well. 
Uh, and, and so again, as a public hunter, I can tell you that the confidence this gives our customers is phenomenal. And just one more quick share, uh, we are starting to branch out at least in a few areas. This is a coastal area WMA that primarily offers duck hunting opportunities. And so when customers arrive on site, uh, they are assigned a specific hunt location, which is what you're seeing marked out by these, these little duck icons. And they're labeled. And so what happens when you arrive at this WMA, Matt Island Wildlife Management Area to be exact, is you're ultimately assigned to one of these hunt compartments. And this is happening at you know five in the morning. So you're expected to make your way through this WMA in the dark, find your parking area, and then find your way out into the marsh where there's a T-post driven in the ground with a little reflective marker on it that's labeled. And so I, I've been there, I've done this at, at you know, oh, dark 30 in the morning. Uh, the intimidation factor is real. And so uh, a lot of our, our staff on site are saying that customers are just loving the access that this is providing them and, and helping them get out to their site and get hunting uh, without concern about getting lost. And so just to close out here, a, a little bit of information about success. So we've had these map packages available for two seasons now, um, last season and this year. And to date, we've had more than 17,000 distinct downloads of these maps. Um, the names of the individual hunt sites here aren't important, but these are the top 10 most downloaded maps. And really what I wanted to focus on and highlight is that these are popular across the state. Um, so we have a couple of examples of coastal WMAs that are being downloaded uh, quite a bit here. Uh, a complex around San Antonio for Dove access, uh, the Houston area, the Austin area, Dallas, Fort Worth, and all the way out to San Angelo in West Texas. So customers across the state are, are latching on to this, plat this platform and package uh, and really, I uh, think, enjoying it. And I, I believe it's providing a great service to our public hunters. Uh, and we really want them to get out in the field. And so uh, that's, a, that's it. That's a short presentation. So thank you for your time today. I do need to acknowledge a couple of folks. I mentioned Nancy Hager. Uh, she's responsible for all the boundary files and, and the map books that go out every year and maintaining all of this information about these public sites. Uh, Paul Doherty was the person who really put together the mobile maps. He, he developed every single one that we've got, over 200 at this point. Um, so a big thanks to Paul. And then Bob Stevens is the mobile app developer uh, who actually figured out how to implement this in our My Texas Hunt Harvest mobile app. And so with that, I'll turn it over. Yeah, Chris, uh, we, we got uh, about five more minutes and I have a, I have a question for you real fast. Um, are, are you, uh, so first of all, the maps, are they public lands that, that you have the images? Uh, in other words, the areas that you have up there that are available, are they on public lands or can a private citizen offer up their property to be on this site? Yeah, good question. So uh, th it's a combination, Richard. So there are, this is a public lands here. This is owned by the Corps of Engineers and we have an agreement with them to operate it as a wildlife management area. Um, our public hunting program does lease from private landowners. So uh, we would not randomly ask a private or we would never randomly publish or take a request from a private landowner to develop one of these and publish it unless they have a lease agreement with our public hunting program to offer public hunting access. And that is common. We have about 120 or so uh, sites, primarily small game for things like Dove, where we actually have a lease agreement where we pay that private landowner to provide public hunting access and opportunity. And in that case, yes, we do create a, a mobile map package for that private landowner uh, that shows the boundaries of their property and make sure that folks know where they're supposed to be on that property and where they're not supposed to be in terms of either no hunt areas or getting onto a neighbor's place. Okay, and and so um, how and and I saw what you had license. Yeah, I saw a button that said licenses. Um, are all licenses kept online now? Where you or do you still have to carry uh, proof of it with you, or can you show an app and then pull your license up in front of a warden, or you know those kinds of things? How 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 robust does that does that get? Yeah, we actually just had legislation passed this last session that allows uh, a customer to provide an electronic copy of their license, and so. Uh, this app, you actually can access your license. It shows your current license holdings. Um, to be on these public lands, I should have mentioned, you do have to buy an annual public hunting permit. It's $48 in addition to your hunting license, um, or there's a limited public use permit as well. But you have to have one of those two permits to legally be on these properties. Um, and so a game warden who came to check you in the field, you could open up your app. Uh, you could click on the licenses tab and show them your current holdings. They could check you right there and uh, you're good to go. Or you can always, of course, go with the traditional route of having your license in your pocket. And, and can you also pay for your licenses through the app itself? 
not through the app. There are links that will take you to our website where you can purchase licenses. So we will get you there, but no, we don't have the ability to pay for licenses through the My Texas Sun Harvest app. Okay. Okay. Very, very fascinating. That's it's kind of good to see things happening like this. So very, very um, interesting presentation. Appreciate that. Does anybody have? We still have about two or three minutes. Anybody have any other questions? I'm kind of perusing the list here. If anybody's curious, the app itself is built in the, the Xamarin Forms platform. Um, and, and I believe this is where I had to make the disclaimer, I'm not a GIS specialist or a programmer, but uh, Esri has a plugin of some sort that, that works within that mobile environment. And so uh, that's what we're using to deliver these mobile maps uh, to this app. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I think this might be, um, there's one question here uh, from Matt Highland. Um, I, I think it's similar to what I asked, but let me, I'm gonna read it out to you just in case. Um, has it been difficult to get hunters to adapt to a modern technology given that, and I'm sorry, Matt, your question actually cuts off here. Uh, given that modern technology, given that most are older, has it been difficult to get hunters to adapt to modern technology given that most uh, hunters are older? You know, surprisingly, no. And the reason I say that, um, we have gone with our public hunting program, knew that this could be a potentially difficult shift for some folks. Uh, you know, it's been decades that you've done paper on site registration. So we actually have a, a two year period, we're in the second year of those two years now, where you can still register on site using either the electronic version, uh, I'm sorry, using either the paper version or the new electronic registration process. So last year in our first season of voluntary use, uh, I believe it was two thirds, 66 or right around there percent of the registrations were completed through the app. So within the first year, the majority of our users had already shifted to the app. Um, you know, surprisingly, I think a lot of hunters, especially those folks who are, are accessing public lands are used to getting online and searching out their opportunities. Um, so I think that there's an interesting dynamic where these hunters actually may be fairly tech savvy and they appear to really be latching onto it uh, very it. quickly. Well, congratulations! What a great what a great application, and it's good to yeah. see it getting pulled into the 21st century. So, great job! Um, thank you, Chris, thank for you. for that. Thanks for putting um, up with the tech difficulties. I had that somebody had to do it today. <laughs> yeah, you did good. That's just part of it, I guess. Thank you, sir. Right. Do I need All to right. pass privileges to anybody, or yeah, let's see? Well, I guess uh, your colleague is probably next. Uh, Joanna Valenta, are you are you available? I am. Thanks, Chris. That was fantastic. I'm getting yeah, on video thanks. right now. All right. Oh, okay. Wonderful. All right. Let's get the right screen going. I believe you're seeing something. It probably says uh, Texas Cultivated Oyster Mariculture website. That's it. All right. it. All right. Well, then I'm going to shock you and change it over to a PowerPoint presentation. Can you see that one? Yes. Perfect. Great. All right. So I'm just going to get started here. Um, my name is Joanna Valente, and I am in also in Parks and Wildlife, like Chris, uh, but I'm in the Coastal Fisheries Division, um, and I actually mainly work in water resources. So I kind of consider myself a bit of a conservation biologist, but since I've been at Parks and Wildlife, um, I've spent quite a bit of time playing with applications. So if you've seen me before, that's the reason I feel like I'm, I tend to be that, that person now um, for our division and I enjoy it a lot. So um, opposite of Chris in that way, I'm going to kind of talk about this mariculture application from a uh, problem solution aspect in GIS. So I volunteered to present this project. Um, it was developed with a pretty quick timeline. I want to say a month, a month and a half. Um, it was part of the Texas Parks and Wildlife participation in House Bill 1300 which directed TPWD to develop a regulatory system for commercial production of oysters within the Texas coastal waters. Um, the objective, objective was simple enough. It was just to develop a virtual geospatial reference of the permitted and proposed oyster mariculture locations. So if an applicant um, you know, had submitted an application that lineup of, okay, is this application pending or is it permitted, where are we at? Um, we wanted the public to be able to see those. Uh, however, the complexity was identified in the audience because we wanted both TPWD staff and the public to utilize the application, but in different ways. 
So if you are probably in developer mode, I highly recommend doing some sort of review of operational requirements for an application. <laughs> Uh, and you, you hear all sorts of things when this happens, and I tend to get a list going, but this is actually from one of the lists we made early on, and my favorite is always the word intuitive. You hear it a lot with application development. Um, that means easy for the user, very complex for the person that's making the app, almost every time. So if you've had that experience, um, I feel your pain. Uh, so broken down, these were the operational requirements for the application. <clears throat> And now I'm just actually gonna transition over to the application itself so you can see what we came up with to hit these requirements. All right, so back to that screen. Is that correct, Richard? You can see that website? I can, yes. Perfect, okay. So um, this is kind of just the beginning website to the application and you can, if you wanna follow along with me live from home, if you will, uh, you can just use this um, just general website or do a really easy Google search, um, you know, Texas Oyster Mariculture. Um, and then you would come here to see that TextCom Sites Viewer and launch the application. And I already have it up, so I'm just gonna do that. Um, Welcome to the application. Uh, super simple <laughs> in, in just the general development in terms of being intuitive. You can see there's certain tabs set up here. I did those using the AGO story map template. Um, I also included here the permitted and pending tabs are going to be um, just general view layer, non-editable maps. And then finally, this interactive tab is one that allows applicants to screen for amiable mariculture locations. So I'll go into that. Um, I'm just gonna do a drive-by point, <laughs> just like click on that one to show you, you can get a, bit, a little bit of information about the permit here. One of my favorite parts of this is that with the story map is you can use these view maps and they'll reflect the same location um, as you interact with the map. So for example, I'm on, this is a permitted location. Again, it's just a test example, not a real one. Um, I'll go to pending applications and you can see that I'm already in the exact same geographical location. Um, and that's just one of the options that Story Map gives you. Um, so moving on again, the screening application is, so these are view maps. It's just a, a map view layer. This is actually an app I developed using Web App Builder and added it as a tab to the story map. So a little bit more complex here, but not too bad. Just gonna agree to these conditions. Um, and here I've included more information. Um, so the public wants to get a little bit more interactive and screen a specific location. Um, I'm gonna just dive in here a little bit. We can select a point and zoom into it. So if they wanted to look at a specific location, um, they could do that. And beyond that, they could use these tools here. So we have a base map gallery, you know, your legend, your layer list. So a couple of different data layers you might wanna add in, a measuring tool. And then specifically, there's this interactive screening option. So I can, I'm gonna zoom out a tiny bit here. Pretend that I'm somebody looking for an oyster mariculture site in Dickinson Bay. I'm just gonna select this. Um, and you can either add in a place name as your area of interest, uh, draw or add in coordinates just for the sake of time. I'm going to just draw. So here we go. And if I wanna learn more information about this area, say I'd like to put something in Dickinson Bay, um, within this area, uh, but also a buffer of maybe like a mile. So I'm just gonna add that in as well. And then hit report. And I can see here that, yep, there's two permit location boundaries clearly there. So I can just review this or I have the option to hit print right there. Um, I already set this up in advance, so I can tell you that this is what this looks like, <laughs> um, which is, again, a pretty basic map and data available for that person, a potential applicant looking for uh, an oyster mariculture site. So they could take that type of information, go back to the original website, um, download a, an application themselves, fill that out, see what else they need to do, and that kind of just gets them started 
in the process. All right, so we're gonna move on to some more fun stuff. As you can see, um, we also, like I said, had the, I guess the TPWD staffing side, if you will. So for that one, um, can someone let me know if you can see this application as well? Yes, the it looks good. One? Okay. Great, thanks. <laughs> Sometimes I'm worried switching between screens. Um, so here, my task was to create an application that would link the data edits made to the view layers on that public facing story map. And while the staff did have the option to use the AGO group access for this application, um, I also made it available within the banner of the public facing interactive application. So it's just at the bottom, only you know employees could really go in there, but that just made it one step easier for them. So once they clicked on that, they were able to go into this um, commercial oyster mariculture employee um, application side. So another application. Um, here, similar tools in a lot of ways. Uh, you've got the legend, um, a layer list of op options for them to kind of get an idea of, okay, this is where the applicant is looking for a space. And then what they can do is then they can add in a potential pending site or a permitted site directly into the application that's reflected on the other side. Um, of that public facing story map. So again, I'm just gonna jump in here. You can see that both permitted and pending applications are available. Um, you also have options like, you know, the base map gallery. This grid can be really helpful to a lot of people that are, especially when they're drawing out their polygons, the measure tool, et cetera. Um, and here, that final one, this is the editor tool that I designed. Now, what they could do if they're putting in a new permitted or pending location is just draw it out like the public. Um, the problem with that is uh, we like accuracy. <laughs> and this was an issue uh, looking, trying to develop something out of AGO because you can't simply just design a data structure and, and try and imagine how many vertices are gonna be needed or how many Latin long locations, you know, points we're putting together in a polygon. So that was kind of out of the question. Um, the other side was just the fact that, um, yeah, like, you know, projections and datum, and are we getting the right ones every time? So the the compromise here was actually kind of simple. We decided to look into place markers and. I think the fastest way I'm gonna do this as the example is just to throw these in. So I'm gonna give you four place markers so I can design my polygon. This is the Northwest and I'm just gonna hit add a marker. I'm gonna give Paul Doherty the credit here too because he came up with the solution <laughs> of adding in these place markers. So that's the Southwest. And you just, you know, like um, any personnel could come in and put these all together. I'm just doing a quick copy and paste so that we're not wasting too much time. And now that Southeast one. And then I'll just zoom out a little bit so you can see what I did, where we're going with this. And then here, I'm just gonna select my new selection and tie these together. Once that's accomplished, you can see that I now have places available to input all the information I need and the Latin long are already available. So that's not something I need to change or access. That's part of the AGO setup. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick pretend test. I actually developed the data structure in um, Art Catalog, so I was able to create these domains for a dropdown. It's just kind of a helpful little thing. I'm going to put nowhere here. <laughs> um, but I think you could get the idea of what's happening. Uh, I also had a was able to use a preset so that we can include the Department of Health and Safety's link as well. And so um, you can delete these points. You can uh, copy them anything you want. So I'm just going to save this one so that in real time on the other side, we'll just go back out and do a quick update. And there you go. So we have our new point here. Um, and that's that's pretty much how it works. Um, I am going to include one more slide for all of my GIS folk. 
because I know this was interesting for me. Um, this is just the workflow I designed to give you an idea how the application was made. Uh, in the end, it was four separate maps, three applications, all designed with an AGO and linked to one hosted feature layer to accomplish that commercial oyster mariculture application. Um, but yeah, with the right concept of view layers and how you're going to use it, you can pretty much put anything together to get what you need. So thank you very much. Wonderful. That That's fantastic. And I, I got a quick question. We got a little time here. Um, so I was actually kind of scoping out how you did the app. Is that just done through an Azure app builder or did you guys really? It's just yep. an app. Wow. Yep. I know, right? As there is, yeah. This is not, so I, I'm telling you, the turnaround was a month and a half. Sometimes I joke about it because I'm like, you know, man, I can, I don't want to tell people I can do these in a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there are always things that you kind of find like, oh man, I can't just add in, um, you know, the coordinates. You think it might be as simple as that, but there, it is complex. And, and that right. problem solving is just the brilliance of GIS and, and how you use data. So it's exciting. Well, that's fantastic. No, I mean, you know, I have a whole uh, new um, respect for the app builder stuff. I know internally, um, those are the kinds of things that we're kind of thinking about is, uh, we're so used to building our own things, you know, and then all of a sudden that builder comes around and has matured and modified uh, itself into a really realistic type of application creator. And I was just happened to be noticing what you were doing. I thought that is fantastic. That is fantastic. So good job, you guys. Congratulations. I think it's real neat too, you know, from, from my standpoint to just see all the great things that the state agencies are really doing. And um, and we're so caught up in some tenorous activities, we kind of forget what everybody else is doing. So that's why I love these meetings. Um, thank you again, Joanne. I really appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions uh, that they want to throw out in a uh, in the chat box for Joanna? We still have about six minutes. Anyone? Anyone? There is a there's a general question here, um, and uh, Dr. Alduri, it's good to good to see you here. I appreciate that. The question, and I don't know if we brought this up, the uh, presentations, everything you're seeing here is being recorded and we are going to uh, post it. We do have to get it uh, closed caption before we can do that. Um, so it's gonna be probably about four weeks or so before we can get it out there. But yes, we are planning on posting this entire, um, this entire thing. So uh, thank you for the question. Anybody else have any, any thoughts, any questions? Okay, Joanne, thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll get uh, over here to Laura Chapa. And Laura, if you don't mind, we're gonna probably just delay for about five minutes, um, just so like we were promising other people, we're gonna stay true to the schedule so people can jump on when they want. And uh, we'll just go from here. Um, we can get you set up though. Sure. Okay, it looks like you're, looks like you're good. I see everything. Is it my actual presentation or is it the notes? Uh, I'm seeing the notes and the presentation, it looks like. How about that? Is that better now? Just yeah, the presentation? Yeah, that, that works Perfect. good. Though. That's okay. good. Richard, Richard, this is John Doherty. Wanted to keep this at uh, Parks and Wildlife um, staff and alumni hour. So that's why Laura's <laughs> doing the hub presentation. <laughs> Uh, that's, no, that's fantastic. Uh, no, this is this is going to be good, and we're looking forward to your presentation. So appreciate y'all being here. Let's give it about four more minutes, and then we'll get started. If sure anybody thing. needs to run down the hall or go fill up their water jar, this would be a good time to go do that. And just so you know, the temperature hasn't gone up one degree since this morning. It's the exact <laughs> temperature, 41 degrees. Wow. Uh, we could get Scott Friedman to come up and uh, do some um, impressions, Scott. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he was doing them earlier.
Laura, are you from the San Antonio office, by the way? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm based out of the San Antonio office. I wasn't 100 percent sure if you were in San Antonio or not. Yes, I, I mean, well, I, I live right in the middle between okay. um, Austin and San Antonio. Got it. So that's where I am now. Um, but yes, that, you know, it's a nice thing about being in the middle geographically is, you know, opens up the door for opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or being able to visit both big cities that have so much to offer. Right. Well, very, very good strategic decision you made. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of uh, came to Texas State and San Marcos for school and um, basically never left. Um, so it's not a bad place to be. Yeah. Uh, well, good, good. Uh, I was about to say something stupid, like, did you drive, how was your drive down here? But we're virtual, so uh, I still It was about 10 that. seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. I would much rather see you all in person, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, well, and be at the forum right now, but I know it's, you know, it is what it is right now, right? We will, we will, uh, yeah, we will do it. We'll, we'll try to do it with some grandeur next time. You know, we'll we'll uh, maybe do something fun for the next forum and make up for the one we missed. That sounds so great. We always, always need a good time. We always need Ed, Esri's help on it too. So. Uh, well, we are here for your support, no doubt. Appreciate that. East is that say East Tennessee, Sam Moffat. You're at 73 degrees. That is crazy, actually. Yeah, um, I was. I think there was someone I was on a call with earlier today that was in um, North Carolina, and they said that you know, I haven't gotten the cold front yet, so it's still quite warm there. Yeah. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully something can happen with this these snows that put out some of those fires. Though oh yeah, really true. Seems to me, if you look at it. Anyway, okay. Uh, enough small talk from us. It looks like we're about to turn to 210. So, uh, Laura, I'm going to go ahead and just turn it all over to you. Let's do it. Um, I'm hoping I can squeeze it all in there. I'll be honest. Um, okay, everyone. So, my name is Laura Chapa, and I will be, I'm not John, I will be presenting instead of John as it states in the agenda. And um, I'm a new solution engineer to Esri State and Local Government Team based out of the San Antonio Regional Office. And my role as a solution engineer is to work with uh, Texas state agencies and local governments to help you get the most out of our technology. So I'm excited to tell you today about ArcGIS Hub and how you can get started and uh, how you can use this platform to uh, connect with your citizens with your government initiatives. So I'm just going to do a quick overview of what Hub is so we can jump into a demonstration. But um, if you're not familiar, ArcGIS Hub in its most basic sense, is the gives you this ability to make a website. So for instance, um, enhance your public information site, or perhaps specifically your geospatial data site, so that your users have a simple, interactive, and engaging experience. Um, it's not going to be a static website, which we're so often more used to. It's interactive, like I mentioned, and engaging. And it also provides this way for you to not only pro provide information from your organization to your users, but also for users to provide information to you. So it kind of creates this two-way road of information. So ArcGIS Hub is a cloud-based platform that helps organizations and communities work together more effectively. And since it is cloud-based, it is a part of your ArcGIS Online organization. So there are two levels of ArcGIS Hub. There's Hub Basic and then there's Hub Premium. So with Hub Basic, um, everybody has access to this right now in their ArcGIS Online organization. And then Hub Premium comes with some additional functionality. Um, and there is an annual subscription um, to upgrade to Hub Premium as well. So I'm going to touch on what you get with Hub Basic and then also what comes with Hub Premium. So um, all in all, Hub is a way to bring people in your organization and outside of your organization together to create transparency, to share content and data, and I like to think of it as sort of this one-stop shop for users to get the information they need. So Hub is this way to take your work and engage with your staff, your collaborators, and with the public. You know, as a volunteer or a citizen, it's really energizing when you feel like your efforts make a difference or your voice is being heard. So there's a big value that comes with an informed public. 
You know, if, um, if, a, if the public is informed with transparent, transparent information, then they're able to let you know upfront if they're on board with a project or if there are certain projects that are non-starters for them, which can save you time and money. So how do you bring all these people together and get them on the same page? Well, we know that can be difficult, but ArcGIS Hub is a way to do that. So just briefly, I wanna to touch on these four main components of Hub. So first is, are the sites. So the Hub site itself, so like I mentioned, in its most basic sense, Hub is a way to build a website, but it provides so much more. So you get these sites where you can provide, um, you can embed apps and maps in it. You can use those dashboards you've already created or create a dashboard and embed it there. You can embed story maps and create this overall experience for your users. Uh, you also get the search tool. So you can embed a search tool in your hub site so that users can search for specific content on your site. And then there's also the data catalog. So maybe some of you are more familiar with open data. Um, hub Basic is, or Hub in general, is the evolution of uh, Hub Basic. I'm sorry, Hub is the evolution of open data. So you still have this ability to uh, search for data, apps, or documentation that you've shared and that your users can find that pretty easily. Um, and so that's what you get. Sites and the search tool and data catalog is what you get with Hub Basic. And for that additional annual subscription, you get community identities in this initiative framework. And so um, for that, I think that the community identities is extremely powerful, which I'll, I'll talk on that in more, in more depth in just a minute. Um, but it allows you to get those members of your community more involved and engaged. Um, and with this initiative framework, you get access to um, the ability to create teams for specific initiatives that you've created. Um, you can do uh, perform one-click emailing to your followers or your team members. You also have the ability to create and manage events that are found on your hub site. And then, you know, tying that back into the community identities, if you have someone in your community that maybe is the event manager for a specific event, then they can become a member of um, you know, your hub and you can tie them into a team so that they can also edit and um, share information and help you manage that. And you also have this ability to, um, for people to follow your initiative and become members and they can contribute content and edit data if you allow them to. So again, just to reiterate with Hub Basic, you all have access to that right now in your ArcGIS Online organization, you get sites and this search tool and data catalog. And then with Hub Premium, with that additional subscription, you get the community identities and the initiative framework, which I'll get into more depth about those. So just briefly, I wanna focus on the community aspect of Hub Premium for a minute, because this is really neat. Um, when you deploy Hub Premium, it deploys a second uh, ArcGIS Online organization called the Community Members Organization. So this is gonna be separate from your agency's online uh, ArcGIS Online organization. So this community organization is connected through a collaboration to your main ArcGIS Online organization, the employee organization, and you can um, have people follow, they can register, they can sign in to become community members. They're not admitted to the employee organization, so your content is still secure since they exist in a separate community ArcGIS Online organization. So you can share content to them, they can share content to you, you can have them help you collect data so they actually get a creator level user type so they can create maps and apps and use field apps. All of those capabilities that you get with a traditional creator user type. So with this community aspect of Hub Premium, you've now gone from people just visiting your website to actively participating in info gathering, content creation, and projects within your, um, helping with projects within your agency. So let's take a look. So now I'm gonna pull up my browser so just give me a confirmation that y'all can see that. My browser now, my ArcGIS Online. Yeah, we see it. Okay, Okay, great. Uh, so um, I'm gonna briefly show you how you can get started. If I click on the app launcher in the top right, and this is where I can find Hub. So this is my ArcGIS Online organization with Esri. So this is Hub Premium that I'm going to demonstrate for y'all. Um, so now you can go through the app launcher to get to Hub or uh, go to hub.arcgis.com are the two ways to get there. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk y'all through the steps of just getting started. So if I go ahead and I wanna start a new initiative, click new, I can put in the name here and just create initiative, but I'm gonna take a moment and browse these templates. So with Hub Premium, uh, Esri has created ready to use templates and there are currently 18. So I'm actually gonna filter my search by published 
ESRI templates. Um, and so I can find these 18 templates that are ready to use, published by ESRI um, here. And if I wanted to search for a specific template, I could do that. Now, I also want to mention that um, in Hub Basic, there are three templates that come with Hub Basic, and they're all COVID related to help you navigate through. Um, I know the difficulty that's come with COVID. So I'm actually going to use this project site template to walk you all through how you can get started with Hub. So I'm actually going to call this um, my Texas flood project. And I've already created that. So let me just add a number on the end here. I don't know if it's going to like that. Oh, it did. Okay, good. So what's also nice, you know, nice is if you've ever managed a website, then you know how important it is to understand how your users are um, interacting with your site. So um, what did they click on? How long did they stay there? So you get that ability to, to see those metrics for your site. So what it just did is it deployed this new initiative into my ArcGIS Online organization. And so now I have access to, um, I've created an initiative site, that dashboard that allows you to see those metrics for your hub site. I now have the ability um, to create and manage my team so that I can invite people to be on a core team to help me manage and maintain um, and edit this hub site. Um, I also have the ability with Hub Premium to create and um, edit and manage events. I also have the ability to um, get feedback from the people who are coming and visiting my site through uh, surveys with Survey123. Again, I mentioned that community aspect that comes with Hub Premium, so you can get people in your community involved and engaged and, and helping you with all of this content creation. Um, and then the content library. So um, that's going to be all of the content that, as it implies, all of the content that your hub site points to. And then groups manager. So this allows you to manage um, your ArcGIS Online groups or open data groups that you have. Um, so they can, um, you know, maybe, maybe there are certain things on your hub site you want certain groups to have access to or certain groups to be able to see. So you can actually even more fine tune the accessibility of your uh, hub site. All right, so I just launched this template and here we are right at the beginning. The first thing I want to point out in the top left is just like the, all of those main points that you get um, with Hub Premium, they're all found here in this top menu. So now I can go to the dashboards if I want to see those metrics. metrics. Go into my Teams Manager, manage my events. Um, I can jump into feedback and start building out a survey one, two, three so that I can use that in my Hub site. I can go into my community, um, now, you know, I just created this initiative, so I don't have any community members yet. I don't have anyone following this event or anyone that's registered or signed in. Um, but that's where I could go. I could click into the community, see who all my members are, all my followers. And by the click of a button, I could send all of them an email right away to uh, get some messaging out. Again, this is going to, the content library links out to all the content that your hub site is pointing to. And then the groups manager, um, again, going to manage those groups in ArcGIS Online um, that feed into the hub. Okay, so let's walk through how you could get set up here. Um, I'm just going to point out these these main settings. So um, before I forget, I want to say that um, Hub is device responsive. So regardless of which device you're on, it will modify and change the look so that it can fit on that device. Um, so we first, let's point out the settings tab up at the top. So this is where I could go in and adjust the name if I had a um, a summary that I wanted to grab for this hub site, I could grab that and drop it in here. Um, let's say you already have a domain set for your uh, organization and you wanted to use the domain. Um, so maybe it didn't have this domain, up, uh, this uh, URL up here at the top. You can specify a certain domain that, you know, to have that branding for your organization. Um, you can uh, adjust the type of interactions that your users have with the site. You have a couple of data options as well. And you also have the ability to turn on the beta capabilities, so you can test out these new features that are coming out. All right, so there's a few of the settings to get started. Next would be the header settings. So you have the ability to have sort of the shorter, more concise header at the top, or maybe you want a more prominent header up at the top. Um, one thing I failed to mention so far is that Hub is a way to build this interactive site without knowing any HTML or CSS, CSS coding. So, um, however, with that being said, even though you don't need to know how to code to get the site going, you, you still have the ability to do some custom coding. So if I wanted to open up that HTML or CSS coding, I can enter that code right there to get it more customized for the look and feel that I want for the header. Uh, but 
So yeah, that's what that's going to look like if I wanted to jump into that HTML code editor. But I'm actually just going to stick with the standard for now. All right, the next one is the theme. So this is really where you can uh, more configure and customize the look, um, the colors that you want for your website. So the background navigation color, the text, um, also uh, the body background color. Maybe you want uh, body links to be a certain color. So those hyperlinks you've included in there. Um, even specifying the type of color that you want your buttons to be throughout your website and then the text that lays on that button. You also have the ability to um, adjust the base font and then the heading font as well. So if I click on the gear icon, um, I can import, if there's a specific font that maybe my organization uses, I can add that and import it here. So I think that's really neat. So this is where you would go if you really wanted to um, give it those colors to give it the branding or, or maybe not just branding for your organization, but maybe branding for a specific project. All right. So next is layout. So this is getting into really the meat of uh, building out the hub site. So since I did use a template, it has brought in a lot of what we call these cards. It has brought in all, it already has cards configured in it um, that I can go in and, and change and edit with the information I would like. Um, but I just want to point out here, you, you're able, these are just drag and drop. So it's really easy to get started. So if I wanted to add in a new row here, just drag and drop it in. I can adjust the text color, decide if I want the background to be transparent. I can upload an image or just go snag an image from the internet um, using the URL. So um, let's say there with, with this particular row, I didn't want everybody to be able to see that. I only wanted certain groups to be able to see it. I can even limit that here and select which groups my ArcGIS Online that I want to be able to see that content, which is really nice as well. All right. I just, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just kind of want to point out some of the different options you have here with these different cards. You can add an image. Maybe you want to add a specific application. So again, this is fully integrated with uh, all of Esri's, um, es Esri's other products like dashboards and story maps. Um, so that, that way you can tie all this in together. Again, like that one-stop shop I had mentioned. Uh, maybe you want to add a spacer in on your page. So that way to just give it a cleaner look to space things out a bit. And then the text card. So I want to spend just a moment going over that. So I have a row here um, and I can click on the gear icon for that entire row. And you see there's an image that came with this. So I actually found a, an image I could snag off the internet. So I'm going to grab that URL, go back to my website. I'm going to change this to my, uh, the image that I found. So what's kind of nice about um, the row uh, card and being able to add an image. You could also upload an image if you have it on your computer. I can fix the background where um, it stays fixed as I scroll up and down, or I can just turn that off. I can adjust the uh, transparency and also the focal point. Um, and then again, I can limit that to a group if I'd like to do that as well. So now that I've updated that to be more of the image that I want, and I want to look, edit this text card. So uh, this is a rich text editor, so you have quite a few options where I could change um, the heading. Maybe I wanted it to be really big so when people come to my site, they can see uh, the name of this uh, hub initiative right off the top. Uh, I can I have the ability to do bold, italics, add a hyperlink, a bulleted list, a numbered list, change the justification. Um, I can add a table and pick how many rows and columns I'd like to do there. Uh, I can also add a button here. Or uh, if I wanted to add a wide card, I could do that and then edit that information. Or perhaps I wanted to add uh, just cards in general. And then I could edit what is, um, what is in, in those cards. And then also this is a new feature in Hub. So the Hub is constantly being updated. So maybe you have a section on your Hub site where you wanted to have a you know, frequently asked question. So you could use this accordion where you could type the question in the title and then have the answer down below and then have that in the drop down where it can um, hide it or make it appear, you know, for the user's experience. So I'm going to go ahead and not do that. So like I mentioned, you don't have to know code to um, build out your hub site, but you can go ahead, like in this text card, open up the HTML code and start editing that to give it a more customized look. All right. And another important note, Hub does not have the ability to auto save, so you'll want to click save and save often up in the top right. We all know how that goes as GIS professionals. You don't want to forget to save. 
Um, I'm just going to scroll down and point out a few other items here. Uh, this is, um, even though this looks, you know, really nice and sort of fancy with the one, two, three, four in the line, this is actually a text card with just HTML coding. So again, just kind of showing you that functionality, how you can bring in that customization into your hub site. Another one of these cards that we have available is a summary statistic. If I scroll down here, so if I wanted to bring in a specific statistic for my users to be able to find um, a data number quickly and easily, I could actually click this gear icon, search for um, in my content for that particular um, data set that I want to point to, and then filter that down to show the exact information that I want. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, just in these layout options, these cards you have, you can add an image, your text card, add that button. I'm just going to scroll through here and show some other features. Back in layout, you have this ability to add a gallery. So that's what we're looking at here. If I click the gear icon to edit this, I have the ability to select if I want these, um, the, the gallery items to be selected dynamically, where I could just select a group maybe I've created in um, ArcGIS Online and that content is within that group. So that way I can just select the group and it'll automatically update uh, my gallery with the content there. Or maybe I wanna manually select what content is going to show up um, in these, this gallery card. I can also adjust you know, the button if I wanna change and have it say something other than explore. I can also uh, make it have a shadow or a square corner versus a rounded corner. So there's a little bit of configuration there that you can change um, to give it the look that you want. So I'm just gonna scroll through here because I know I'm getting close on time um, just to show you what that looks like. And a couple other sites that I wanna point out. So this is a Texas Water Development Board hub site that I created. So I'm just gonna scroll through this just to show you, you know, what another hub site could look like. Um, I've included their awesome Texas flood map. So that way you can link out to external sites as well. Um, I've also created this survey one, two, three. So if I click on this, um, this takes me out to a survey one, two, three. So that way I can get feedback from citizens and, as well if I was interested in getting that feedback. You have this ability to add a calendar and add events like I mentioned. So if I click over to November, I can see those. Um, it'll list out, so I've included one event here, but it would list out all the events if you had more than one um, on your calendar. So anyway, you can embed a live Twitter feed and um, these are buttons that I've just added in here. And I think I'm just about on time here. So this, this last 30 seconds or so, I wanted to point out Esri San Antonio Regional Office hub site. So you can come and you can follow our hub site so you can stay informed about what we've, going, we've got going on with Esri in your region. So you can um, just click down here and click the sign up and follow button. And then lastly, let me scroll to the top here. I wanted to point out, this is a hub site I built for our team to let you know about CARES funding and how you can align CARES funding with your geospatial needs. And so um, I'll be sure and share this link out and it'll be coming to you, but I wanna point out this too, just like you can link out to a survey that you've created, you can also embed one. So this is what that would look like. So your users can come here, fill out the survey and submit without ever leaving your site. Um, and pointing out, you can embed a, a PDF here. So now you can interact with this PDF and click on these links and go straight out to those um, hyperlinks more of what, those are all of our coronavirus solutions that we have available, embedding a video. So a little note from Jack about GIS in the time of crisis. You can embed the dashboards in here. And again, just showing all of that additional functionality with Hub. And I think that that is my time folks. And um, I know I took up the whole 20 minutes, but I wanted to really give you all a good look at what's going on and how to get started with Hub. But feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to support you. That's fantastic, Laura. Can't tell you how much uh, we appreciate that and to see it like that and how much customization can be done is is absolutely fascinating. So we appreciate you showing us uh, that. John, thank you again for for that. And I'm sorry, we are kind of up against the wall for questions, but um, we might, uh, as we get them, we're going to fire them off to you guys. And if y'all okay. wouldn't mind answering them that way, that would be uh, great. But Thanks again. I kind of feel bad we can't applaud. I wish everybody could applaud or we had some sort of applaud bunch of hands moving or something that could show that. But thank you guys for for your help. I'd like to also thank Chris and Joanna for, for their time as well. Fantastic job. And we're going to already move right into our last, se I think it's our second, second to the last session, and I'm going to turn it over to Gayla. Yes, and I think I just passed it off to you, Gayla. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Great, thank you, Laura. Bring my screen up. Seventh inning stretch, everyone. <laughs> Okay. I'm just getting my screen up. Okay, can you see the strap map slide? Yes, it's your PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started with the next session. Um, my name is Gayla Mullins. I can't see myself right now. Um, so if I look over to the side awkwardly, that's that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but I can see my slides. Um, I am with Tenris and I am the manager of our strategic mapping program or strat map for short. I'm most definitely missing the Texas GIS forum this year. I hate that I can't see all of your faces. One of my favorite things about the forum is connecting with all of you and seeing you and getting updates on your work and your families and learning from each other and making those connections. So hopefully next year we can have a, a big party. Um, so for those that uh, may not know, the StratMap program at Tenris is our arm that does the acquisition of statewide geospatial data sets. So we work with myriad of partners in order to get this, um, uh, get this done and available um, over to our IS group uh, to make available on our website. So we work with um, folks from federal, from state, from regional and, and local partners in order to cost share um, for our big base layer um, data sets uh, in Texas. So um, for this session, we have five presenters, including myself, and um, those include Joey Thomas. He has been um, gracefully running uh, the GoToWebinar today, so you'll get to see and hear from him. And uh, also with StratMap is Lauren Kirk, our new data coordinator and she is responsible for our statewide land parcels and address points so she will have a quick update about those for you today um, and Joey's going to speak about LIDAR as well as bathymetry. Bathymetry is a new uh, data type that we are um, learning about and getting into especially um, as we have covered the entire state with LIDAR now. Um, that doesn't mean we're finished. Uh, we do have uh, areas that will need to be refreshed with LIDAR, but now we're going to be going underwater to look at the surface underwater. So we're very excited about that. Um, with him, with helping um, uh, demonstrate a need for bathymetry data, we are very excited to have our colleague at the Texas Water Development Board, Kami Schoenbachler, with us today, and she is going to provide the information about how bathymetry can help her area, which is the coastal science um, area of the Texas Water Development Board. And then finally, we have Chelsea um, Seidenblad and today, and she is going to give the update on our big uh, air photo scanning project. It's not simply give these uh, paper documents to a, a scanning vendor and we're done. A ton of organization has gone into um, getting our archive um, ready to be scanned and then organized when it comes back um, to us in a digital sense. And so um, she will give you a brief update on that. I'm going to talk about imagery as always, our, our update for statewide imagery, and then I will also give you an update on our StratMap GIS uh, DIR contracts. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Joey and um, 
Well, we are going to, I think, reserve questions for the end. Um, so we have a little bit of time set aside to hopefully answer your questions. And if not, all of our email addresses are um, on our last slide. So feel free to contact us. Thanks. Hey, can you guys hear me okay, Kayla? Yeah. Okay, good. Hey, I'm uh, Joey Thomas. I'm the uh, I'm a project manager for the strategic mapping program uh, and the elevation specialist managing the LIDAR acquisitions for the state. Um, and just to uh, begin with, with the talk a little bit about the bathymetry data. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So you know, part of you know the great achievement that is the statewide LIDAR data is we started looking at you know, what data sets are the highest need and would provide the most benefit to the state. Um, and what we found was that bathymetry data was increasingly becoming, you know, a higher priority data set. Um, the technology as well has been, you know, there's a lot more, uh, you know, software packages and better technology, much as the LIDAR has been progressing. So, you know, getting, getting this data at a uh, more reasonable prices you know, within our reach now. It's still a very expensive data set to acquire, um, more expensive than the LIDAR is on most occasions. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So what is the symmetry data? So for anybody that isn't familiar with it, um, it's basically the underwater equivalent of topography. So it's the study of the beds and the floors of the water bodies, including the oceans, rivers, streams, and lakes. Um, and, you know, for, for Texas, the bathymetry data that we're interested in is all of it, you know, our rivers, the lakes, um, as well as the coastal bays and the uh, offshore areas. So, and uh, so they're, they're collected predominantly through acoustic systems or some of the LIDAR systems, either the bathymetric type laser or a topobathy laser. And so over there on the right, you can see a, a topobathy uh, image there where it's collecting data on the land as well as in the shallow areas of the water. Um, and then below that is the different types of acoustic. Um, the main ones that we've been interested in looking at are the single beam and the multi beam for the waters in Texas. Um, they, you know, much like how LIDAR and the elevation data that we get from the topography. Um, has a multitude of uses. A lot of the same uses can be applied to bathymetry data from, you know, the flood inundation mapping to, you know, biological research. Next slide. So we've, we've currently been going through quite a bit of coordination around the state um, with the state agencies as well as some of the federal agencies. Um, we've talked with GLO, NRCS, NOAA, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Texas Water Development Board, and the USGS. Um, and we've we've kind of all come to the conclusion that the best way to you know coordinate all the agencies so that we understand you know who's planning on acquiring data where. Um, you know the last thing we want to do, especially with the data being so expensive to procure, is to you know survey the same area. Um, so, and I mean, it, the other aspect of that is Texas is very large. And so the only way we're going to be able to acquire all the bathymetry data that we need is through coordination and cooperation with each other. So we've been using this ski, ski sketch app um, that NOAA has created. Uh, they didn't create the app, but they created this map um, within it where Everybody puts their planned and proposed and ongoing bathymetric surveys. Um, and it's it's been looking like it's going to be our best bet for getting everybody coordinated on the same page. And you can see if two people are, you know, proposing a acquisition in the same areas and they can join up and all that kind of stuff. So if you if you're interested in this kind of thing, please let me know and I'll be happy to send you the link to the C Sketch app. And so as, as an update for this, we are actively planning a, um, a inland bays bathymetry pilot um, that will hopefully be getting kicked off in the near future sometime. Um, and to talk kind of about what the TWDB coastal science aspect of that is, 
I'll pass it over to Kami. Yeah. Thank you, Joey. Can y'all hear me okay? We can hear you. Great. Yep. Great. Well, thank you all so much for inviting me to speak today about the importance of coastal bathymetry data for hydrodynamic model accuracy. Um, in the spirit of full disclosure, I am not a hydrodynamic modeler. Rather, I'm, I'm a manager of the Coastal Science Program. I actually have a background in ecology and ecosystem science. So if you have any hardball questions for me, I might have to consult with the modelers and then get back to you. I wanted to first start off with just telling you a little bit about our coastal science program, since probably some of you are not familiar. Our bays and estuaries program was created actually in 1975 to provide data modeling and analytical services for evaluating the freshwater inflow requirements necessary to support healthy Texas estuaries. Now, over the years, we developed three primary services, including a continuous data collection program for monitoring estuary conditions and also for verifying model simulations. As well, coastal hydrology data sets for understanding the quantity of freshwater inflow flowing to the coast and for driving the hydrodynamic models. And then finally, hydrodynamic modeling. And we use a combina the combination of data models and analyses to assist with water resources planning and management, as well as environmental impact assessments, oil spill response, and coastal ecosystem restoration. Last year, the 86 Texas legislature passed several key pieces of legislation which greatly expanded the Water Development Board's role in flood science planning and financing. Our program was rebranded as Coastal Science to broaden the range of program functions to include coastal flood modeling and storm surge modeling to support flood mitigation planning. Next slide, please. So bathymetry data are critical for a variety of different applications, including for navigation, studying long-term coastal change, and for studying bottom-dwelling marine life. In our program, we primarily use bathymetry data to create hydrodynamic models. Bathymetry data are used in the hydrodynamic modeling process in two substantial ways, both in the governing equations and in the development of the computational grid. In this presentation, I will walk you through two examples of the effect of bathymetry on the accuracy of hydrodynamic models. Now, the figure on the left depicts a digital elevation model footprint for the coast, which along with all coastal bathymetry data can be accessed from NOAA's bathymetry data viewer at the link shown. And I'll mention that in Texas, we actually do have good quality coastal bathymetry data for navigation channels and also along shorelines. But uh, the, the data is quite outdated in open bay areas and in delta regions, and that would be the focus of, of a new acquisition. Next slide, please. The Coastal Sciences Program, our program's current initiative, is focused on developing a three-dimensional hydrodynamic model for the entire Texas coast to simulate circulation, water levels, and salinity patterns within and between bay systems. Our new three-dimensional model will be a significant upgrade from the previous two-dimensional model that we've used in-house for the last several decades. Next slide, please. Uh, you might need to scroll a few more times to get to the full image of that slide. One more time. Perfect, thank you. Now, I don't want any of you to worry, we're not going to be solving partial differential equations today, which is a relief to me. <laughs> but it is important to know that that bathymetry or the depth of the water relative to some datum is a very important variable in the shallow water equations, which are used in computational fluid dynamics to calculate water flow and water surface elevation. This means that bathymetry data is inherently embedded in the numerical scheme that drives hydrodynamic models. Thus, it has a direct impact on the accuracy of model results. Next slide, please. In 
In addition to the governing equations, such as the shallow water equations I just mentioned, bathymetry is also critical in the grid generation process. To generate a model grid, a shoreline boundary and bathymetry data are required. We use the Surface Water Modeling System, or SMS, um, to first generate a horizontal grid. And this grid typically varies in resolution from about 10 meters at ship channels to over 3,000 meters at offshore boundaries. After the horizontal grid is generated, the digital elevation models are then interpolated onto the computational grid. This grid generation process is one of the most important and most challenging processes because the model results can be significantly modulated by the quality of the grid that's generated. Next slide, please. Now to give you some insight into our preliminary model results, I want to show you um, some, a series of water surface elevation, a time series of water surface elevation at six different locations in the Laguna Madre. The six different locations that I'm highlighting in the data plots on the right are shown um, emphasized in that green box uh, in the model grid on the figure on the left. Now, in turning your attention to the modeled values for water surface elevation on the right, I want to point out that the, uh, the modeled values are shown by the red line and the observed values or measured values are shown in blue. What I want you to notice is that the model agrees fairly well with the measured data, both in terms of the short-term daily fluctuations as well as the long-term patterns at most locations, except at two locations. And hopefully you can see those uh, at Rincon del San Jose and Port Mansfield in the Laguna Madre, and those are the third and fourth panels down. And you can see there that the modeled values diverge significantly from the measured values. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so to further understand the magnitude of that error that we just saw, a quantitative error analysis is used to evaluate the model simulation results. In the table, you see that there's a mean error. This represents how much the model over predicts or under predicts, while the mean absolute error explains how much the model data deviates from the observed data. And then finally, the value of the predictive skill is the index of agreement. And if your skill value equals one, then your model is in perfect agreement with real, real world data. So overall, the results actually show that our schism model reproduces water surface elevation pretty well in Texas estuaries with an overall 90% agreement, um, and including all stations. Now, the stations, there are four stations highlighted in red font, and those are the areas where the model uh, does not have good predictive skill. There's two locations in the Guadalupe Estuary and at Sea Drift and Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, and then two locations in the Laguna Madre, Rincon del San Jose, and Port Mansfield, as we already saw, that do not reproduce um, that where the model does not perform well. And in fact, if you look in the predictive skill column, you'll see that the locations in the Laguna Madre, for those locations, the model is actually only about 30% in agreement with measured data. So that's not very high. When we exclude those four stations from the error analysis, we see the overall predictive skill of the model improve to 95%. From this error analysis, we suspect that there are most likely significant errors in the quality of the bathymetry data set in these areas. Now, because water surface elevation is strongly affected by wind stress, especially in shallow areas, it's even more important for us to have fine resolution bathymetry data. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to close with another example of the effect of bathymetry and model accuracy. This is a simulation um, of Hurricane Harvey that was conducted by Clint Dawson and colleagues. And this highlights well another, um, the effect that bathymetry data can have on the accuracy of water levels. So the top panels are showing you an image of bathymetry for a portion of the Sabine and Natchez rivers where they meet Sabine Lake Bay. 
The image on the left shows, shows old bathymetry data from 2008, and the image on the right shows new bathymetry data from 2018. Hopefully you can visually see that there is a larger distribution of inundated areas not previously captured by the old data. And looking at the, the plots on the bottom, uh, these bottom panels quantify this effect. Again, we're looking at a time series of water surface elevation at the Rainbow Bridge site on the Natchez River. Now at the figure, the bottom left figure, you'll see that simulated water surface elevation is represented by the black line. And this is compared to the water surface elevation calculated from old bathymetry data. You can see that the model data do not agree with the measured data based on this outdated bathymetry. So which one is correct, the measured data or the model data? Well, in looking at the plot on the right, we can see it's the same exact plot, but this time it includes water surface elevation that's, that's calculated from updated bathymetry data. And here you can see that the model data and the measured data much more closely agree indicating that we can have a higher level of confidence in the accuracy of the model results. So those are just two examples of how bathymetry does impact model accuracy. And if you forward to the next slide, I'd like to um, send you home with just a few key messages, which is that bathymetry data are critical for hydrodynamic modeling, both in terms of the governing equations and in developing an accurate high quality model grid. Coastal bathymetry data are outdated in open bay areas and delta regions, despite the, the quantity of data that is available for the coast. And as I mentioned, those would be the uh, focus of any new acquisition. And then finally, accurate bathymetry data does improve model accuracy. And this has important implications for coastal inundation and storm surge modeling where water level matters. That's all I have for you today. And thank you so much again for the invitation uh, to speak with you. And I look forward to connecting with you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. Joey you, Jamie. is up next about LIDAR. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, can you go to the next slide? All right, so just to give everybody a update, statewide LIDAR coverage is complete, hooray. Um, we still, we have received the remaining data sets from the USGS um, and are working to put them online. This would be the USGS West Texas and the USGS Desert Mountain. Um, I believe that the other remaining one, the Dallas Pecos, was posted um, for download just the other day. So you can go check that one out. It's uh, parts of the Metroplex. And I think there's some other parts in East Texas and then out in West Texas as well. Um, yeah, and, and as I said, the West Texas is very large. Um, and so it's been taking quite a substantial time to prepare for download. but uh, we are nearing, you know, what we believe is the completion of that. So here in the next month or two, hopefully we'll be able to have it up online, ready for download. Um, we did have some additional LIDAR data sets that were reflown in 2019 and 2020. Can you go to the, or just progress it once? There we go. Um, so those blue areas, those are um, a USGS. I think they have, I think it's the hurricane coverage. Um, and then NRCS filled in some gaps in the data as well. And then a Stratmap 2020 acquisition. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm hoping that those will all become available sometime towards the beginning of next year's. Um, uh, yeah, go to the next slide. Uh, to give you an update on some of our current Stratmap data initiatives, um, we we are still planning to do the full classification of some of the federal LIDAR projects. Um, we're just kind of waiting on some technicality type stuff, but hopefully that that project will begin very soon this fall. Um, and I believe it should take about a year or so to process all that data. It's a substantial amount of data. I think it's 
over 150 square miles or something like that. So it should be a lot of new information being uh, given to that data and it will of course be available through our website as well. Um, we're also doing some leaf off LIDAR and orthoimagery projects this winter. The capital area of Brazos County and Kerr County orthoimagery project um, was released to the StratMap DIR vendors just the other day. Um, and we should be, you know, we're, we're very excited about some of the new vendors in the vendor pool and we're looking forward to working with some of them in the future. Uh, the Bear and Travis County LIDAR project um, is predominantly covers Travis County and then some of the adjacent watersheds that feed into it. Um, and then Bear County and a couple of watersheds around it as well. Um, and we're hoping to get that released in the near future and it would be acquired this winter. It would be our regular uh, you know, state LIDAR specification. Next slide. Uh, so also some exciting news, uh, the USGS has decided to do a national terrain model pilot in Texas. Um, it's in Southeast uh, Texas, it's an eight county study area. Um, and so they're, they're in the process of, you know, combining all the topographic and the topobathymetric LIDAR and bathymetric data. Um, so that's, that kind of lends to another reason why we're so interested in pursuing these bathymetry data sets. Um, because they will support this type of work where we, you know, create these, you know, fully representative surface water uh, features and we can use them to support a, a multitude of applications. Um, but uh, so, yeah, they're, they're going to be in the process of combining all of those terrain models, which, you know, I'm very interested in because of the time gaps between all of the data sets and the different datums and geoids that they might be in. So it should be, hopefully they'll, you know, share guidance with that so that we can have those resources moving forward. Um, and so the other thing they're doing is they're going to target areas where they don't have bathymetric data, the inland bathymetry, and then those would become high priority areas for them to go and collect data in. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, a big effort from a lot of different uh, entities, Lamar University, University of Texas, uh, Texas Department of Transportation, Texas Department of Energy Management or Emergency Management, Texas Department of Public Safety, uh, the US Army Corps, and then the local drainage districts and the local floodplain managers. So it's, it's great to see that everybody's getting involved in this and it's, I'm really looking forward to seeing the data that comes from this. And down there on the bottom right, you can kind of see they take the elevation data um, and then they combine it with all the other data sets and then they're able to derive these elevation uh, derived uh, surface water features. So, you know, they'll accurately know where the center line for the rivers and the streams are and what the depth is. So should be a lot of great information to support work in Texas. And I think, uh, do I have another slide? No. Okay. Then I'll pass it back to Gayla. Okay. Thanks, thanks Joey. Gayla. Yeah. And uh, I think you said 150 miles for the square miles for the LIDAR classification, but isn't that 150,000? Oh. I just wanted Correct. the audience to know the yeah. magnitude yeah, of I, that project. I misspoke <laughs> that. That's not very um, big. <laughs> yeah. 150,000 is a large chunk that we're going to be getting classified. So we're yeah, really concerned about that and um, these new data types that Joey has been exploring. Um, next, I have your. Oh. Um, go ahead. Uh, uh, we I did have one question uh, okay. from Raj about the classification level. Uh, so we would we would be trying to match the classification of our program. So it would be additional classifications of low, medium, and high vegetation buildings, um, and then we'd hopefully get culverts as well. And then that would supplement the USGS data to match the Stratmap program classification scheme. Yeah, the data is classified. You can do a whole whole lot. Um, with it oh, a yeah. lot more than um, than just the base elevations. 
Okay, I'm gonna move forward now with, do we have any other questions at this point? I don't see any. Okay. Um, for statewide imagery, I'll give you an update on the Texas Imagery Service. So this is our um, licensed imagery service that provides six inch, six inch pixel resolution imagery for the entire state. Um, we previously started this service with Google content. We have now switched over to Hexagon and their um, imagery content program. So we are very excited that we have successfully made that switch over to their content as of September 1. Um, and we are maintaining the same host for the services, which is AppGeo. So with this switch over, um, this, we have brand new 2018 imagery statewide, and that refreshes a lot of our rural areas that we're getting kind of stale with the Google imagery. So we're very excited about that. The next exciting part about the Texas imagery service update is that Hexagon is currently flying the entire state of Texas in 2020 right now. They have completed almost all of the state. There's an area around Houston that um, they are have yet to acquire. So all of that six inch pixel resolution statewide imagery is gonna be coming into the Texas imagery service uh, in early 2021. Um, just some other um, aspects of the imagery service, if you're not aware. Um, we do have data that in it that are accessible and go back to 2011 uh, for, the, for the state of Texas. Um, the imagery updates are automatic, so you don't have to do anything with your connection links. It's all served out as a streaming data service with unique WMTS WMS uh, organization links. Um, there is an annual subscription fee, and I'll show that on my next slide. Um, however, you can join at any time um, prorated. We just um, use September 1, the state fiscal year, um, as the timeframe for the service periods. Um, because it is uh, proprietary information, it's only available to uh, public entity within the state of Texas and their approved uh, contractors. Um, so please, if you are interested in the Texas Imagery Service, you can go to our website and you can request, request free trial links um, if you meet the criteria. And um, we can let you check it out for uh, 14 days. And um, then we can work with you on how to get you set up um, with the billing. So over here on the left are uh, the costs tiers. Uh, for state agencies, it's based on your usage of the service. So if you're coming in as a first time user, you're gonna start at the very bottom at the minimum tier at uh, 15,625 um, for your annual subscription. And then uh, in the next year, we look at your usage and see if um, you would change to a different tier or not. Again, this is six inch imagery for the entire state um, at these prices. Um, you have uh, regional agencies. We provide the service at $15,000 per year and local agencies such as cities or counties, uh, we only charge $6,000 per year. So again, if you're interested in the Texas imagery service, uh, please visit the website or feel free to holler at me at, at any time. Of course, we will maintain public uh, imagery uh, available from Tenris. And we do that through our partnership with the National Agriculture Imagery Program, as we always have since 2004, when they started the program um, acquisition in Texas. So with Nate, um, they are flying Texas. Uh, in 2020, this is the same data, uh, same acquisition that um, will be of data that will be available in the Texas Imagery Service at six inch pixel resolution. But for the public data, 
through NAEP, it will be at two foot pixel resolution. And this is what we will put through our standard processes at Tenris to make available through our data hub and make our own uh, public web mapping service for you. The other thing I can tell you is that uh, with our contract with Hexagon, uh, they are offering the, the same imagery at one foot pixel resolution for public distribution. We haven't worked out the details on that yet of how we're going to distribute that, um, but we will update um, our user community as we know more about that. Okay, and that's all I have about statewide imagery. Again, let me know if you have any questions about it and I will um, get back to you. Next, we have Lauren Kirk who is our strap map data coordinator for Tenris, and she's going to talk about our land parcels and address points. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Can hear you. Awesome. Cool. Uh, sorry, webcam decided to be on the fritz, so I'm just going to go ahead. Uh, so go ahead, Gayla, next slide. So uh, hello everyone, my name is Lauren Kirk. I'm the Geographic Data Coordinator with Tenris. Um, thanks again to everyone who is joining us today. I'm really glad y'all are all here. Um, I do have a very quick update to give on 2020 land parcels and address points. So currently I'm in the wrap up stage of standardizing the data that we received in March of this year and am reaching out to some of our other vendors um, currently to help fill in the gaps that we still have for the 2020 data sets. Um, so more to come on that. Um, additionally, our IS team has added new resources to our land parcel and address point project pages on our data hub. So now users can download either full state or individual county wide uh, shape files of land parcels and address points or they now have the option of using WMS service links instead of downloading data at all. And lastly, um, I am starting to ramp up the planning for our 2021 acquisition of land parcels and address points. Um, the goal is to have both of those data sets in-house and standardized and available on Data Hub much, much earlier than 2020 has allowed us to, has allowed us to publish. So stay tuned for that. Um, Really happy y'all are here. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Chelsea Siddenblad, who's gonna talk about um, our archive. Thanks, Lauren. Hello, everyone. My name is Chelsea Siddenblad. I'm a GIS specialist with the uh, Research Distribution Center uh, inside Tenrits. Um, Gayla, do you mind going to the next slide? So right now, um, the RDC is uh, in the uh, midst of a big project. We actually sent out a third of our archive to a vendor, uh, Dr. E-File, um, to embark on a bulk scanning project. Um, we're getting 100,000 frames um, scanned and digitized. Um, we've set specific uh, specifications for all of the naming conventions and things like that so that we can seamlessly add those digital uh, scans to our existing um, digital archive. Um, 100,000 scans is going to equate to about 500 additional collections that will be available for bulk uh, ordering, which is a, a reduced price um, to order full collections of imagery. Um, and that um, it's listed on the data hub um, inside uh, each collection card. There's a scan status that'll show you which collections are fully scanned and available at that bulk pricing. Um, having 100,000 frames scanned for us is huge. Uh, that's going to equate to about 50% of the physical frames within the archive being scanned, but it's actually 100% of the photo frames that are unique to the TINRIS. Uh, archives. So photos and collections from USDA, TxDOT, GLO, uh, Texas Forestry Service, um, those uh, statewide agencies, we will have uh, fully scanned collections. Um, and we reserved, uh, we, we 
try to not include a lot of the uh, photos that are already available online, um, like USGS, Army Mapping Service. Um, we definitely want to include those and get those digitized as well, but uh, we wanted to prioritize those unique collections first. And so um, at the conclusion of this project, we, we hope to see 100% of those unique collections um, scanned and, uh, like I said, available for bulk download. Um, and once we get uh, through this iteration, um, we do hope that it's going to set up a foundation, um, having everything in a standardized format so that we can start uh, not only allowing um, the IS team to, to work with us and, and work a way to getting all of this imagery available through download on the data hub, um, but it also sets us up to um, venture into projects like georeferencing all of these images so that we can hopefully get to the point where we can download each individual image through the data hub as well. So we're really excited to, to see this project kicked off. We sent the first third of the archive off yesterday. Um, and like Gayla said, it's been a lot of work to get it prepped and, and ready to go. Um, and we are kind of realizing that we can't do it alone. So last week we posted uh, four new positions for interns um, specifically to assist on this project. So if you or, or someone you know is interested in helping us prepare um, the rest of the photos uh, to be sent out to be scanned and, and to take part of, you know, in, in this project, um, that posting is currently open and it'll be open through the end of the week. Uh, you can find the post, the job description um, and instructions on applying at the ACC GIS uh, blog website. And we'll put that in the chat for anyone who is interested in checking that out. Um, we're looking forward to, to people's interest and, and looking forward to uh, seeing how the project goes. Um, yeah, so. That's all I have, Gayla. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Chelsea, for that update and, and for yours too, Lauren. Um, and Lauren has also contributed significantly to the preparation of the archive. And Joey also worked in the archive when he started at Tenris. So this has been a long time coming for us. Um, I'm sure watching those boxes go out the door on Monday is almost like a piece of Tenris walking away. <laughs> uh, but we know that the photos are in good hands and um, we are very excited to make those available eventually online to, to you all in the community. Um, so next, I have the update on our strap map contracts. So this is how we um, get our data, or get our work done um, in the most efficient way possible. So we started these master contracts um, over 10 years ago. Uh, if you remember at the forum last year, we celebrated 10 years of these contracts and had a special session about them. Um, we wouldn't be able to get our work done um, without being able to partner with our contributing agencies and then be able to um, hire the work that we need done, such as new aerial imagery or LIDAR or scanning or, or software that we need um, without our uh, commercial uh, vendor community. So what we've done is we have a set of pre-qualified geospatial data, data services and software providers that are available um, through our website. Um, and this is what the providers look like today, but also available through the DIR, the um, Department of Information Resources uh, site. So the contracts, officially live at IR and are negotiated over there and we um, administrate them at Tenris. So we are in the renewal period still for these contracts. We thought that we would have our new pool a lot sooner than we do today, but um, DIR is working through them. And uh, so today we have these nine that you see listed here. And, um, but we have 25 more that are in progress. 
So we will be updating our website as those new provider contracts become available. So please um, check back or you, you can contact me anytime about, um, about these. So I guess in the beginning, these contracts were self-serving for us to be able to efficiently get our work done with already existing contracts for, for geospatial data. But of course, from the beginning, these contracts have been available to any government agency in Texas and, and even outside of Texas. <laughs> People can use these um, already signed contracts. So when you go to any of these company websites, you'll see the um, products and services and software that they provide through these contracts and their associated DIR discounts. So what I want to say to everybody on, um, on the call or on our um, uh, meeting today is that if you're not already getting your GIS software, if you're not already getting GIS data and services, through someone on the StratMap DIR contracts, please take a look at them because they are an opportunity to not only save um, just the rote cost of those data services and software, but also the cost of administering your own contract. <laughs> we have taken that part um, uh, away from you so that you do not have to um, set up brand new um, contracts within your contracting or your procurement um, departments. Um, so again, I've listed the website there if you um, want to monitor these and watch them as they come online. Um, DIR is um, still working through the negotiations and um, we are very excited to see a pool of almost 35 to 40 um, uh, commercial providers um, that will be available um, to anybody, again, anybody in Texas to use. Okay, I think uh, we're a little ahead of time. Um, I did wanna provide our um, contact information here. You're welcome to contact us at any time. And right now I'll open it up to any questions from any of the topics from the StratMap session. So I believe you can raise your hand. Hi, Gayla, there's uh, one question here that uh, says, are also center lines available or is it just 911 address data points? I'll let uh, Lauren, would you like to answer that? Yes, sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, so uh, the question is, are there, um, are also center lines available in this or is it just the 911 address points? So currently it is just the 911 address points. Um, that is an option that we are considering for the future, but to include center lines, but at the moment it is just the address points. Got it, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Any hands, any hands? I'm not seeing anybody. Yeah, yeah, I see one. Sam Moffat has his hand up. <clears throat> Let's see. Sam, you're unmuted. Maybe he has his hand up from a previous time. I think he just raised it. Well, Sam, are you on? We can't hear you though, Sam. If you want to chat it out, we can uh, we can try to read it at that point. All right. Um, are there other data sets are, are going to be included in the USGS pilot project? And that's probably you, Joey. Let me, let me take a look at it. What other data sets are going to be included in the USGS pilot project? Uh, so. The pilot project that the the national terrain model that they're doing, um, to my knowledge, that's at the moment they're just compiling all the existing elevation and bathymetry data um, to you know formulate a way to create the one big mosaic for these watersheds that they're going to build the elevation derived hydro for. 
Um, I think that there are going to be areas where they find there isn't any data, um, and I think that they they've you know stated that their intention is to fill those uh, gaps. Um, uh, and you know, it's if if it's a, something that we can help out with, um, you know, in the coming years, then that's definitely you know definitely be a priority for us to help out with that project. Perfect. Uh, let's see here. So Sam says for the eight county pilot project, as the bathymet has the bathymetric data already been collected. Yeah, I think that there are uh, there is a good representation of bathymetry data over in those areas. Um, I don't think it's as complete as it needs to be, and I think that they'll definitely probably end up picking some more, but. You know, that's, you know, this was something that they only just recently announced. So, um, you know, I don't have the, you know, all the details. Um, I wonder if Claire is on and she might have more details. There she is. Ooh, all right. Claire raised her hand. So. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Can you uh, can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, there we go. We can okay. hear you. <laughs> I'm just looking at. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just looking at a slide um, that was provided to me that talks about the the existing data sources that they've um, located. Uh, so there's you know a number of lidar projects dating from uh, 2010 acquisition by TINRIS all the way up to um, uh, 2018 uh, project through uh, from USGS, so a variety of, of projects. And then um, looking at the sources for the topo bath metric, uh, well, let's see, there's some topo bathy LIDAR projects. There was a 2019 uh, NGS collection. Uh, 2016 uh, Army Corps of Engineers collection along the Gulf Coast, and uh, 2009 some post post hurricane collections from 2009. So uh, that's the latest information that I have about that. But they're they're still compiling. Um, Jeff Danielson at USGS is still looking for any data sets that haven't been tracked already through the US IEI, the Interagency Elevation Inventory. And um, so they're still just uh, trying to locate any existing data sets for that pilot project. Great, thank you, Claire. You're welcome. Um, Joey, uh, I'm going to I'm going to unmute uh, Dr. Aldori. Raid, if you're available, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And if you could go ahead and say your question. It's good to see you, by the way. Good to see you. How are you guys doing? Doing fantastic. It's been a long time. I, I know. I'm, I'm glad to hear everybody is well and healthy. Um, thank God that, you know, we're, we're doing okay. Um, good. So, uh, one question is the uh, Stratmap Street Center Lines, is it updated every year or that project was dropped? Yeah, we haven't updated Stratmap roads in a long long time probably over 10 years um oh. so we have been deferring for transportation data over to TxDOT. so when you go to our data hub site um, and you search for transportation data or any road data um you're given over to um to TxDOT. however with lauren's um efforts for collecting um, address points and land parcels, sometimes center, line, center lines come with that data. And so that is something that we would like to take a look at from that perspective and possibly um, putting those out online at some point, but we're not there at, at the current moment. Okay, and, and how complete is the address point layer? Uh, Lauren, do you want to answer that? Yeah, uh, right now we're currently at about 50% of the state. 
Um, so we still have another 50% to go until we are we are ready for public production. Okay. All right. Thank you so much and good to see you all. Good to see you, Dr. Alduri. Take care. Um, there's a Thanks. question here from Rusty Rex real quick. I'll read it. Um, is there any effort to standardize the bathymetry grid creation, particularly uh, from line or single beam, particularly also in the inland and riv uh, rivering areas? Joey's, that one would be you. Um, yes, that that's one of my one of my main goals for this is to, you know, get everybody collecting the same you know, standard of data. Um, especially so that we can potentially join it all together one day or it can be used in the same modeling process and it's not just a whole bunch of different kinds of data um, like the LIDAR was in the early days. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's at the moment, you know, several, there's several different kinds of bathymetric survey. Um, and so compiling all that information you know, for our state so that the you know, our river features and such are represented accurately is definitely an endeavor that, you know, we're looking into and we hope to have something um, by the time, you know, a lot of this starts kicking off and we start, you know, seriously investing money into, you know, procuring these data sets for the state. Um, at the moment, kind of our, the guideline that we're using is the NOAA um, hydrographic survey standards. Um, it's it's pretty complete and all that. So, and if people are interested in that, just let me know. Just shoot me an email, and I can point you to where their most recent one is, which I think was updated in May of this year. Great, thank you, Joey. Um, we're going to ask. We're going to do one more question, Sam. I see you got your hand up. I'm actually going to unmute you, and if you want to ask your question, we'll try it again. Nope, I think Sam is having microphone problems. So I'll go ahead and uh, let's see. Uh, will the elevation derived hydro be a part of the project? Um, will it be contracted out through the through the StratMap contract? Uh, for if if you're referencing the one being done by the USGS, no, that's you know I I imagine that's through their Gypsy contract. Um, we're not directly involved in that. Um, that's a federal, and then they're using the lo a lot of the locals. Um, as Claire said earlier, they are, you know, requesting some of our data for this, but that's so far has been, you know, our only involvement. But as they, you know, go through this pilot and we have something to shop around and say, look, you know, this is, this is what is capable with all this data. This is what we can produce, you know, it's be something that we would shop out to you know, procure things like that in the future through the StratMap program. And we would just, you know, adhere to the same standards that the USGS has set um, with their elevation derived um, specification. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think that's all we have time for. We appreciate uh, all the comments and, and questions and and definitely you guys, uh, Gayla, Joey, Lauren, and Chelsea, thank you guys so much uh, for that um, update. And it's it's great stuff. I mean, we're just, we couldn't be uh, more proud about uh, some of the things that are coming our way and some of the accomplish accomplishments being made. So um, we definitely appreciate that. And uh, also too, appreciate how well everybody's been staying on target here. So uh, this couldn't go any better. And with that, Gayla, thank you so much. I'm going to take it from here and thank bring you up. See you later. Going to bring up a couple of my favorite people here. Um, Bill, if you are around, I'm going to try to find. Uh, Joey, can you see if you can find Bill Johnson and. Um, Kate Hickey. And yes, I, there's I just, Bill. Bill's coming I just in. Made Bill a panelist, and oh, who's the other one? And hey, Kate, there we are. Bill, there you are. How are you, sir? Doing great, thank you. Fantastic. We're gonna try to get Kate on board here. Uh, Kate Hickey. Kate Hickey.
and you need to make Aaron a Aaron um, to set a presenter as well because he's running our slides. Gotcha. I'm here as well. All right. Hey, Kate. You can't see me yet, can you? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Let's see here. Yeah, Should I can. Can't... There you are. There you are. All right. All right. And then we're uh, here comes Aaron. All right. Well, so we're guys. We're at the home stretch here. Um, you know, like like always, we always have App Geo and and Bill kind of do the anchor leg here. So um, we we definitely appreciate. Looking forward to it. Uh, they have a presentation that they've got for us. The great uh, localization, the Carpe Geo moment brought forth by the pandemic. So I think this is going to be extremely interesting. So without further ado, Bill, I'm turning it over to you. Well, thank you, Richard, and good afternoon, everybody. We're really, really pleased to be back among our Texas friends. And uh, let me just take a moment and explain what we want to accomplish this afternoon. There's been a ton of change happening as a result of the pandemic. <laughs> that hardly needs to be said, because we've all been living it. But there's an interesting thing about change. It presents new opportunities. And that's the Carpe Geo thing, seizing those moments of opportunity, however they might occur, to do great things with GIS. Now, there are going to be three parts to this presentation. First, we want to introduce you to a set of ideas called the great localization and use that as a framework to explore a few specific things we see changing. What we want to do is help you recognize these as new opportunities, give you some new ideas on how you can apply GIS. Then the second part will be an example showing how AppGeo rose to the moment for one specific aspect of the pandemic. And finally, we want to use the last portion of this hour together to invite you to share your stories. So pay attention, folks. This means you have an assignment today. As you watch and listen to the first two parts, we want you to be thinking about how you, in your personal life and in the organization where you work, have been dealing with the pandemic and whether the thoughts and examples we'll share with you are relevant to your situation. What's been similar? What's been different? The aim here is to help all of us feel awakened to the issues facing our society right now and how each of us as GIS professionals can help deal with those issues. We'll want you to weigh in with your thoughts on those things in that last part. Now, Kate and I will be delivering this presentation together in a conversational format where we'll flip back and forth and share comments with each other along the way. Most of the slides we'll show are just images to complement the dialogue. We hope you find this more engaging and personal than a typical slide deck presentation. Kate? Sure, thank you, Bill. Uh, I think this will be fun and hopefully thought provoking today. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to point out is that we made one slight change to the title of our presentation. Uh, we added a question mark after the great localization. Um, really, we struggled with this a little bit. You know, the more we prepared for this presentation, observing and processing and reading and talking, uh, all about how our world and our lives have changed so dramatically in the last eight months, uh, the more we really deeply acknowledge that we are far from experts on the subject and, and we certainly don't want to pretend to have all the answers. Um, so we ask a lot of questions today instead of providing all the answers. Uh, we're, we're really attracted to the idea of localization as a framework for understanding, and we hope you will be too. Because in the end, you know, aren't we all just trying to make sense of our experiences and imagine what our futures might be like? We, we first heard about the great localization from our friend and colleague, Bert Gramberg, uh, over at the Metropolitan Planning Office in Salt Lake City. The, the MPO is responsible for transportation planning throughout the region in the, the Salt Lake City metro area. And Bert was our guest on a webinar last month. Um, and he introduced us to this concept that was coined by his boss, Ted Knowlton. Now, Ted describes what's happening from the pandemic as the great localization. And uh, we borrowed some of his ideas today and uh, he gave us our blessing to do so. Um, so uh, we've, of course, put, put our own spin on them a little bit, though. So what Ted discovered when he looked at a variety of data pre-pandemic to in the midst of the pandemic, um, when he looked at travel patterns in the Salt Lake metro area, uh, it's, you know, it's not surprising that trips for retail, trips for work, uh, freeway traffic volumes, 
ridership on their their public transit systems, uh, air emissions from transport. These these were all down. Um, I think we were all seeing this in the news um, that you know that the environment was the big winner here in uh, in the pandemic. Um, but at the same time, you know, bicycle trips and especially trips to open uh, open spaces were were up substantially. Um, and you can see that in, in the graph here. So open space trips up 160%, uh, bicycle trips up 40%. Um, what he concluded is that the pandemic has created perfect conditions that, that really favor people staying close to home within their local community and seeking out ways to, to better enjoy their time locally, you know, by visiting parks or biking and walking in their neighborhoods or, or focusing their, their shopping locally. Um, of course, you know, one of the biggest drivers of this change is the fact that so many people were and are working and schooling from home. Uh, the time and money saved from commuting to work has enabled many people to improve the, the quantity and the quality of their leisure time. This, and that suggests, you know, there's, there's been something of a, a silver lining to, to all of the restrictions that have been put in place. But where it gets even more interesting is when he looks ahead and forecasts what he thinks the, the new sort of post pandemic, the new equilibrium will be, um, maybe even two years down, down the line. You see that he has a low and, and high projections for each row so that uh, most likely the outcome is, is something in between those values that you see here. Uh, these forecasts show that there will be some long-term shifts in the urban transportation sector, uh, he projects no increase or, at best, a, a marginal recovery of transit trips and freeway volumes, but sustained higher levels of bicycle trips and open space trips. So, in effect, he's projecting that we'll be trading longer downtown destination trips for, for more local trips. And these forecasts, if, if he's right about this, they really reinforce uh, the concept of the great localization and suggest that some of these changes are really here to stay. Um, you know, remember Ted's context is, is just transportation. He's a transportation planner. Uh, but I think we can safely say that similar patterns of long-term change will happen in other sectors, maybe housing, education, retail, so on. So it's a long list. Yeah, I really like that great localization concept, Kate. And I especially like that it connects changes to what we value in our communities. I've certainly seen that same pattern emerging where I live in upstate New York. And just to cite a, a single simple example, uh, my wife and I have started to take walks nearly every day with our two dachshunds through the village of Altamont. We actually live a little ways outside of the village, so we make a quick drive down the hill from our house and we park at the village library, now occupying a building that was originally the train station that you see featured on this slide. From there, we can stroll the sidewalks in the village before dinner. Now, this wasn't possible before the pandemic because my wife had a 40 minute commute from the college campus where she works. So in the past, she had arrived home after work and we'd just get started on dinner. Now, the time she's saving by working from home is what we've repurposed for our walks through the village. It's been a positive change in our daily pattern. Altamont sure looks like it's right out of a storybook there, Bill, it's beautiful. Um, you know, I too have been enjoying some some bonus time, I guess you could say, as I skip the, the commute into Boston every day and work from home. But I think it's also really important for us to remember that not everyone is enjoying the same silver lining. You know, a lot of the reductions that we're seeing in travel and this increased, you know, localization, these are these are due to job losses in some cases or the need for parents to stay home. Uh, and care for and, and even educate their children that are no longer traveling to school. So there, there are a lot of reasons this is happening um, uh, and, and not all of them are, uh, are positive. At ABGEO, we had about a third of our staff already working from home before the pandemic. And now that we're all working from home, we're really starting to rethink our need for downtown office space. Um, and it's pretty ironic because we had just moved into a beautiful new space only a, a few months before the pandemic. Um, and just out of curiosity, I don't, uh, uh, we were hoping to use the polling tool today and ask uh, all of you, how many of you expect to be primarily working from home in the next six months? Looking into 
how that right, actually there we launches go. <clears throat> pull open. Very cool. Aaron's helping us out here. I just said polling tool and it magically appeared. That was amazing. <laughs> so I think you just click on the choice that applies to you here. give people it should be a fairly quick response here. <clears throat> and then Aaron, will I see the results pop up here? I believe the organizer will be able to switch it over to the results. All right, about five more seconds, everyone. Okay, do we have our results? <laughs> we can make up it's whatever we want the results the scenes, to be. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I'm not quite sure how to share. Oh, wait, wait, I can share this. Hang on. Maybe you sec. can just tell us, Richard. Oh, oh I, it flashed. It flashed past you there just for a moment. There it is. Hey. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. So 65% fully working from home in the next six months, and another 30% uh, partially working from home. Wow, so uh, really it's a very small percentage that are expecting to be back back in the office. Um, and that really aligns with you know, what we're seeing all over the country and, and experiencing uh, ourselves. I think I'm always surprised when I have a video call with someone and they're sitting in a, in a professional office there. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. So, you know, let's take a look at some of the impacts from this move toward localization. Uh, some of these shifts are causing us to question what changes are temporary and, and which might be more permanent, like working from home, perhaps. Um, and, and here, the topic of values will really rise in importance. You know, let's start with what happened when we first had to shut things down in March. Uh, as we all know, what, what literally happened overnight was that our transportation systems, you know, no one was going anywhere. Um, and we'll call this for the sake of, uh, of this little demo here, mobility, to include all aspects of transportation. And it all came virtually to a standstill. Uh, we discovered this, this powerful visualization on the Mapbox platform where they collected movement data from mobile devices and created this cool data set that can be analyzed to look exactly how mobility has changed during this period. Um, so take a look at the city of London here. The, the animation is showing us how often people are moving outside of a hundred meter block, basically a city block within the city. And you see how dramatically it drops between February where it's at full peak and then April, where it's a ghost town. So there's February moving into March, moving into April. It's pretty amazing. And, and Mapbox is, uh, FYI, making this data publicly available for the UK and the US. So if you are interested in exploring this mobility data, uh, I think you can get your hands on it. On this side of the Atlantic, there was also a recent article in the Boston Globe where they analyzed transportation data and determined that the average Boston commuter has gained seven hours per week working from home. That's an almost a, a full workday there. That's a lot of time. And that sounds, you know, in just in line with what you're experiencing in your household, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty interesting coincidence. Because we live at the outer edge of the Albany, New York metro area, and my wife's commute was actually heading further away from the city, basically a drive through the countryside to her office campus. A very different situation than commuters in heavy Boston or Austin traffic or on crowded trains. So what we're already seeing is that mobility is rebounding, um, and that's pretty clear uh, from the Mapbox visualization we just looked at. I've also heard that traffic congestion in Austin is now back up to about 80% of the level where it was before the pandemic. So I think the big question a lot of us have is whether we'll retain some of the traffic reduction for the long term. Because 
a lot of people are seeing the benefit and time savings of what they were experiencing before the pandemic, and they may be reluctant to return to pre-pandemic habits and routines. I think this raises questions about what we really value in our local communities. The great localization trend would suggest that we are placing greater value on things that lead to a better quality of life close to where we live. And we may be willing to trade off some of our former values to get it. Things like having more lanes of highways built to support a commute into downtown if we aren't expecting to commute downtown in the future. And to cite a Texas example, uh, one of our AppGeo colleagues who works in um, Austin recently told us about two ballot initiatives, Prop A and Prop B, that would provide funding for light rail, bike paths, sidewalks, and urban trails in Austin. That seems to us to be totally consistent with this idea of the great localization. And it's pretty solid evidence that public opinion, which is really an expression of our values, uh, may be starting to shift. It'll be really interesting to see if those initiatives are approved by the voters next week. Texas seems to have a bit of a habit of being a trailblazer. And we saw that last year with the passage of Prop 8 that actually amended your state constitution to permanently flood, uh, excuse me, fund flood mitigation efforts, including the GIS data needed for those projects. And, uh, and coincidentally, we did a webinar just two weeks ago with Richard Wade explaining how Texas has been a trailblazer with the imagery content program, which we just heard Gala and her team talking about. Bill, what you were just describing about how we value our communities uh, rings so true with me. It, it really resonates, and, and I've been thinking about my own community quite a bit. But I also think about the potential geographic freedom that this, this new model might afford us. And, and uh, you know, let's explore for a moment, what if we're not just working from home, but we're working from anywhere? One of the questions that arises from Ted Knowlton's ideas in the great localization is, is that long-term patterns of where we choose to live might be changing, uh, particularly for those of us who continue to work remotely. You know, how will this change our, our settlement and our housing patterns? Uh, how will it impact urban real estate markets as people look for more space with, with fewer people and, and greater affordability? What will those trade-offs be like? You know, another big question on everyone's mind is how will schools be impacted in the long term? We see an extreme example of that here in this article that was published in the New York Times a couple of months ago. Um, and it's probably more common than we imagine. Uh, for those of you who know college age kids, uh, perhaps you were already aware. But um, this article featured a group of college students that were enrolled at Grinnell College in Iowa but they had decided to rent a house in Park City, Utah for the year so they could live near the ski areas and still attend their classes in Iowa remotely. Uh, it's, it's really the rise of off-off campus housing, as they say. And examples of like this, uh, just like this, are popping up everywhere. You know, for years, higher ed institutions tried to get online programs to take off, and it was largely without success. There was, there was a bit of a stigma to the model. Uh, people were reluctant to embrace it. But but now, where we choose to live and work and go to school, it really all seems up for grabs right now. And, and this raises some really interesting questions about how we value and spend our time and the extent to which we are still local. Yeah, Kate, I, I think this is just fascinating. And, you know, the more I think about it, the more it looks like we have two opposing forces at work. On one side, we have the great localization where there's an increasing focus on amenities close to home, walkable, bikeable, near me access to things that we value, which seems to be concentrating our attention on all things local. And at the same time, our ability to stay close to home depends on being part of a connected digital world built on this global internet. That's what allows us to work and access school remotely, conduct online commerce that relies on global supply chains, and uh, just take advantage of the anytime, anywhere aspect of the internet. It's really fascinating how we have a hyper-local phenomena being enabled by globalization. You know, those are two very different forces based on very different sets of values, and yet they rely on each other and they're happening in tandem. And 
just to point out something that may be obvious, maybe not, but the most essential characteristic of each of those forces, local and global, is that they are at their core geographic issues, spatial issues. And that's why I think that's really interesting for those of us in the GIS profession, because it's helping us to see this rich new range of opportunities that we can seize. Our way of viewing the world through a spatial lens is letting us be problem finders while others are still struggling to make sense of the issues. So let's shift our perspective now from using the great localization as a framework to help understand the changes we see happening with the pandemic and consider how these changes matter to GIS professionals. The question is, why should you care? Well, what we're seeing is that the pandemic is sort of like a magnifier. It's focusing our attention and highlighting the gaps in public sector services and information. That magnifier is helping us as GIS professionals to see that these carpe geo moments of opportunity are presenting themselves. And one of those, one of the first things we see is how critical it is to be connected, to be part of this online connected world. And that means everyone needs to have access to broadband at home. Now, we all know this was a problem before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, this digital divide has created real hardship for those without broadband. The rest of us have all been able to shift to online alternatives for the essentials in our lives, access to work, to school, to access to healthcare and information and much, much more. Those without broadband have suffered disproportionately. And much of it is related primarily to where they live. So it's a geographic problem, a spatial problem. And guess whose realm that is? Now, we could have a full presentation this afternoon just on what's happening with broadband and the changes taking place right now to have better, more granular broadband mapping for the country. We don't have time for that, but I do want you to know that the FCC is in the process right now of implementing this new federal law called the Broadband Data Act that's gonna modernize broadband data collection and mapping. So starting next year, we're gonna have broadband data at the individual address location. So we'll finally have the granularity we need to support good public policy decisions so we can close that digital divide. That's something for all of you to pay close attention to because it's a great example of connecting local data, addresses, to a national problem. And it's GIS through and through. The, uh, the second thing I wanna point out that the magnifier is revealing is that now more than ever, we really need high quality local data to support things like home delivery and public safety, emergency response, community planning, and lots of other examples. So the question is, how good is your local data? Do you have a complete address point layer, parcels, zoning, emergency service zones? Are those layers complete? Are they really being kept up to date? Let's just cite one example out of many, many possible ones. But if you have a GIS layer of business locations for your community and you update them once a year, which is fairly typical for a lot of GIS data, is that still useful now in the pandemic? What I'm really trying to point out is you're gonna need great data, local data now and well into the future for things like NextGen 911 to help community residents find COVID testing sites, find vaccination sites when the vaccines are available, polling places, food pickup points, and much, much more. And the need for those types of local GIS-based information services aren't gonna go away after the pandemic. So this is a great moment of opportunity to take stock of your data and what it needs to what needs to happen to it to really bring it up to speed. And that magnifier is also showing the need for information delivery services architected at the hyperlocal level. So what do I mean by that? I mean finding answers to questions that will serve you locally. It's the near me phenomena. And I think the best way to show you is with a new ad that Google has just put out. Aaron. When I was in high school, this was a theater I came to quite often. Well, you'll 
friends, they came from out of town. It was a new kind of neighborhood. The support we've had over the last two months has been amazing. I have a soft spot for local places. It's not just a work environment. Everyone here is family. <laughs> Ahead and support him, give a haircut, leave a big tip. <laughs> if we focus on our local communities, we can find a way to get through this together. Thank you. If you are ready to open your heart and your home, check us out. <laughs> get out and about and support our local community. We thought for sure that we were done, and this town said, Not, not today. I never get tired of seeing that ad. It's very cute. Um, and you know what also strikes me is uh, you're talking about the pandemic being a magnifier, but I, I also think it's served as an accelerator for innovation and change. Uh, we've seen it in the rapid development and testing of COVID therapies. Uh, we've seen it in uh, using AI to triage patients. Um, we're all experiencing it right in this moment here, the, the much improved digital and, and virtual experiences for us all. Um, you know, for example, the rise of Zoom, uh, many of us had probably never heard of it before and how quickly it caused other video meeting software like uh, WebEx and Google and Microsoft, uh, it caused them all to improve and, and uh, give us all a better digital experience. You know, businesses and citizens are under a lot of stress and uncertainty. I think we, we've all seen businesses shut down that, that, that's heartbreaking um, in our local communities. You know, so many people are dealing with unemployment and food insecurity and uncertain government relief benefits and spotty access to testing and healthcare services and ever-changing policies on COVID restrictions. It's, it's hard to keep up. It's all changing so rapidly and in ways we never anticipated, never even imagined before the pandemic. Government agencies are operating with really tight budgets and some with uh, aging legacy systems and of course many new demands on their services. Finding new ways to do business like restaurants doing curbside pickup or home delivery or uh, you know, improved online transactions and experiences and, and other innovations. These are all the name of the game now. And organizations and businesses have had to adapt and adapt really quickly to survive. Yeah, that's right, Kate. So what we wanna do now is uh, shift to the second part of our presentation this afternoon. And, and what we wanna do is show you an example of how AppGeo has applied these things in dealing with one specific aspect of the pandemic, and that's food insecurity. Now, the hit on our economy from the pandemic left a large number of people out of work as businesses either closed or reduced their capacity. In addition, there are lots of vulnerable people, especially seniors who had to stay indoors and away from the public space to reduce their exposure to the virus. Now we had people relying on food assistance before the pandemic, but the combination of new factors, unemployment and so many new needy folks layered on top has created a huge surge in demand for that most basic necessity, food. Now the images we're showing you on the screen now are from a recent article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine and the photos speak for themselves about the heartbreaking reality of families struggling to have enough to eat. Some of these families lack the basics, a functioning kitchen, a table to sit at, a yard, or even a way to get to the places where they can get food. And let's not forget that this is a problem being solved locally by thousands of small food pantries and food banks based in local communities and staffed mainly with volunteers. You can think of food insecurity as one of the issues on the flip side of the great localization. So it's not just about sidewalks and biking and enjoying local parks. More and more, we need to solve our problems locally. And there may be no better example of that than food pantries. Yeah, that article was really sobering, and uh, I, I highly recommend it to to anyone who wants to get a, a real picture of of how food insecurity is impacting the entire nation. 
Uh, the reality of the food insecurity issue, it really hit home for us at AppGeo. It, it spoke to us. It spoke to our values about being good stewards in the communities where we live and where we work. And it spoke to the profession that generates our livelihood. As, as Bill said, all of these things are spatial as well. You know, we were seeing firsthand how the local food banks in and around Boston were struggling to deal with this surge in demand and the reality that not everyone in need could actually get themselves to a food pantry. We decided to do something about using the tools that we know best. And what resulted was our Bring Food app that, that aims to help food pantries plan and manage their, different, their deliveries. Um, so we wanted to share with you a message from Rich Grady. He's our, our president and uh, has led the company for many years. Uh, in this video here, he's uh, in the midst of the beautiful salt, salt marshes of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And he's explaining our company perspective on values and, and how that led us to create Bring Food. Hey, I want to say a big hello to my friends in Texas. I miss seeing you in person. I always look forward to the Texas GIS Forum. It's a source of food for thought on the ways we can apply geospatial thinking and tools to problem solving. We all know there are a lot of problems out there that need solving. And our way of thinking does bring a new perspective to the table often. I also enjoy the thoughtful work that students in colleges and universities across Texas are doing. Keep it up and keep it coming, bring it on. The forum has also been a source of food for the soul, the good things we've all done helping the communities we live and work in, which these days pretty much are the same place, right? And I think along with those places where we live and work, we need a spiritual place for sanctuary, for inspiration, for guidance in an uncertain world. Such a place can prompt us to reflect on who we are and what's important. And when we do that, often we know what to do in the face of uncertainty. It puts us in the right, right frame of mind to know that it's always the right time to do the right thing. For me, Bring Food came from that place and from that frame of mind. But it was the collective action and abilities and willingness and passion of my colleagues at AppGeo that brought it to fruition. I tip my hat to them. They may bring food a reality. And I know they're with me on this. We were inspired and humbled by the work being done by food banks and food pantries and communities all over the country, delivering food day in, day out. And with that food, I think they brought a little happiness, a little humanity, a little hope to people. They made a positive difference in people's lives. And we should all aspire to do that. And we should all tip our hat to them. Let's face it, we're all in this together and there's work to be done. In for a nickel, in for a dime. Let's do it, Texas, hook them. Thank you, Rich. Always good for uh, some inspiring words and, and beautiful scenery there too. Uh, and it, Rich's sentiment is really, really important. You know, none of us can predict the future, but we know that whatever decisions we make will be firmly rooted in our values. I'm really proud to be part of a company that unabashedly puts values first. Uh, we've made Bring Food available for free to food banks across the country. And uh, to uh, share a little bit about that experience, we'd also like to share a video clip here from Susan Dorson. She's at a food bank in Arlington, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And she's talking here with Priya Sankalia. She's one of our AppGeo project managers. And they're describing how they uh, work together to define the requirements and, and test the application. Right, well, when first people started to hear about COVID and we knew it was maybe on the horizon and becoming an issue, we saw a sudden jump in the need for food. Initially, there was about a 50% increase in the families that were coming to us. And before quarantine started, we were putting together a lot of safety protocols. But as soon as people were told to stay home, we knew we had to make a huge shift. And that shift went from about fewer than 5% of our families we did home delivery to, and suddenly we were jumping to complete home delivery. So 100% home delivery. So how were you making these deliveries? Did you have volunteers helping out? 
So we were very lucky to be able to team up with the Medical Reserve Corps and they supply a lot of our delivery drivers, um, which was fabulous because they took care of recruiting and bringing them to us. But the downside was that they came from many different communities, so they didn't necessarily know Arlington. So when you're delivering food and I hand you a random list of addresses, uh, that, that became an issue pretty immediately. So uh, when I came to you, you already had a problem, which, you know, we were like ready to solve and you communicated that to me. Yeah, you know, we, I think we've been doing it a couple of weeks by the time you contacted me and I've just been kind of making random routes and handing them out. And so you and I had a conversation and then I sat down with your team and I listened to my problem and within six weeks, you gave me the access to the beta application. Oh, it was a really crazy quick turnaround. That was awesome. Yeah, I mean, it was it was um, pretty amazing because we were in, you know, agile mode. Um, um, we basically started brainstorming in April, um, started development late April with, you know, what you had told us. And the beta application was rolled out mid-May. We gave it to you and to two other organizations, Somerville and Chelsea, which was a very hard hit city in, in, the, in the Boston area. You gave us some, um, you know, tweaks to make and we launched the website in July for everybody to access. Um, so what was it like for you to be a tester on this, uh, on this platform, Susan? Because you gave us a lot of insights into how we could change the application. Right. The whole process was so new to me. I've never kind of been a part of something like that before. Um, and I'm not very technical. So I wasn't sure what I could ask or what I could expect the team to do. But you all, the team always listened to me and said, oh, yeah, that's doable. Or, well, let's think about this possibility. So what was wonderful is I was able to come with all of my thoughts or concerns and the team was very responsive. And it really it felt like a collaboration because you, you were trying to make something useful for people. And I was able to kind of come to you with all the different ideas of things that were affecting our particular community. And we also, I think, discussed some ideas of how larger communities might need different things as well. So it was a real team effort. And, um, you know, there were a number of meetings. And then in the end result, I had a wonderful uh, an app to work with in the process. It was very smooth, so it was fantastic. Many thanks to Priya and Susan for that. Uh, it's fun to get a reminder of how quickly that all came together. It was a, a whirlwind project and, and really exciting to, to witness. Um, and finally, uh, I would like to ask Aaron to give us a quick demo of how the application actually works. So Aaron, go for it. All right, I'm just coming online here. Good, looks like we're, we're working. So uh, I call this the fun part of the presentation because we get to look at technology and I know uh, we've got a lot of fans of that on it. Now, the whole thing's been fun and I really uh, think Bill and Kate have been doing an awesome job here. But what I'd like to demonstrate is, you know, at the crux of this application, it's about saving these organizations time. Um, as Susan was describing there, um, it used to take them hours to have to figure out who was going where every single day and they were always dealing with different people and one of the main ideas behind bring food was to speed that up so they could spend their time actually helping people instead of messing around in microsoft excel <laughs> so this this quote has really resonated with us what has used to take us hours is now done in under five minutes and in under five minutes here i'd like to quickly show you uh what this application actually looks like and how it works for those of you who are curious and may have uh, not gone to see it before. And I'm gonna give you the, the real deal version here, not my pre-recorded one. So we'll have a little bit of fun. So Bring Food starts with submitting uh, lists of addresses and that can come in in a lot of different ways. We have uh, some CSV files here I've populated. And the first step is just teaching the application um, you know, what is your data? Because everyone's data is going to come in a little bit differently and we want it to work seamlessly within the application. So I'm just going to quickly um, define these headers as we have them come in, uh, like zip code, state. Now this one's kind of interesting number of boxes as the application can take into account uh, vehicle capacity in addition to some of the other factors, so like delivery size for number of boxes. Now we have this last column here, drop off location. That could be an example of um, a number of additional fields that will make their way into the final results, but not necessarily have an impact on the geocoding. So now that we have set all those up, we can go ahead and hit assign. Um, let's see, oh, I put the wrong one here and it's caught that, that is the state. There we go. Um, and now it's doing geocoding using uh, the Google geocoding engine. 
And one thing that's interesting about Bring Food is if there are errors in your data, it will pick it up ahead of time. So, um, you know, see or we see the street name is missing. It would give us a chance to manually go back and say, all right, uh, you know, who was that? <laughs> and rather than send someone to like uh, incorrect location or worse, someone doesn't get their food that they need for that week, uh, we have a chance to QA, QC that. So we could say, um, uh, mass of, let's see if that works better. All right. So um, here's the interesting part. We've now got all those addresses from an Excel sheet on our map. There are all these different points here. We can zoom in, zoom out all the way down to the individual house scale if we need to. And we have a couple parameters to play with. The first is just picking where is our distribution center? You know, where is our pantry or uh, food bank that uh, all the pickups are occurring from? I'm gonna use a grocery store locally, just as our example here. Oops. And what's nice about this is it also has all the Google Places database uh, tapping into. So I just need to type the name. It's picked up the full address there and put a pin on our map. Now we have two strategies we can then pick from. A max route delivery size, so um, max number of uh, stops or maximum number of routes. So say we have five drivers to work with, we can make sure each of them have a route and from there hit optimize. Now this is the really cool part. It is now clustering all those points, finding the optimal way for your five drivers to reach all of them and then giving them to you in this color coded format. So we have you know, our green team, purple, uh, red that is making a trip over to Boston over here and then uh, yellow going through Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, what's additionally interesting is we can zoom in and even you know drop into uh, street view if say a driver wanted to verify uh, you know hey this right here is where I'm going to be making the delivery um, you know have that confirmation before you leave for the day and should our delivery parameters change you know we can rerun with a new optimization let's say we get some nice big trucks and they're gonna hold uh, you know 20 houses worth of food each i can re-optimize um, and now under that scenario we only need three to cover all those addresses so very powerful and from here we can uh, go ahead and download these back to csv if i was to do that and open it up um, just to wrap up here you'd see um, the driver assignment for each route there we go just a little sluggish we'll have a driver assignment for each route and their stop order along with the address and then like that additional information Ooh, it's up on our top screen that's why um, that additional like drop off location and how many boxes you could even have like a cell phone number in there as many of the organizations were confirming with a phone call um, at the time of the delivery so you know a very lightweight application but a very robust application and we've been really excited to kind of bring it to life. And from there, I think we're gonna hop back into the slides. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, demo, Aaron. I really appreciate you doing yeah, it live. Thanks, Bill. Um, you know, the decision to bring, uh, to create Bring Food was a real Carpe Geo moment for us at AppGeo. It's a great example on a lot of different levels not the least of which is that it's truly an expression of our company's core values. But I'd also like to point out a few other interesting details. You know, we're a GIS consulting company and we're used to dealing with clients who know what they want us to build with GIS. For these food pantries, we found ourselves dealing with a user base that is not at all conversant with GIS and frankly, doesn't need to be. For Bring Food, we had to be problem finders, not solvers. In other words, we had to work with users like Susan Dorson, who you saw in that earlier video clip, to find out what they didn't understand and to weed out any assumptions we had coded in there that assumed familiarity with GIS. There were also some technical problems we needed to solve with Bring Food. First, it had to be, and I love this phrase from one of our team members, it had to be ridiculously simple so that volunteers just using basic spreadsheets could easily get the results they need. 
And even though there are excellent new tools and APIs out there now that we can work with, the out-of-the-box tools still need to be augmented in, in a lot of cases with our own special sauce. And in this case, we used Google's API for the multi-stop route optimization. But that clustering that you saw happen between geocoding and the route designation was our own uh, um, algorithm. And um, that's how we uh, get the addresses that are closest to each other to combine into each route. And we also found out, as Aaron showed you in that demo, that uh, geocoding um, doesn't always happen cleanly. And any of you that have ever done any geocoding know that that's, that's the case uh, time in and time out. So we needed to provide capability for on-the-fly corrections. And I think yeah, that was great that Aaron was able to show that. And as Kate mentioned earlier, you know, we've been sharing Bring Food for free to nonprofit food pantries. We started out with a handful in the Boston area, but now there are organizations all over the country benefiting from Bring Food. And we think this is a great example of shared value. We're able to give back to the communities that have made our business possible in a way that helps them do a better job serving the needy. And that, friends, it really appeals to our core values. Thank you, Bill. I totally agree with that. And, uh, you know, this has been a really fun exploration this afternoon and pulling this together and, and hearing what everyone shared throughout the day. Um, you know, now it's time to see if everyone was paying attention because we're ready to turn the tables and, and ask you for your stories. And I warned you up front that we're good at asking questions, but it doesn't mean we have the answers. So, you know, what we'd love to hear from you. What are you observing uh, in terms of impacts from the pandemic? This could be on your work, on your life, in your community. Did any of the ideas from the great localization resonate with you? Are you are you paying attention to your neighborhood more? Are you connecting with your neighborhood in new ways? Any Carpe Geo opportunities out there to seize or to solve or to share? Have you innovated or reinvented your work? What's been your biggest challenge? What are you still struggling with? I think you can use the the raise your hand tool in the in the um, webinar here and I believe we can unmute you or someone can unmute you <laughs> so you can speak or if you prefer to type a message into the chat box uh, we can we can read it and share it with the group um, and I yes. have a I have a softball for you Richard and and others at Tinris you know what's what's it been like to to pivot and organize this this virtual conference instead of doing the live session has, has, well, there, has hmm. there been a silver lining yeah you know that that's been an interesting thing i think uh realistically we had mentioned this at the last quarterly meeting that we had was um uh when we were doing these things live felicia would often ask you know should we try to you know create a dial in number or you know whatever so people can come in i said no 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 let's not do that because we want people to come because the whole point is the interaction uh, that we have. And I, and I think it's still that, but realistically, when we, when we did our first one um, back in, I believe it was in July, um, we, had, we, we went from about 40 to 60 people at the norm to 150 people. And everybody was saying, you know, how wonderful it was. We kind of went mm -hmm. online with this because now they can actually, you know, participate in here and, and just be a part of the process where they were felt excluded because we would have these things, you know, on the wrong side of town that they mm -hmm. couldn't get to. And, you know, it was all this stuff. So it was this eye opener for us um, to realize that, you know, it wasn't such a bad idea. People who still want to come in and meet in person will do that. But people who just can't do that, but still want to listen to what people are saying will do that. And so there's a best of both worlds here. And I think even this particular, you know, event that we had today, uh, you know, same sort of thing, allowing people to kind of pick and choose the sessions they wanted to come on. And I've been watching people pop on and off during those sessions. And I thought it was a, a really great idea. So so it was an eye opener uh, for us on how, we, how we're doing that. And so even when we do get back together, this will be a part of our process from here on. And so we, we wouldn't have figured it out until this happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Richard, you Changed mentioned forever. folks <laughs> on the wrong side of town not coming to me, but man, Texas is a big state. I mean, I assume there were people quite remote from Austin that could suddenly participate. 
I mean, even from here, we've got people from out of state who are participating, um, you know, who are who are probably one of our vendors or, or, you know, something like that, where they just couldn't have done this before. And uh, so it isn't just in the Austin area, it's in, it's the region, you know, and, uh, and people very much appreciated the ability to do that. So, uh, yeah, so, so we learned, absolutely. Right. Do, do we I have can't. any other uh, brave souls out there who want to share anything? Has anyone um, commented? I I, Kate, I want to I want to kick it off. I think a little bit. I'm I'm waiting to see if anybody um, raises their hand, but I do want to raise my hand because Bill touched on it and I touched on it a little bit in my opening remarks. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when when the COVID first hit, uh, you know, the city was was kind of like you showed in in uh, there on your map, where all of a sudden all of the transportation just kind of went away, and you know there was this kind of eerie sort of feeling about it all. But now that it's, you know, there there's people returning to work, and I think that's a good thing when you can do it. Um, but there's also been talk about, you know, what are you going to do when this thing is over? What are what are companies going to do? There are some companies saying, we're not going to go back the way we were. You know, we're going to be a little bit more in a hybrid mode, or we're going to be whatever. And Bill had mentioned that, you know, um, or one of you guys mentioned that Austin is back to about 80% of what the traffic was. Yeah. And there's a little part of me that's kind of bummed by that, you know? <laughs> Uh, traffic was already so so horrific um, to to some degree, and there's a hope that you know businesses start offering more options uh, to work from home, even if they don't have to, simply because you know in in a in the time that we're in, why crowd the roads if you don't really have to do that? Um, you know why why start your vehicle and have to drive 45 minutes in and out of town when you can just not have to do that. Uh, so I'm real curious to kind of, uh, you know, figure out how things are going to really play out once we're back on 100%. So it will be interesting. Yeah. I'm, you know, you're saying that, Richard, reminds me that, you know, just speaking personally, one of the things that this pandemic has done to, to us and my family is, you know, we used to just, you needed something, you just automatically hop in the car and, and head out to get it, and, you know, with very little thought about that. And now we actually do pause and, and ask ourselves, you know, do, do I need to make this trip? Is there an alternative way to, to, to meet whatever the need is in the moment? And, uh, and we're actually, we're, we're traveling far less and putting hardly any miles on our car. I, I, you know, I, I was trying to remember the last time I gassed up my pickup truck and I, I couldn't tell you, it's been several weeks. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of my point. And I mean, I know there's nobody raising their hand, but I'm real interested if anybody else has a has a thought to that. Um, you know, what's it going to be like in the private sector? Uh, um, you know, the, the, the states thinking through their their ideas and what they've got going on. Uh, but realistically, I'm just real interested to know how this is all going to play out and what's going to be different. Mm hmm. So let me let me scan around. Anybody want to comment? Don't see anything. No, there's got to be some brave souls out there. Come on, folks. <laughs> You've all been living this pandemic. You must all have some reaction to, you know, this concept of the great localization and and how you see it playing out in your lives uh, or in your work or. Uh, what, what's it feel like to you? And it, what does it mean to you? What do you think? What do you see looking ahead uh, for how this will impact what you do in GIS? That's the. I think there's a. This is a, so much good stuff we could be talking about here. I just really love to hear from some of you. Yeah, let me read. A, let me read one. Uh, one thought from from Lila Valencia. Um, so uh, let me see. I I have trouble reading small print, but let me see what I can do here. <laughs> Uh, th thank you for sharing the great uh, localization framework and the examples you provided. The example you gave of a college student living in Park City, Utah is really interesting and makes me wonder of how this new freedom uh, to be able to live and work, learn anywhere uh, from anywhere be, may impact population growth in Texas. Currently, half of our growth in Texas comes from migration. Not sure if you have any thoughts on this. Mm. Yeah, I know. Kate, I know. There's yeah. been a lot of. Uh, I'm reading it all the time about migration out of cities. So it could be, you know, those those in Texas probably want to be in Texas. Uh, 
and I, I would think that it's probably just a redistribution within the state uh, out of out of the cities, <clears throat> you know, to places that are more affordable. Uh, cities have always been attractors of people for the jobs, the job opportunities, the, the economic opportunities. And, and that constraint is is really going away. I mean, we, we see it. Uh, We've hired, we hired someone that none of us have met. He's been working, he's a web developer. He's working with us um, for several months now. None of us have met him in person ever. <laughs> it's the first time we've ever done that. And we didn't skip a beat in, in thinking about, you know, we just wanted to hire the best, the best talent. And it almost didn't matter where the person was. You know, you get into mm -hmm. time zone challenges, uh, um, you know, can you overlap working hours? Um, and we've had others, uh, you know, I, I must say it's especially amongst the young people who have uh, have a lot of freedom to move around. But, you know, one woman who works with us has lived in four different states since uh, since she's, yeah. she's worked for us. So um, I do think that will be a, a big, uh, we'll see a lot of that where, you know, it's not about just necessarily choosing where you want to live, but it's just this mobility of 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 where you live too you can you know be a live in one place for the summer and one place for the winter and and maintain the same job the whole time yeah, yeah. you know i, I want to add something to that is one of the aspects that is really critical in that is access to sufficient broadband mm -hmm. and so you know uh, you know uh, i'm sure there are still parts of texas that are not well served you know one of the things we, we learned in my family is that the broadband connection that we had at the start of the pandemic wasn't sufficient for it with my wife and I both working from home. And we had uh, at the start of the pandemic, my high school senior daughter doing remote schooling and, and our connection just didn't have enough uh, bandwidth for the three of us to be sharing. So we upgraded, but luckily, you know, we, we live in an area where we, we do have the option to upgrade, but any of these decisions about, you know, work from anywhere, are limited by the, not just is basic service available, but is service sufficient for conducting online meetings and, you know, video and all that, uh, which, you know, is often greater than what um, just meets that basic, are you served or not served definition that the FCC uses. So mm -hmm. we see that as a, as a real, a real big factor in how this migration is going to happen. Absolutely. There's there's a great or uh, I guess observation from Nancy Hager I want to read. It says, um, "I like the de the decreased population and increased wildlife that we are seeing in many different areas. Hope we can make it last." And that reminds me of uh, something I read not too long ago about how how the the songbirds are actually um, uh, what's the right word singing qu more quietly. <laughs> Because there's not as much competing noise. Like I mean, wow. this, is a true, this is a true study where they actually took the volume of, of particular animals um, and found out that with the decreased traffic and, and decreased population in certain areas, that they have that even the wildlife have quieted down just in the way they sing and do their whatever they do. So I thought that nature was really might be the real winner. <laughs> So Aaron, did you, um, did you throw one you idea to into add? the mix <laughs> uh, to close it out. Um, you know, folks at AppGeo have a habit of cooking up ideas in their free time and then making, you know, interesting projects, interesting maps. And it just occurred to me, you know, when people we're going into the winter here and I've been thinking, all right, well, how am I going to spend all this time? <laughs> Normally I'm very, I love being outside, but it's getting colder by the day. And one thought is, you know, seven hours a week, as GIS people, we're curious and we have, you know, passion for what we do. Take some of that time and invest it into, you know, that project in GIS you've been putting off, something interesting that you just do for fun, whether it be learning a new skill or sharing something or, you know, experimenting with some of this data that's now out there, like that Mapbox data, for example. And, you know, after a couple months of that, you might be shocked at some of the creative things you can come up with and share with the greater GIS community. So, I set that as a challenge to all of you out there and we'll see what you come up with in a couple months, but um, I, I see that, a great opportunity to leave it off with today. Mm. So Aaron, Aaron, did you want to make sure um, everyone knew where to find more info on, uh, on bring food as well? Absolutely. So we have a website set up bringfood.care. Um, you can also Google bring food. Uh, I think you'll find us that way. And 
you can sign up an organization in your community or forward it to an organization in your community. And again, totally free for all those qualifying uh, nonprofits. So we hope that you can spread it. We have a handful of uh, groups in Texas using it now, and we hope to add uh, a whole bunch more. Absolutely. So our, uh, any, uh, I just wanted to thank you guys um, from AppGeo, Bill and Kate, Aaron. Thank you guys so much. That was a fascinating application to see um, to see run and uh, just a great way you guys did this. I actually, I felt like I was actually in the conversation, except I actually wanted to join in half the time. Uh, and you couldn't see my head nodding and everything else that y'all were saying. So uh, very effective. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You guys are, are great and we're, we're, we're great to have this kind of relationship with you guys. And so thanks for everything you've done and, and being a part of this, uh, being, being a part of this meeting. We greatly appreciate it. Thank, yeah, thank really, you, Richard. <laughs> it's our pleasure, really. Okay, well, we'll be talking soon, you know that, mm -hmm. like tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I wanted to close out. I just wanted to remind everybody um, that we have, uh, that we have a, uh, the trivia night link that's actually in the chat session. If you want to scroll back, probably the second entry in the chat session, you'll see a URL right there. Um, that's how you get to it. And I believe Courtney has also sent the Zoom meeting link within the questions. Um, so please, please look at that and uh, join if you can. I think that would be wonderful and we appreciate all the support Swidges is always doing for us. Um, so thanks everyone. We hope you had a great time and we really, really are, are looking forward to, uh, to doing more of these and uh, uh, stay tuned. We'll keep you posted. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.